The students are welcomed to school by one of their teachers, Mrs. Chevreus. She will be in charge of Earth lectures for the year. She tells them her nickname and asks the class a simple question. She asks them the types of elemental magic that they have. The charismatic and confident boy in the class, Guiche Gramont, stands up to answer. He tells the teacher that there are four elements which are fire, water, earth, and win. The teacher commends Gramont for giving the right answer. Gramont's nickname is Guiche de Gramont. To show the class what earth magic is made of, she brings out three pebbles and turns them into brass. This amazes the class because with the right earth magic knowledge, they can actually turn stones into gold. The teacher wants someone to carry out what she just did. She looks up and calls on the pink-haired girl sitting at the end of the class to help out. The girl's name is Louise Villers, and she is the center of this story. Immediately after the teacher selects her, the class starts grumbling. They persuade her not to pick Louise. Louise insists that she is capable of carrying out the simple spell. One of the students, Tabitha with blue hair and a long staff, just walks out of the class. Louise goes to the front and brings out her wand. She raises her hand to perform the spell, but the unexpected happens. Now in the principal's office, Mr. Osmond is busy flirting with his secretary, Longville. It appears that this is not the first time he has done this. He talks to his assistant about the second year students having their summoning ceremony the next day. This is a ceremony where they are to summon their familiars. Familiars will end up staying with them for the rest of their lives. Osmond and his assistant are in the middle of this when they hear an explosion in the distance. The duo immediately knows who is responsible. It is none other than Louise. It appears that Louise ended up causing an explosion while she was trying to practice earth magic. The students scream at her for always being a failure at everything. She doesn't even have a nickname yet. Her nickname at the moment is Zero Louise. After this, she was called to the admin room, but she was not punished because they believed that was the teacher's fault. The class warned her, but she didn't listen. However, she has great confidence in herself that her summoning ceremony will go out well. The day of the summoning is upon them, and the second-year students are gathered by Mr. Colbert. The first student to have a go summoned a bugbear, and this amazes everyone. Gramont steps forward, and he also summons his own familiar, but it was not what he expected. Kerchi is the red-haired girl, and she summons a scary salamander as her familiar. The last on the line is Louise, and she is even scared to carry out the summoning ceremony. The whole class is already expecting an explosion as usual. Louise chants the summoning spell and activates her wand. A big cloud of dust appears and when the dust settles, an innocent-looking boy is seen lying on the floor. It appears that Louise has summoned a human as her familiar. The boy opens his eyes, but it turns out that he doesn't understand their languages. He is apparently from Japan. Louise asks the teacher if she can still perform the ritual again, but she says no. You can only carry it out once, he says. Louise is forced to accept the boy as her familiar. She goes to him and pecks him on the lips. He starts to feel hot, and Louise reveals that a familiar rune is being carved on his body. He looks at the back of his palm to see a familiar rune there. The boy passes out from the extreme pain he is feeling. Upon waking up, the boy believes that he has been dreaming before. Just then, he looks to his side and sees Louise looking at him. Since the duo do not understand each other's languages, Louise tries to talk to him through actions. She takes off her uniform and throws it at the boy, asking him to wash them. The boy starts yelling because he has no idea where he is. Louise wants some silence and she decides that a spell will make do. She casts a spell on the boy that still ends up as an explosion. Once the dust settles, the duo is shocked to find out that they can now understand each other. Louise just failed at casting a spell of silence again. However, it turned out to be a win because her familiar could now understand her. The boy reveals that his name is Hiraga Saito. Louise tells him that she is the one who summoned him as her familiar spirit. He looks at the back of his hand to confirm that there is a ruin there. Meanwhile, Mr. Colbert is in the library going through a book. There is the same rune symbol on Hiraga's hand inside the book. Colbert talks about the urgency of telling the principal before it is too late. Louise explains everything Hiraga needs to know about where he is. He gets overwhelmed believing that he has been kidnapped by Fanatic. He makes a run for it. As he runs through the building, he comes across Gramont. He tries sneaking past Gramont, but he is unsuccessful. Hiraga continues running to avoid Louise catching him. He makes it outside the building where he sees Kerchi having fun. He tries to make a break for it, but Gramont grabs him with his levitation spell. As he floats in the air, it dawns on Hiraga that he is truly not in Japan. This is pretty obvious because there are two moons in the sky. Hiraga narrates how he found himself in this new world. He was walking through the streets of Tokyo when a green light appeared in front of him. He touches it and ends up getting sucked in. This was how he got transported from Japan to a whole new world. To prevent Hiraga from running away again, Louise has a chain put around his neck. 
She expects him to be obedient because she is his master, and familiars are meant to obey their masters. Louise also does not believe that there is another world out there called Earth. Louise takes off her clothes and tells Hiraga to have them washed by tomorrow morning. She adds her underwear to the laundry to be done, and this shocks Hiraga. He asks Louise if she doesn't mind taking off her clothes when she's in front of a guy. Louise argues that she doesn't see Hiraga as a guy, but as her familiar spirit. Hiraga refuses to do the laundry. Louise threatens him with hunger. She says she will not feed him if he refuses to obey. She is to take care of her, but he needs to follow her every command too. Hiraga has no choice but to go with the flow since he has nowhere to run to. The following morning, Lousy wakes up to find out that Hiraga has washed her clothes and ironed them. She even asks him to put the clothes on him. She claims that aristocrats no longer do anything by themselves once they have a servant. Hiraga has no choice but to answer her. He puts the clothes on her, and as a reward, she takes off the chain around his neck. After all, he has nowhere to run to. It is time for the two to leave for breakfast. They arrive at the dining hall, and Hiraga is impressed with the setting. The food that is being served appears to be yummy. Everyone in the room has their eyes on Louise and her stubborn familiar. Hiraga tries sitting down, but Lousy stops him. She informs him that only aristocrats are allowed to sit on the chairs. He will be sitting on the floor while also given just a slice of bread to eat. He has no choice but to eat the bread. After they leave the dining hall, Louise tells them that the second-year students have no classes that day. They are required to build a relationship with their familiars. Hiraga sees Kirch's familiar, and he gets scared. Kirchi assures him that familiars are obedient to their master and will not go beyond what their master tells them. At the gathering, Hiraga gets scared when he sees a familiar and runs into a maid. The maid is taking a cake to Geech. Hiraga apologizes for what he did. It appears that everyone already knows about Hiraga. The human was summoned as a familiar. The maid introduces herself as Siesta. She explains to Hiraga that those who can perform magic are the aristocrats while those without magic are plebeians. This is the reason she is a maid on the campus. Hiraga realizes that Siesta Siesta is taking the cake to Gicha, and he wants payback for what he did to him the other night. Hiraga offers to take the cake in her stead. Hiraga sees him talking to a girl, Montgomery, and he already has an evil plan in mind. Just as he serves Geech the cake, he makes mention of seeing him with another girl the night before. Mont immediately gets jealous when she hears this, and demands an answer from her boyfriend. Geech claims that Hiraga is lying. Just then, the first-year student, Katie, whom Geech is also dating, shows up. It turns into a lover's quarrel real quick, and Geech ends up losing both of his relationships in one day. Geecha gets angry that Hiraga has no manners against aristocrats and he plans to deal with him. He challenges Hiraga to a duel and Hiraga accepts. Louise tries to change Hiraga's mind about the duel because she believes that he stands no chance against a magic user. She suggests that Hiraga apologizes to Geecha, but he refuses. He wants to stand up to Geecha because there are no aristocrats in Japan. They meet at the Vestry Field for their duel. Meanwhile, Mr. Colbert has gone to see the principal about Hiraga and Louise. Mr. Colbert shows the principal the rune that appeared on Hiraga's hand. The moment the principal sees this. He asks his assistant to leave the room. Before leaving, Loungeville manages to get a glimpse of the rune symbol. Back on the field, Louise appears to be very concerned for Hiraga's well-being, and she is already in tears. She begs Geish to forget about the duel, but he refuses. He means to teach Hiraga a lesson. He summons a golem to fight Hiraga. The golem punches Hiraga, and he falls to the ground. He stands back up to challenge Geish again. Now in the principal's office, the principal informs Colbert that the symbol belongs to the legendary familiar. It involved the lost fragment of the Pentagon. He tells Colbert that the information must not leave the room. Hiraga's status should be kept under wraps. Hiraga continues to receive beating upon beating from Geech's golem, but he is not ready to give up. Hiraga's body is already covered with injuries. To make matters worse for him, Geech summons a sword for Hiraga to fight with. Louise doesn't want Hiraga to pick up the sword, because Geech will only get more serious with him. Hiraga is pretty stubborn, and he picks up the sword. Just then, the symbol on his hand shines bright and all of his injuries disappear. With one strike, he cuts down Geech's golem. Geech summons more golems, but Hiraga uses a speed attack to cut all of them down. He points the sword at Geech, and he quickly gives up. This comes as a shock to everyone. An aristocrat just lost to a plebeian. Hiraga drops the sword and passes out. Lounge is seen standing in the distance watching as everything unfolds. Three days later, Hiraga wakes up to find out that Louise has been the one taking care of him all this while. Siesta brings food for Hiraga per Louise's instruction. Louise is tired and is busy sleeping because she is exhausted already. After Hiraga is fully recovered, he is given a bulk load of laundry to do by his master. Louise claims that the laundry has been piled while he was out. Hiraga thanks Louise for taking care of him while he was out, but Louise replies and says his gratitude is not needed. It is her job to take care of him. All Hiraga needs to do is act grateful toward her and do all the chores she gives to him. Louise tells Hiraga to get the laundry laundry done quickly and get to class. While in class, Hiraga realizes why Louise is called Zero Louise. This is because she doesn't have the ability to wield any of the four elements. She has no accuracy whatsoever. He teases Louise with this, and she gets infuriated. She tells Hiraga that he is not going to eat, 
or the number of times he mentions zero. Hiraga starts begging, but Louise has her mind made up. That night, Hiraga is already starving, and she begs Louise to forgive him. She is about to let him off the hook when he accidentally talks about Louise's small bang. Louise gets angrier and tells Hiraga that he will not be given food in the meantime. In addition to that, he will sleep outside. Hiraga is forced to sleep outside the door. While he is there, Siesta shows up and takes him to the kitchen. It appears that Hiraga is now popular among the common folks who do not have magic. They are even referring to Hiraga as their hero. He is served leftovers from the aristocrats, and he happily consumes the meal. After this, Hiraga and Siesta take a stroll outside. While they are outside, Siesta tells Hiraga how hard Louise tried to make sure that Hiraga didn't die. She reveals that Hiraga lost all forms of consciousness when he passed out and Louise had to buy an expensive potion before he could wake up again. Hiraga had no idea the lengths that his master went to just to keep him safe. After their discussion, the duo says goodnight, and Hiraga makes his way to the dorm. He is in the hallway when he comes face to face with Kirch's salamander. The salamander grabs him and takes him to Kirch's room. She is already waiting for him and she looks appealing. She informs Hariga that she has fallen in love with him, and she wants them to be together. She was impressed impressed with the way Hariga defeated Giche. Hariga is seriously tempted because Kircha is attractive. Just then, several boys start to show up at Kircha's window. It seems they are all her boyfriends, but Kirchi tells Hiraga that they are just friends. She orders her salamander to spit fire on the boys and chase them away. Kirchi is finally ready to get down with Hiraga. They are about to start their business when Louise bursts into the room and demands that Hiraga follow her. Hiraga doesn't want to, but she tells Hiraga that he will have to contend with several aristocrats the following day, and Hiraga this is enough motivation to get Hiraga off his butt. Upon getting to her room, Louise brings out her wand and uses it to whip Hiraga. She claims that her family and that of Kirchi are enemies, and she doesn't want Hiraga near her. It seems Louise is just jealous that Hiraga is with someone. Louise promises to whip Hiraga like a stray dog anytime he goes out of line. She asks Hiraga if he's a swordsman and he says no. His fight with Gicha is the first time he will touch a sword. Louise then tells Hiraga to sleep so he can wake up early. They have somewhere to go in the morning. She forbids him from sleeping outside because Kirchi might come after him again. The following the following morning, they get on a horse and start traveling to an unknown location. Kirchi sees them when they are going and she makes the decision to follow them. She always wants to be around Hiraga. She is planning to make Hiraga fall in love with her. She goes to Tabitha's room to beg her for her familiar. She wants Tabitha's familiar, Silphid, to carry her so she can catch up with Hiraga and Louise. Tabitha agrees and the duo rides on her familiar's back. Three hours later, Hiraga and Louise get to a town. She makes her way to the weapons shop to buy Hiraga a sword. She is currently broke and cannot afford an expensive sword. The shop owner plans to rip Louise off, and he shows them a bunch of old swords. Hiraga has no choice, and he picks one of the swords that he thinks is best suited for him. Hiraga knows that Louise is broke because she bought the expensive potion for him. Meanwhile, Kirchi has been following them, and she believes that Louise is getting Hiraga a present to get his affections. She decides to go to the weapon shop and buy Hiraga the expensive sword. She presents the sword to Hiraga, but Louise doesn't want him to use it. The decision is now left to Hiraga. He is caught in a dilemma of which sword he should use. While the argument is on, the old rusty sword suddenly speaks out. The sword scolds the trio for making noise and waking him up. They are amazed that the old sword has a mind of its own. It turns out that Hiraga will choose the old sword. The sword introduces itself as Delfinger. The sword is happy to meet its new user, Hiraga. Louise wonders why she always ends up with creepy things flocking around her. Up next, the principal receives a visitor in the person of Count Mott. The Count is on a royal trip to the academy. He has been sent by the palace to keep a treasure at the academy. Apparently, there is a mage, Sandy Fouquet, running around and stealing aristocrats' valuables. The palace wants to keep the Staff of Destruction safe, so they have decided to stock it in the Academy. The Academy's vault has several layers of security protecting it, and it was cast by a square mage. A square mage is a mage who has the ability to wield all four elements. A triangle mage is one who can wield just three elements. A line can wield just two. Elsewhere, Hiraga is busy doing the laundry when Siesta shows up behind him. Siesta thanks him for the courage he has given to her and the commoners. He is a symbol of hope to the commoners. After her departure, Hiraga makes his way to the dorm. Kirchi comes out of her room and offers Hiraga the expensive sword she got for him. He is still interested in the sword, so he falls for Kirchi's tricks and enters the room with her. Kirchi wastes no time when she starts to touch Hiraga romantically. Hiraga asks her why she likes him, but she can't say anything tangible. He gets angry and wants to leave. She offers him several valuables, including her family's heirloom, just to keep Hiraga, but he refuses. Her family heirloom is a book that was passed down to her. Kirchi goes the hard way and tries to force herself on Hiraga, but Louise enters just in time to save him. Upon getting to their room, Louise beats him up with the whip for foolishly falling for Kirchi's trick. The following day, Louise tells Hiraga that he will have to stay outside the classroom for that day. Hiraga is always peeping at the girl's underwear when he is in class. While he is outside, the chief chef finds him and takes him to the kitchen to give him food as usual. Hiraga notices that Siesta is not in the kitchen and he asks after her. The chef is surprised that Siesta didn't tell Hiraga. He reveals that Count Mott has officially 
repeatedly requested for siesta. She has gone to his estate, and she will now be working there. Hiraga discusses the matter with Louise after class. The sword jumps in to inform Hiraga that any time a maid is called upon officially, she is to become the aristocrat's mistress. Hiraga immediately gets worried because of this. The following day, Hiraga finds Gish, where he is trying to mend his relationship with Mont. He asks him for directions to Count Mont's estate. After he gets the directions, he leaves on foot. Later on, Louise is looking for Hiraga, and Gisha tells her where he went. Louise leaves immediately, and she goes after Hiraga. Hiraga gets to the estate, and he is soon found out by the guards. Mott is called to check on the intruder. Hiraga informs the Mott of the reason why he is there. He says he's ready to do anything so that Siesta can regain his freedom. The Count is ready to punish him for barging on him, but Siesta emerges and begs the Count. Since Hiraga has promised to do anything, the Count tells him what he wants. He wants the book that is with Kirchi. It is their family's heirloom, but he wants it. Hiraga agrees to bring the book to Mott as long as he promises to give Siesta her freedom. Hiraga leaves the estate and heads for the academy. He runs into Louise on his way back. Louise takes him back to the academy and scolds him for acting carelessly. She says there is nothing they can do to help Siesta because the Count is a high-ranking official who works in the palace. Unknown to Louise, Hiraga has a plan of his own. He waits for Louise to sleep, and he sneaks out of the room. He goes to Kirch's room to ask her for the book. Kirchi is ready to give him the book as long as he agrees to date her. She tries to force herself on him again, but he gets angry and pushes her away. He decides not to collect the book again. He leaves the room, but he takes the shining sword with him. He has plans to burst into Mott's estate and break Siesta out of there. He gets on a horse and leaves. After he is gone, Tabitha and Kirchi go to Louise's room to wake her. They inform her of what Hiraga is trying to do. Moments later, Hiraga arrives at the estate, but the guards catch him again. He is taken to the Count. The Count is surprised to see Hiraga back so soon. He also does not have the book with him. Hiraga decides to draw the sword on the Count. Unknown to him, any commoner who draws his or her sword on an aristocrat is liable to be punished in whatever way the aristocrat sees his fit. The aristocrat can even kill him if he wants. Mott doesn't seem worried when Hiraga draws the sword on him. Mott is a triangle mage after all. Hiraga notices that he is not receiving the power boost he had when he fought Geech. Mott is about to end him when Louise bursts into the room. She apologizes for the intrusion and tells the Count that she is ready to be punished instead of Hiraga. The Count refuses and he is ready to take the matter up, but Kirchi saves the day by offering him the book he wanted. Kirchi reveals that the book was summoned by her grandfather. When Mott opens the book, Hiraga realizes that it is nothing of importance. It is just a book filled with adult content. The Count gives Siesta to the group, and they leave. Upon getting to the academy, Siesta pecks Hiraga on the cheek in appreciation for saving her. Louise ends up punishing Hiraga severely for the trouble he caused her. Soon afterward, Louise has Hiraga preparing for the annual exhibition. The event is an annual exhibition where the second-year students get to show off their familiars. They show the people what their familiars are capable of. It is a mandatory event so Louise cannot pull out. She wants Hiraga to get good at something before the event so he won't embarrass himself and her. She suggests that Hiraga learn swordsmanship, but Hiraga has no chance in that department. He claims that the fight between him and Gish was merely a coincidence. Hiraga needs to learn something quickly. The event is upon them already. Furthermore, Louise wonders why there has not been any punishment concerning the stunt Hiraga pulled with the Count. Louise goes to class and leaves Hiraga to practice his swordsmanship skills on the field. She hopes that he will be able to grab something before the event begins. While he is practicing, Siesta shows up. He feels shy when he remembers that Siesta pecked him. Siesta talks about how hard all the second-year students are working. They all want to present a good show, and this is because the Princess Henrietta will be in attendance this year. She wants to watch the exhibition by herself. Henrietta has become a symbolic figure for the people since her father passed away. She is quite popular among the folks, and they respect her. Kirchi and the rest of the second years are busy training with their familiars. All of them want the royal reward. Later on, Long sees Colbert reassigning the guard at the vault to another location in preparation for the princess's arrival. Long questions this, and Colbert assures her that Sandy Fouquet will not want to try anything when the princess's guards are around. Moreover, the vault is very secure, and it should be a difficult task for a triangle mage to break through. These are the reasons he is confidently taking away the guard at the entrance of the vault. Shortly afterward, the princess arrives at the academy and she is welcomed by the principal and the rest of the school. Louise warns Hiraga to behave himself, or else he will be whipped as usual. That night, the two are are busy arguing in the room when they hear a knock on the door. Hiraga rushes over to open the door. A hooded figure enters the room. She takes off her hood to reveal that she is Princess Henrietta. It turns out that the two are childhood friends. However, it has been a couple of years since they last saw each other. Louise is acting all formal in front of Henrietta, but she stops her. The princess reveals that she has not had someone to talk to openly since her father died. Henrietta makes mention of the Count and reveals that she is impressed with Hariga for standing up to him. She then tells Louise that she was the one who made everything go away. She is the reason 
reason, Louise was not punished. The duo made a promise to each other when they were little that they would always be there for each other. Minutes later, Henrietta leaves. She is happy to have seen her friend and her familiar. The following day is the exhibition and the students are gathered. The princess is also in attendance. The students start to show the people what their familiar can do. It is Louise and Herga's turn. Hariga doesn't have anything in particular to show the crowd. The students are not expecting anything crazy from Louise in the first place and they just laugh at the duo. Louise drags Hariga off the stage once their time is up. Meanwhile, Sandy Fouquet has made her way to the vault. She has the perfect opportunity to break into the vault because everyone is busy with the exhibition. She cannot go through the door so she creates a sand golem to help break the wall. She's in the middle of this when Hariga and Louise pass by. The golem tries to attack Louise but Hariga saves her. He gets caught by the golem instead. Hariga tells Louise to leave but she refuses. She tries creating a fireball to attack the golem but fails miserably. However, the explosion her spell made caught the attention of those at the exhibition venue. Meanwhile, Tabitha is the one who receives the award for winner. Her familiar performed exceptionally, and the princess complimented her. The spell Louise created had hit the vault wall and she didn't know. Sandy is shocked and she wonders what sort of magic the girl has that was able to crack the vault wall. Sandy's golem breaks through the cracked wall so Sandy can retrieve the staff of destruction. Those at the exhibition are now aware that something is wrong. Sandy retrieves what she wants and drops Hiraga. He would have hit the ground and probably died if not for the timely arrival of Tabitha and her familiar. Sandy escapes and the guards' efforts to track her down fail. Henrietta is glad that her friend is safe. She tells Louise that she needs to head back to the palace and report what happened. After her departure, Louise informs Hariga that she is worried about Henrietta. There have been rumors that the palace is a bad place. Henrietta is probably surrounded by enemies and this worries her. Kirchi is busy feeding Hiraga while they are in class, and this is making Louise angry. She stops her and tells her to stop feeding her familiar. We all know that Kirchi will never stop. Kirchi then makes mention of the princess. It is rumored that she will be the one to take responsibility for the staff of destruction that was stolen. The guards that were supposed to be at the vault door were reassigned for her security. In addition, she was warned by her executives not to go to the exhibition in the first place, but she didn't listen. Louise is seriously worried when she hears all of this. Just then, Colbert enters the class to tell Tabitha, Louise, and Kirchi that their presence is needed in the principal's office. Upon getting there, Miss Longville informs the girls that she has carried out an investigation concerning Fouquet, and it turns out that there is an abandoned house in the forest that looks suspicious. She says the house might be Fouquet's hideout. The principal tells them that they need volunteers to go to the house and carry out an investigation. No one is ready to volunteer, but Louise raises her hand and says she is ready to go. Just then, Tabitha and Kirchi also volunteer to accompany Louise to the forest and check out the house. The principal leaves the matter for the three of them. Louise will be taking Hiraga with her. Longueville also offers to follow the kids as a guide, and the principal accepts. The team soon sets out to the forest. On their way, Hiraga asks Long why an aristocrat like Sandy would go around stealing from other aristocrats. She reveals that there are certain aristocrats who have devoted themselves to being criminals and mercenaries. She reveals that she has also lost the title of an aristocrat. Kerche wants to know how she lost it, but Louise stops her and claims that she is rude. Kerche then gives Hiraga the shining sword so that he can use it in case they run into trouble. They soon arrive at the abandoned house and they check through to see if there is no trap. Hiraga, Tabitha and Kerchi enter the house while Louise stays outside to stay on watch. Longueville decides to scout around the building to make sure that they are safe. While they are searching through the building, Tabitha finds the box housing the Staff of Destruction. Suddenly the sand golem appears. It tears off the roof of the building. Tabitha and Kerchi attack the golem with their respective attacks but none affects the golem. Tabitha immediately calls on her familiar so it can get them out of there before they are stranded. Hiraga realizes that Louise is still outside and she is in danger. He tells Louise to run, but she refuses. She attacks the golem with her spell, but it does nothing. The golem is about to crush her when Hiraga jumps in and saves her. He slaps Louise for putting herself in danger. Louise starts to cry and reveals that the students always make fun of her. She didn't want to run so that they wouldn't make fun of her again. The golem attacks again, but Tabitha's familiar has arrived. Hiraga carries Louise on the familiar, so she and the rest of the girls can be safe. He then goes after the golem by himself. He attacks the golem with the shining and expensive sword, but it breaks off immediately. Delfinger tells Hiraga to wield him if he doesn't want to die. Hiraga pulls Del out of its sheath and the rune symbol on his hand shines bright just like when he fought Geech. He receives a power boost and he feels lighter. He cuts off the golem's leg, but it regenerates. Hiraga is confused as to what to do to defeat the golem. Just then, Louise jumps down and drops the Staff of Destruction for Hiraga. Hiraga is able to figure out that the object is not a staff like they think. He unlocks the box to reveal the weapon inside of it. It is a 
a rocket launcher after all. He shoots the launcher at the golem and it destroys the golem. Just then, Longville shows up and says the Staff of Destruction fits its name. She picks up the rocket launcher and reveals that the golem is hers. It dawns on the guys that Longville is Fouquet. She tells them that she has no idea how to use the staff, and that is the reason she decided to bring people from the academy, because someone might manage to use it. She's impressed that Hiraga is the one who used it. She calls Hiraga the legendary Gandalfer. Thanks to Hiraga, she now knows how to use the weapon. She presses the fire button on the rocket launcher, but nothing happens. Hiraga then tells her that the launcher is a one-time use. In addition, he informs them that the rocket launcher is a weapon from his world. Fouquet is easily subdued. Upon getting to the academy, the principal informs them that Fouquet has been handed over to the royal guards. The girls have special rewards waiting for them because they defeated Fouquet. However, Hira will not receive any reward because he is not an aristocrat. After the girls have left, Hiraga asks the principal how the Staff of Destruction came by. The principal reveals that he was fighting a monster in the woods when a man appeared and eliminated the monster with the launcher. The man was wearing strange clothes, and he was severely wounded. He took the man in to take care of him, but he didn't survive. He had two launchers with him. He was buried alongside one. The principal then gives the palace the other launcher. From everything the principal has said, Hiraga is sad that he has no clue how to get back to Japan. Later that night, a party is held in celebration of their victory. Louise respectfully asks Hiraga for a dance. While they are dancing, Louise thanks Hiraga for saving her from the golem. She asks if Hiraga will be returning to his world if he has the chance, and he says yes. Louise's mood changes when she hears this. However, she is well aware that Hiraga has no choice but to return home one day. Up next, the princess invites Louise and Hiraga to the palace. She wants to thank them personally for catching Sandy. She bestows upon Louise the title of Chevalier. As a reward, she holds out her hand to Hiraga. Hiraga doesn't know what it means, and Louise has to tell him that the princess is giving him the opportunity to kiss her. Hiraga gains confidence and draws the princess closer to Louise's amazement. He pecks the princess on the lips instead. Louise beats him up for this, but the princess stops her. Hiraga claims that he had no idea that he was supposed to kiss Henrietta's hand. After this, the princess informs Louise that she has a mission for them. She has had rumors there are aristocrats oppressing commoners. She wants the two to live undercover in the town in the meantime to help her uncover the truth. Louise happily accepts the task. After they leave the palace, Louise changes into a commoner's clothes to try and blend in. However, their problem starts when Louise tries buying a horse, and she is told that the horse costs 400 coins, which is all she has. She tries to rent a hotel room and is informed that the hotel room costs 200 coins for a night. Louise has never survived outside of the comfort of life. Hiraga suggests that they get a cheap place where they can stay, but she refuses. She goes to a casino to try and double the money with her, but ends up losing everything. Now the two have nothing to survive. They don't even have the money to eat, not to mention the one they can use to rent an inn. They are in the middle of the street when they are approached by a weird-looking man, Scarin. He tells the two that he runs an inn down the street, and he is willing to give the two a place to stay on one condition. He takes them to his inn and shows the group of girls who work for him. The girls dress in attractive clothes and attend to customers. They are to make the customers like the inn and also give them tips. Scarin introduces Louise to the group as a new member. Hiraga has been sent to work in the kitchen. He meets a maid, Jessica in the kitchen, who shows him what and what to do. After this, Scarin decides to make things fun for the girls. He tells them that they will be competing in the tip race. Whoever gets the most tips for the week will be rewarded with the best fairy dress in his collection. He tells them that it is a family heirloom and it would look good on whoever wears it. Whoever works hard the most will get the reward. Louise is happy that she has gotten her chance to make more money. Customers soon arrive at the inn. Louise could not cope with the fact that she had to attend to commoners. She is the daughter of a duke for crying out loud. She doesn't even know how to pour a drink. She ends up punching one of the customers who tried touching her. Scarin jumps in and apologizes on her behalf. He tells them that she is still new at work. Later that night, Louise complains to Hiraga about it. Hiraga says she needs to adapt if they are to survive. Hiraga sleeps off minutes later. Louise ends up sleeping beside Hiraga when she finds out that there are bats inside their room. As days go by, Louise continues to maltreat the customers because she simply has no idea how to treat them well. On the other hand, Hiraga just learned that Jessica is Scarin's daughter. Louise is in the distance, and she gets jealous when she sees Hiraga and Jessica getting all comfortable together. She throws a bottle at him and knocks him out. Hiraga wakes up in Jessica's room with her standing over him. Jessica says she has been able to figure out that Louise is an aristocrat and Hiraga is her servant. She is sure that the two are on a mission. She is willing to help Hiraga out on their mission if he lies with her. She is getting closer to Hiraga when Louise bursts into the room. Hiraga lies that he was gathering information, but that doesn't stop Louise from hitting him on the balls. She drags him out of there. Jessica reminds Louise that she is currently losing the tips race. This has Louise concerned again. It is the final day of the competition, and Louise has not been able to gather any tips. Shortly afterward, 
an aristocrat, Turenne enters the inn. He is the revenue agent for the queen, and he is quite rich. However, girls do not like serving him because he likes to touch them and will not give them tips. Louise steps up to serve the aristocrat. She believes that this is her chance to win the race. However, things turn south when he starts to flirt with her. She punches him in the head, and this provokes the aristocrat. His guards are ready to punish Louise for her insolence. Hiraga jumps to defend his master, but he doesn't have his sword with him. Louise ends up using her wand and thereby reveals that she is an aristocrat. She brings out the royal decree given to her by the princess and the aristocrat starts begging. He wants Louise to spare him and he will not make mention of what happened anywhere. He bribes Louise with a lot of coins and Louise lets him. He runs out of there with his tail between his legs. Because of the plenty of coins the aristocrat left for Lousy, she ends up winning the tips race. She is then given the best fairy dress as a reward. Board. She wears the dress just for Hiraga to compliment her. Meanwhile, Fouquet has been broken out of prison by an unknown man who appears to be her associate. Hiraga and Louise return to school to find out that everywhere is quiet. Louise remembers that they are on summer vacation. Everyone has traveled to take a rest. They get to the entrance to find Kerchi and Tabitha preparing to leave. Kerchi reveals that she's going to Tabitha's home for the summer vacation. She hugs Hiraga before leaving. While they're traveling in the carriage, Kerchi tries talking to Tabitha, but she just keeps mute and continues reading her book. Kerchi wonders why Tabitha is studying abroad just like her. She and Tabitha are from different kingdoms. They just came to Tristane to study. Kerchi was expelled from her former school. They soon run into a farmer who informs them to take the high road. He says the road up ahead is flooded. Back in the academy, Louise gives Hiraga plenty of clothes to wash. She is trying to punish him for hugging Kerchi. Hiraga doesn't mind the task. He packs the clothes and makes his way outside. He sees Gish and Mont have relationship issues as usual. He looks in the distance and sees an old pot. The chef informs him that he wants to throw away the big pot because it is no longer useful for him. Hiraga begs him to give him the pot and the chef agrees. He has no use for it after all. Del asks Hiraga what he plans to do with the pot, and Hiraga tells the sword to wait till night to find out. Soon afterward, Kerchi and Tabitha arrive at their destination. Tabitha's house is a big estate, and Kerchi is already suspecting if she is a member of the Gallia's royal family. They are welcomed by the family's butler, Perserin. Upon entering, Tabitha leaves Kerchi in the living room because she has business to attend to inside. The butler comes to serve Kerchi and keep her company. The butler calls Tabitha by another name, Charlotte. Kerchi realizes that Tabitha's real name is Charlotte. Tabitha enters a room where her mother is staying to greet her. However, her mother appears to be strange and hostile. The butler decides to tell Kerchi the story of how everything came to be. He says the decision for Tabitha to study abroad came from her uncle, who is the king. This confirms that she is part of the royal family. The butler tells Kerchi that Tabitha's father, the previous King Orleon, was the current king's younger brother. He was killed. Tabitha's father was loved by all, and he excelled in magic and other things. When the king died, Orleon was supposed to be the king because everyone loved him, but a fight for succession broke out between Orleon and Joseph. Orleon was murdered during the battle. Those who made Joseph the king tried to eliminate the rest of Orlean's family. One night, Tabitha and her mother were invited to a party. While they are at the party, Tabitha is given water to drink, but her mother drinks the water instead. It turns out that a toxic aqua magic which breaks one's mind had been cast on the water. In short, Tabitha's mother sacrificed herself to protect her daughter. Since then, Tabitha's mother has not been herself. Charlotte, who was once cheerful, also became cold and quiet. The name of the doll her mother gave to her is Tabitha, and this must be the reason she changed her name to disguise herself. Even after that, they still tried to eliminate Charlotte by sending her on impossible quests. She survived every one of them, and alas, the king chased her out of the country to study in Tristain. Back in the academy, Mont is preparing an unknown potion. Hiraga, on the other hand, has converted the big pot into a bathtub, and he's having a warm bath just like they do in Japan. He is in the bath when Siesta arrives. She asks to join him in the bath, and he reluctantly accepts. She jumps into the bath with him and tells him not to be embarrassed. Meanwhile, Mont and Gish are on a date. Siesta and Hiraga start to discuss the cultures of Japan. Mont is pouring Gish a drink, but she has plans to spike the drink with the potion she was making earlier on. Louise comes out of the room to look for Hiraga. She sees him bathing with Siesta and she just backs away slowly. She is boiling with anger, but she doesn't want to approach Hiraga just yet. Siesta informs Hiraga she had stories about her great-grandfather too. Apparently he was from another just like Hiraga. Her great-grandfather also fell from the sky. Hiraga wants her to finish the story, but she says it is getting late and she needs to leave. She gets out of the water, puts on her clothes, and runs off. Mont finally has the chance to spike Gish's drink. He's about to consume it when Louise shows up angry. She needs a drink and collects Gish's drink. Mont is well aware that she has messed up. After taking the drink, Louise heads back to her room. Moments later, Hiraga arrives. She's about to start scolding Hiraga when the potion starts to affect her. She starts saying sweet things to Hiraga and even tells him that she loves him. Mont shows up and says she knows what is happening. On the other hand, Charlotte has received a quest from the king. It appears to be dangerous, and Kirki has volunteered to accompany her on the quest. Louise gets more clingy 
thingy with Hiraga due to the effect of the potion. Mont reveals that the potion was a love potion and she didn't expect that Louise would drink it. She made it for Geish because she wants him to stop following other girls. She has no idea when the effect of the potion might wear off. It might be a day, month, or a year. Louise is busy disturbing Hiraga at the field when Siesta sees them. It is pretty obvious that she is jealous. She leaves without saying anything. Hiraga runs after her to try and explain things to her. He tells her that Louise drank a love potion, and that is the reason she is acting weird. Siesta doesn't believe him. She says it is common knowledge that love potions are punishable under the law. She ignores Hiraga and leaves. Hiraga goes back to the room to find Louise waiting for him. She has taken off her clothes, and she wants Hiraga to make out with her. He refuses the offer, and this spoils her mood. Hiraga hugs her and promises promises to get her back to how she was before. He leaves the room to find Mont. He tells Mont that he is aware that love potion is prohibited, and she will be punished if the authorities learn of this. He demands that Mont helps him out. They need to figure out a way to get Louise away from the influence of the potion. Mont has no issue accepting help out. She informs them that the only way to break the curse is to get the spirit's tear. However, it will be hard for them to get it. Mont is reluctant to go, but Hiraga reminds her that he can easily tell the authorities. He tells Mont to get prepared because they will be leaving tomorrow. That night, Louise tries to force Hiraga into bed with her, but he manages to control himself and refuses. Is Louise. The following day, the group begins their journey to the lake where the spirit is residing. Louise is also with them. They are headed for a lake that borders Gallia. They soon arrive at the lake, and Mont is surprised to find the lake flooded. The water level has increased exponentially. It turns out that this is the same lake that Kirchi and Tabitha avoided when they were traveling to her house. The group needs to stay around till night because the spirit can only appear to them when the sun sets. Later that night, Louise sends her familiar to the water spirit. She has once formed a contract with the spirit, and she hopes that the spirit will still remember her. She formed a contract with the water spirit when she was little. Shortly afterward, the water spirit appears to them. She approaches them in a hostile manner, but Hiraga reveals their intentions. He bows to the spirit and begs her to give them a part of her. The water spirit agrees to help on one condition. She tells them that there are bandits disturbing the lakes, and she wants them gone. This is the reason she raised the water level in the first place. She was trying to get rid of the bandits. Hiraga accepts the task, even though Mont doesn't want to fight. She has no choice but to join Hiraga, because he can easily reporter to the authorities. The group wonders what sort of bandits will enter the water to disturb the water spirit. Mont says only a mage with wind magic is capable of doing so. This will give the assailant the ability to create an air bubble and walk to the bottom of the lake. The mage responsible for this must be very skilled. The group decides to stay around the lake in case the bandits show up. While they are in the woods, they spot two hooded figures at the lake. Hiraga wants to engage the unknown people, and Geech reluctantly offers to help out. He wants to prove that he is not a worthless aristocrat. They make a plan to engage the hooded figures. Geech is to distract them with his magic while Hiraga goes after them. The plan appears to be solid. The plan gets underway and Geech does as said, but the two unknown persons easily dispel his attack. Hiraga charges toward them, but he is knocked to the ground also. Louise attacks the two guys with a spell that takes off their hoods. It turns out that the two guys they have been fighting are Kirchi and Tabitha. This comes as a shock to both parties. Kirchi reveals that Tabitha was given a quest to reduce the water level, and this is the reason they are at the lake. They decide to ask the water spirit why she is mad. The water spirit reveals that the bandits stole a treasure from her. She says the treasure is Anvari's ring. She plans to flood the entire world until she gets back the ring. Spirits don't die so she has lots of time to spare. Hiraga promises to get back the treasure if she lowers the water level. Surprisingly, she accepts. She calls Hiraga Gandalfer just like Bouquet did. This is the reason the water spirit trusts him easily. The water spirit reveals that the only name she knows of the bandits is Cromwell. Hiraga plans to find Cromwell and get back the ring. However, he doesn't plan to do it now. The water spirit is aware and she is not in a hurry. As a show of faith, she grants them a part of her body needed to break the love potion. They get back to the academy. Louise is finally free from the influence of the love potion. She returns to her normal self, but she remembers everything she did when she was under the influence. She ends up beating Hiraga again. They are in the middle of this when the princess comes into the room through the window. Louise demands to know why the princess has come to see her that late in the day. The princess needs something done with urgency and secrecy, and that's the reason she is there. The princess informs her friend that she has made the decision to marry into the kingdom of Germania. Tristane needs strong allies, and this is the reason she has made this decision. However, there is an item that she wants Lousy to retrieve. She sent a letter to her cousin, Prince Wales of the Albion Kingdom. She cannot afford for the details of the letters to get to the public. If it does, her marriage proposal will end. Albion is currently in chaos because some aristocrats are staging a rebellion. This is why she needs her friend to help out. Without hesitation, Louise accepts to help. Just then, Geish enters the room. He confesses to having heard everything that was discussed, but offers to help also. He wants to be in the service of the princess. Later that night, Siesta sees Hiraga where he is doing laundry, and apologizes for being rude to him when Louise drank 
like the love potion. She later finds out that Hiraga is not lying. After he is done with laundry, Hiraga goes to the lab to find Colbert. He needs to ask him about Gandalfer. Colbert explains that there are four elements of magic which are wind, fire, earth, and water. However, there is a fifth one which is lost. The fifth one is void. The legendary mage Gandalfer is the one who uses the fifth element. The rune on Hiraga's hand resembles that of Gandalfer, but there is no current proof that he is Gandalfer. Hiraga catches the smell of something in the room. Colbert explains that the blood of the dragon in his possession is responsible for the bad smell. He is working on a way to duplicate the liquid. There was once a time when two dragons appeared. One of them disappeared and the other fell somewhere. He managed to get some of the liquid that they shed. When Hiraga returns to the room, he promises Louise that he will always protect her. The following day, it is time for the trio to embark on their journey. The princess gave Louise a ruby ring the night before. The princess said the ring belonged to her mother. The princess has also arranged for a bodyguard to escort them on their trip. After some minutes of waiting, the said bodyguard arrives. He arrives on a flying griffin. It appears that Louise knows who the man is. He is a mage knight and he is also Louise's fiance. He is also the captain of the mage's knight and his name is Wards. Before long, the group begins their journey. As the journey proceeds, Needs, Louise finds it hard to maintain eye contact with Hiraga. They soon arrive at the town by the port, La Noche. They arrive at an inn where they are to spend the night before continuing their journey. Louise notices that Hiraga is acting all goofy towards. She goes over to talk to him. She tells Hiraga that her engagement towards was arranged by her parents, and she has no say in it, but Hiraga only answers with a sigh. After Louise's departure, Delfinger teases Hiraga and says he is in love with Louise, but he denies it. Shortly afterward, the group goes to the cafeteria to eat. While they are there, Wards reveals his intentions to spar with Hiraga because he is interested in him. Hiraga accepts the challenge without thinking twice. Twice. When it is time to go to sleep, Wards tells Louise to follow him to his room. She is reluctant, but he tells her that he has something important to inform her. The camera pans around the room for a quick second. It appears that Fouquet is stalking the group. When they get to their room, Geesh leaves to talk to a girl whom she claims caught his eyes earlier. After Geesh has left the room, Hiraga asks Del if he knows how Gandalfer is. Del replies that Hiraga is Gandalfer, and that is the only reason he agreed to be his partner. Apparently, Del knew Gandalfer some 6,000 years ago and was his partner then. Now in Louise's room, Wards tells her of his intentions to marry her once the mission is over. Del tells Hiraga that he didn't get him by coincidence. He was meant to have him, and
Bouquet. That is the reason she was stalling them. He knows that Louise is in deep trouble, and he needs to rescue her quickly. The next ship for Albion doesn't leave until the next morning, which means they will have to wait till the next day before they can follow Wards and Louise. While they are in the middle of this discussion, Geecha's familiar, Verdandi, which is a mole, emerges from the ground. On the ship, Wards asks Louise where the prince is, but she refuses to tell him. She insists that the location of the prince is a secret that Henrietta told her in confidence. Soon afterward, they arrive at Albion. They make their way to the building where the prince is supposedly hiding out. They are surrounded by knights who demand to know their mission. Louise reveals that she is an emissary from Henrietta, and she needs to speak to Prince Wales. She brings out the water ruby ring that Henrietta gave her as proof. Just then, the leader of the knights tells her to stretch forth her hand. The leader of the knights has a similar ring to the one Henrietta gave to Louise. He reveals that the one with him is a wind ruby ring. The two rings touch each other and they display a rainbow. The rings have been passed down from both families, he says. He takes off his helmet to reveal that he is the Prince Wales that they are looking for. Louise and Wales enter a room where Wales gives her the letter intended for Henrietta. He then reveals that an organization known as Reconquista is responsible for the civil war going on in the country. After she leaves the room, Louise runs into wards who suggests that they get married immediately. This comes as a shock to Louise and she refuses. She wants to return to Tristane before marrying. Just then, wards holds her and tells her that Reconquista needs her. She hears this and realizes that wards is a bad person. She tries running away but she's intercepted by one of Wards' comrades. He uses a spell to keep Louise under his control so they can do whatever they want. Moments later, Wards takes Louise to the church so that Wales can join them together as husband and wife. Louise feels that she is being forced to do what she is about to do, but she doesn't have the strength to break free from the spell. The deed is about to be done when Hiraga bursts into the church and stops the ceremony. He calls out Louise's name, and this is enough to break the influence of the spell over her. Wards wonders how Hiraga is able to find him. He reveals that they have Giche's familiar to thank for that. Wales is shocked to find out that Wards is working with Reconquista. Wards pushes his sword into Wales and eliminates him. Wales takes off his ring before dying and he gives it to Louise. Warids attacks Hiraga because he is pretty sure that he can take him. Just then, Hiraga gets a power boost because of the love he has for Louise. His determination and passion to protect her makes him almost unstoppable. The rune on his hand shines bright and he charges toward Wards. He cuts Wards on the shoulder. Wards realizes that he cannot win the fight and the best decision is to retreat. He tells the two that he has completed two out of his three objectives. One is to eliminate Wales. The second is to get the letter, and he has gotten it from Louise. The third one is to marry Louise, which has failed. He uses a destruction spell on the building. He escapes from the building. Hiraga and Louise are rescued by Tabitha. They ride on the back of Tabitha's familiar. Louise wakes up to see Hiraga kissing her, but she doesn't stop him. She enjoys the pleasure of being in Hiraga's arms. Louise returns to Tristane with the news that Wales is dead. She gives Henrietta his ring and apologizes for failing her mission. Henrietta hugs her and says she didn't fail. Tears run down their cheeks as they hug each other. Later on, Colbert goes to the principal's office to talk to him and get his permission to go after the whereabouts of the fallen dragon. The principal gives Colbert the go-ahead, but the principal is pretty sure that he will return empty-handed. Colbert leaves the room at the same time Louise comes in to give the report of her mission. She asks asks Osmond what the Descendant of the Void means. She heard it from the man who put the spell on her. The man calls Louise the Descendant of the Void. Osmond explains that the Void is the fifth element, and this shocks Louise. She claims that she cannot even do basic magic, and they think she is the descendant of such an amazing element. The principal then tells Louise that Hiraga is Gandalfur. Hiraga and Louise continue their usual relationship as if nothing happened between them. She gives Hiraga a new set of laundry to do. He is doing this when Siesta comes to meet him. She informs him that she is going to her village of Talb for vacation. Hiraga then asks Siesta to tell him about her great-grandfather. She reveals that her great-grandfather was the one who was riding the fallen dragon. The other dragon disappeared into the solar eclipse. The fallen dragon is still being kept in her village as an heirloom. Hiraga gets interested in this and tells Siesta to take him to her village because he would like to see the dragon. Unknown to him, Giche, Kirchi, and Tabitha are hearing his discussion with Siesta. They plan to follow the duo. Louise is pacing around the field thinking of how Hiraga kissed her when she sees the two riding off on a horse. She gets jealous and she goes to the chef to ask where Siesta is headed. She is able to get the info that Siesta is heading to her village. Soon afterward, Hiraga and Siesta make it to the entrance of her village. Hiraga decides to stay at the entrance while Siesta enters the village to retrieve the map of where the fallen dragon is. Moments later, Siesta arrives with the map. The duo sits down in the forest to study the map. They are in the middle of this when Kirchi, Gichi, and Tabitha arrive. They make their way to the cave leading to where the dragon is resting. Meanwhile, Reconquista has taken over Albion. While walking through the cave, they run into Colbert, who is also on the hunt for the dragon. It turns out that Louise is with Colbert. The group arrives at an old building at the back of the cave. Outside the building is a grave. 
Hiraga finds out that the writing on the gravestone is in Japanese, and this makes it easy for him to read. The writing translates to, The Marine Force, Second Lieutenant Sasaki Takeo sleeps in an unseen land. They open up the building. Upon entering, Hisaga finds out that what they are calling a dragon is a military jet fighter. Hiraga touches the aircraft and his power immediately resonates with it. The rune on his hand shines bright just as he touches the plane. It then dawns on Hiraga that Siesta's great-grandfather is from Japan. This means Siesta is of Japanese descent. Colbert points out that Hiraga can now return to his world with the aircraft. The reason Siesta's grandfather was not able to return was because he missed the window of the solar eclipse. His other comrade made it and returned home. All Hiraga needs now is the solar eclipse to return home. Louise finds it hard to move when she realizes that she might actually lose Hiraga. The time for him to return might actually be sooner than she expected. Meanwhile, Henrietta has now informed her mother of the mission status, the death of Wales and the loss of the letter. Her mother tells her that Germania has also cancelled the marriage proposal. This is a series of bad events for them. Just then, a guard arrives to inform them of an emergency. Later on, Colbert and the rest of the group manage to get the jet fighter to the academy. Hiraga finally realizes that the dragon blood that Colbert was referring to is actually gasoline. He needs gasoline to power the aircraft and he urges Colbert to find a way to replicate it as soon as possible. Hiraga enters the cockpit, and he realizes that he somehow knows what to do when it comes to the aircraft. Dell informs him that the rune on his hand helped him out on that. The aircraft is a weapon, and that is the reason he is able to manipulate it. Louise stands in the distance with tears in her eyes. She walks away out of anger and desperation. Just then, Geechee arrives to tell her that there is an emergency. Albion has been renamed Reconquista, and they have declared war on Tristane. Now in Albion, the leader of the evil organization is seen having a meeting with wards in Fouquet. The leader of the organization is the wearer of the ring that was stolen from the water spirit. They have plans of conquering the whole land, and they are to start with Tristane. Hiraga finds Louise to inform her that there will be a solar eclipse in the next three days, and he plans to leave then. Louise pretends that she does not care, and tells Hiraga that he is free to leave. Hiraga leaves her presence out of annoyance. The authorities of Tristane sit down for a military and strategic meeting. Most of the aristocrats are calling for a surrender. They believe that Albion has more military strength, and it will be advisable for them to surrender peacefully. Henrietta cuts in and informs her mother that she's ready to lead the army out. She wants them to face Albion and show them that they are up to the task. Her mother agrees. Later that night, the principal informs the students that the school will be closed till further notice. The princess is already mobilizing the military for battle. Louise hears this, and she realizes that she needs to be beside the princess. She goes to her room and she finds Hiraga sleeping already. She touches his face and greets him goodbye. The following morning, Hiraga wakes up to see a note beside him. He cannot read, but Delfinger helps out. The note informs him that he has been fired and he is free to do whatever he wants. Hiraga stands up and shows Kerche the note. Kerchi tells him that Albion has declared war, and Louise has gone to fight alongside the princess. Kerche has no intention of going because she is from Germania. The following day, Albion sends a warship to Tristane, and the first place the warship is to attack is Siesta's village. It turns out that the leader of the Reconquista, Cromwell, is using the Ring of Andvari to control the military. Henrietta and the military are already on the way to Talb to reclaim the village. Up next, Colbert is finally able to replicate the gasoline, and Hiraga is ready to leave. Just then, then, he hears that the Taub is under attack. He changes and decides that he needs to help Siesta's village before he leaves. He starts the aircraft, but the jet doesn't have enough runway to take off and Tabitha is forced to use her magic to help out. The aircraft lifts off and flies off smoothly. Tabitha calls on her familiar so she can follow Hiraga. Kerchi is forced to join Tabitha. The trio fly alongside each other. Now in Taub, the military is having a hard time with the enemy's warship and their dragon knights. Louise notices that the eclipse is already forming. Minutes later, Hiraga arrives in the jet fighter. The battle takes a turn with Hiraga's arrival. He starts to shoot down the Dragon Knights with the jet. Cromwell, Wards, and Fouquet are worried about this. Fouquet and Wards get off the warship to deal with Hiraga before he ruins their plans. Wards gets on his dragon and goes after Hiraga. Hiraga swallows up Wards' attack with his sword. The jet fighter has run out of ammo, so Hiraga has no way of fighting Wards. On the other hand, Fouquet is engaging the ground forces. Giche is about to run away when Tabitha and Kerchi arrive. They stop him from running and force him to join them in fighting Fouquet and her golem. Geesh creates petals around the golem with his magic. He then turns the petals into oil. Kerchi uses her fire attack to ignite the oil. With this, the golem crumbles to pieces. Fouquet is defeated, and she runs away. Geech runs after with the hope of catching her. The fight between Wards and Hiraga continues. Wards hits the jet's fuel tank, and gasoline starts to leak out. He is about to finish Hiraga off when Kerchi, Tabitha, and Louise arrive on Silphid's back. Kerchi shoots Wards with a spell to knock him off balance. Louise from Silphid's back, and Hiraga catches her. He lifts her into the plane. 
Wards regains balance and comes after Hiraga. Hiraga holds Louise tight and reveals his intention of protecting her with everything he has. Just then, the duo gets linked together. Her power has the Void Mage activated. She cooks up a spell that shines bright in the sky. With one strike, Louise knocks down Wards and destroys the enemy's warship. Louise passes out after using the spell. Hiraga manages to land the plane. However, the Eclipse is now gone and he has missed his chance to leave. Cromwell survives the attack and he runs into Kirche and Tabitha. He tries using the ring's power on them, but Giche shows up and hits him in the head with a stick. Louise finally wakes up in Hiraga's arms. She draws close to him and kisses him passionately. She yells that she pecked him as a seal of contract renewal. At this point, we have reached the end of our video. If you like it, do not forget to put the like button and subscribe for more new videos. Hello and welcome to Memo Anime Recaps, do not forget to like and subscribe. After the events of the first season where Hiraga and Louise defeated Cromwell and Hiraga lost his chance to go back home, the two have become closer than ever. Hiraga wakes up from a dream where he went back to Japan without Louise. He screams out of the dream because he cannot afford to lose Louise. Louise wakes and asks him why he is screaming. He is very happy to see that his lover is still beside him and that his return to Japan was just a dream. Louise is now allowing Hiraga to sleep on the bed with her. However, she does not want Hiraga to look at other girls. The duo loves each other more than they are ready to accept. Meanwhile, Henrietta is being pushed by the Cardinal to become the Queen. He claims the people love her, and they need a Queen to be able to stand against Albion. They are still in the middle of a war even though they have halted Albion's march in the meantime. Now in his cell room, Cromwell is visited by an unknown woman. She appears to be his associate. She condemns Cromwell for failing on the task given to him. Cromwell argues that the intervention of the Void Mage caused his failure, but the unknown woman is not ready to accept any excuses. The woman has also been able to retrieve the Andvari ring that was seized from Cromwell. Since they have no use for Cromwell again, the woman eliminates him right there inside his cell. Up next, Hiraga and Louise are preparing for the princess's parade. Louise brings out a pair of glasses covered with rubies and hands it over to Hiraga. Hiraga wonders why he is being given a pair of glasses when he is not suffering from any eye defect. Louise refuses to state the purpose and just tells him to put it on. He puts on the glasses and realizes realizes that he can no longer take the glasses off. Just as they leave the dorm, they run into Siesta, and Hiraga runs over to talk to her. While he is talking to her, he concentrates on Siesta's big bang. The rubies on the glasses start to beep rapidly. Louise appears behind him to reveal that the glasses are a magical item. Anytime Hiraga looks at a girl other than Louise lustfully, the gems around the glasses will glow. This is Louise's plan to know whenever Hiraga is doing so toward other girls. Louise brings out her wand and whips Hiraga as usual. This leaves a loud explosion that rocks the school. This is no news to everyone again. They they are already used to Louise beating Hiraga up. Hiraga and Louise arrive at the parade ground that day, but Hiraga is not himself. He has been dealt with severely by Louise for looking at almost all the girls that pass by. She tells Hiraga to close his eyes and not open them. Shortly afterward, the princess passes by in her cart. Louise wants to see how majestic Henrietta looks and she tells him to open his eyes. He does so and the glasses end up glowing again. Louise gets angry and shoots Hiraga with her wand. This leaves another explosion that immediately has the guards surround them. They are treated as outlaws, but Hiraga is the only one captured and thrown in a cell. Louise tries to explain to the captain of the musketeer's force, Agnes, that she is responsible for the incident but she doesn't care. Hiraga wakes up in his cell to find out that the glasses are damaged and he can now take them off. Minutes later, Henrietta surprises Hiraga and enters the room. She tells Hiraga that she has a favor to ask of him. She tells Hiraga that she wants him to lend the kingdom his powers. She wants Hiraga and Lousy to work together as undercovers to help defeat the kingdom's enemies. There is of no doubt that the two possess immense powers to boot, and she needs this to protect the kingdom. She further adds that there are enemies in the kingdom, and she has only a few people to trust. Hiraga and Louise are one of those people. She then hits Hiraga with the news of crime. Cromwell's death. This is proof that enemies exist within the kingdom. Only people who are familiar with the cell could have gone there to hurt Cromwell. The princess wants Hiraga and Louise to stay in the academy for now. After discussing all of this with him, Henrietta tells Agnes to bring Louise into the room. Hiraga is scared that Louise will beat him up again. However, she shocks him and jumps into his arms. She has missed him, and she shed tears while saying so. Hiraga draws her closer and pets her on the head. While they are returning to the academy, Louise brings out a book that was given to her by Henrietta. The book is called The Book of Invocation. She opens the book, but the pages are blank with nothing written in it. Upon getting to the academy, Agnes tells the two that Henrietta's words shall be passed down to them 
via a member of the Musketeer Force. The duo's code name will be Zero. Upon entering the room, Louise brings out her whip and starts to deal with Hiraga for looking at Henrietta perversely. This continues till the following morning. Very early that morning, Agnes rushes over to tell the duo that Henrietta has been kidnapped. A flashback scene shows Henrietta and Prince Wales swearing an oath of love at the Lagdorian Lake. It appears that the two were secret lovers. They loved each other to the point that they had to make an oath. Henrietta is in her room remembering all of these when she hears Wales' voice. She looks outside her window to see Wales standing outside. She is surprised by this. Wales assures her that he is the one talking to her, and the person who died was his double. Henrietta opens the window and jumps into Wales' arms. She has missed her lover so much. Wales tells her that they need to leave quickly. He wants them to return to Albion even though it is a risk. He claims that it is his duty as a prince. Now in Louise's dorm room, she is still shocked by the news of Henrietta's disappearance. Agnes informs her that the person who kidnapped her is headed toward Lagdorian Lake. They need to get going as quickly as possible to be able to catch up. Agnes is keeping the issue between her units only. She wants the assistance of Louise and Hiraga on the rescue mission. After relaying all the necessary information, Agnes gets on her horse and rides away. Hiraga preps the jet fighter to help with the chase. Colbert tells him that the aircraft is not fully operational because it is still under repair, but Hiraga needs it immediately. Hiraga and Louise get in the plane and the aircraft manages to lift off. As the duo leaves, Tabitha sees them, and she is able to deduce that they are probably leaving because of an emergency. She calls on her familiar, Silphid. She and Kirchi get on Silphid and follow the aircraft. Hiraga and Louise wonder who could have kidnapped the queen. They suspect that it might have been the spy that Henrietta was talking about. There is also the issue of the Anvary ring going missing. Louise reveals that the ring has the power to give the dead a false life. The person who possesses the ring will be able to control the dead he or she has given the false life to. The plane starts to malfunction because it is not fully repaired. Meanwhile, Agnes and the Musketeer Force are currently on Wales and Henrietta's heels. A fight breaks out out between the two, and Wales does not hold back when attacking the knights pursuing them. Henrietta is shocked by this. She reminds Wales that he is attacking her special unit. Wales claims that he is doing so to prevent them from getting in the way of their love. He wants them to the lake as soon as possible. He already has a ship stash there which will transport them to Albion. The jet fighter suffers total engine damage and it starts to go down. Tabitha arrives just in time to save the aircraft from crashing with her wind powers. Louise finds it hard to say thank you, and she even scolds Kirchi for following her and Hiraga. If not for Kirchi and Tabitha, you would definitely be dead. They can now see Henrietta under them. They are shocked to see Prince Wales. He is supposed to be dead, they say. Wales and Henrietta make it to the lake, but they are cut off by Hiraga, Kirchi, Louise, and Tabitha. Hiraga tells Henrietta that the Wales she is looking at is just a phantom. He was raised by the Andvari ring. Henrietta is blinded by love, and she argues that the one who died is Wales' double. Tabitha attacks Wales with spears made from wind magic. The spear passes through Wales' body but doesn't harm him. This is enough proof to make Henrietta change her mind but she is in total denial. Wales makes a counter-attack spell that knocks Tabitha and Kirchi to the floor. Henrietta orders Louise to let them go, but Hiraga refuses. He is ready to open her eyes, even though they are sealed shut. He draws his sword and repels Wales' attack. He charges toward Wales, but Henrietta stops him with an ice wall. Henrietta and Wales create a powerful spell conjured from water magic and wind magic. They shoot the spell at Louise, but Hiraga manages to block the attack with his sword. He finds it hard to hold out against the powerful attack. Louise needs an idea of how to get rid of the spell. Delfinger tells her to make use of the Book of Invocation. She brings out the book, and she is surprised when spells appear on the blank pages of the book. A dispel magic is shown to her, and all she needs is to complete the chance to activate the magic. Hiraga needs to hold on till she is able to complete the spell. Hiraga manages to block the attack until Louise completes the chant and activates the spell to undo Wales' magic. Wales is knocked down from the undo spell, and the ring's influence over him is broken. Wales returns to his normal self, but life is slowly leaving his body. He tells Henrietta to promise him that she will forget about him and love someone else. Henrietta finds it hard to make this promise because she loves Wales so much. With tears running down her eyes, Wales finally gives up the ghost in her arms. In the next scene, we see the male students of the academy getting ready for battle. They have all been drafted to the army because the kingdom needs all hands on deck if they are to invade Albion. Boyfriends and girlfriends are busy saying goodbye to each other. There is the hidden happiness inside of Hiraga that he will be the only male student left in the academy. He is already imagining wild things with the female male students. Louise wastes no time in knocking some sense into him as usual. Just then, a dragon appears from the distance. The dragon lands in the school and the rider, who is a blonde-haired boy, comes down. The rider introduces himself as Julio, and he is a student from Romalia. The girls are already falling head-on for him. Even Mont, 
who was crying that Guiche is going to fight in the war, wipes off her tears when she sees Julio. It turns out that he is a real charmer already. Later on, Colbert is teaching the remaining students in the class when Agnes and her unit enter. Agnes orders that all the students move out to the field for a training session. This includes Julio, who has joined the class. Hiraga is angry that Julio has spoiled his plan of being the only male left in the school. Colbert objects to Agnes's orders. He says he doesn't want war to be brought to the school. Agnes is infuriated and holds her sword to his throat. She reveals her contempt for mages who use fire magic. She warns Colbert not to ever disturb her when she is busy carrying out her duties. She reiterates that students move out and they all comply. The female students are split into groups for training. She wants to train them on how to use swords and other weapons. She believes that mages are useless once their wands are collected from them. Hiraga is busy watching the training from afar when he is approached by the vice captain of the musketeer unit, Mikkel. Hiraga claims that he is not a student and he doesn't need to train, but the lady insists. Meanwhile, Julio is getting close to Louise. He has chosen Louise as his training partner and this is making Hiraga jealous. The vice captain beats Hiraga to a pulp because of his lack of swordsmanship skills. Louise runs over to comfort her lover. Louise and Hiraga inform Agnes that Hiraga can only fight with items that are made to be weapons. He is pretty useless with the wooden training sword. He receives a power boost when he is fighting with his sword, Del. Julio hears this and he challenges Hiraga to a duel. Whoever wins the duel gets to kiss Louise, he says. He is trying to rile Hiraga up because he knows how he feels about Louise. Hiraga accepts the challenge but Louise reminds him that he might end up eliminating Julio if he gets serious. Hiraga then suggests that they use wooden swords and Julio accepts. It is said that Julio is a flamen and Hiraga wonders why he is interested in Louise. Later that night, Hiraga approaches Agnes and he begs her to train her. He does not want to lose to Julio and she accepts. She also does not like blonde haired guys, so she accepts to train Hiraga. However, she is doubtful that Hiraga can learn a lot in just the space of one night. The training session begins and Hiraga struggles against Agnes. She toys around with him and he has no reply to all of her attacks. Meanwhile, Louise is busy looking for Hiraga. She finds Hiraga at the worst possible time. She finds him when he has managed to pin Agnes down. The situation looks awkward, and Louise believes that the two are having a romantic moment. She ends up whooping Hiraga's arse as usual. However, Hiraga has been able to pick up something from the training session. The following day, Hiraga and Julio meet on the field for their duel. The battle begins, and Hiraga is the first charge toward Julio. Most of the girls are rooting for Hiraga because they don't want Julio to win, so he won't end up kissing Louise. As the fight continues, Hiraga is already breathing heavily from exhaustion. Louise asks Del if Hiraga has a chance of winning and he says no. With what Del has seen, he knows that Julio is a master at swordsmanship and Hiraga has no chance whatsoever. Hiraga tries to get into Julio's head so that he can get an opening and defeat him, but Julio sees through him and he doesn't fall for his trap. Julio charges toward Hiraga with a finishing move, but he somehow manages to lose and Hiraga wins the duel. It is time for Hiraga to kiss Louise, but he rejects it. He is also not happy that he won. He claims that Julio is toying with him and he intentionally lost to him. Louise scolds him that he shouldn't have rejected her in front of everyone. Just then, the vice captain informs the two that their presence is needed. They get to the room where they are to have a meeting. They are surprised to see Henrietta waiting for them. They are more shocked when they see Julio inside the room. Henrietta tells them that Julio was sent by the Pope from Romalia because he is also trying to avoid the wall with Albion. Apparently, Julio is their teammate now, and he is to help Henrietta and Tristane in defeating Albion. Henrietta tells the trio that they are all she relies on. She further adds that it is not her happiness to subject the school to the dangers of the war. However, she has no choice. Now in Albion, Cromwell's secretary Sheffield is now in control of the country. She is using the ring to make the citizens and the military a abide by her wishes. One morning, Louise wakes up to find her eldest sister Eleanor at her door. Elion gives her no chance to digest her presence before dragging her by the ear out of the room. She says it is time for Louise to leave the school. Louise drags Hiraga with her. Elion sees Siesta on the school field and drags her along too. She wants Siesta to help on the journey home. Louise and her sister sit down in one carriage while Hiraga and Siesta share the other carriage. Louise cannot keep her eyes off of the two. She is monitoring their every move to make sure that they are not doing anything together. Elion informs Louise that she is dragging her home to get her a groom. She doesn't want her to learn magic again. She believes that Louise is wasting away at the academy. They all appear to be aggressive in the family because Elion is even worse. She twists Louise's ear any chance she gets. They soon arrive at Louise's family mansion. Hiraga finally realizes that Louise is from a very rich family. Louise is welcomed by her other sister, Catlia. Catlia appears to be a cool
cool person and not aggressive like the rest of them. While the family is having dinner, Elion tells their mother to stop Louise from going back to the academy. She believes that having a groom is the next thing that should be on her plate. Louise argues that Elion is supposed to get married before her, but Elion simply does not care. Their mother tells the girls that their father will be returning home tomorrow, and his decision will be final. They need to wait for what their father has to say. That night, Hiraga is worried about what he heard in the dining room. He cannot believe that they are planning to find Louise a groom. On the other hand, Siesta is thinking of Hiraga. She doesn't want to lose to Louise. She makes up her mind and she stands up from her bed to go to Hiraga's room. Later on, Katlia notices that Louise is worried about Hiraga. It is obvious that the two are in love with each other. She tells Louise to go to Hiraga's room and spend the night with the person she loves. Louise enters the room and crawls under the sheets. She kisses the person under the sheet and is about to take it to the next level when she realizes that the person she is touching has melons. She takes off the sheet to find out that the person she was touching is Siesta. Siesta is also shocked to see Louise and she lies that Hiraga told him to come to his room that night. Meanwhile, Hiraga is busy looking for Louise's room. He accidentally enters the worst person's room. The room he enters is Elion's room. Elion initially hugs him because she is asleep and the room is dark. Hiraga too doesn't know that he is not in Louise's room. He ends up getting his arse whooped when Elion finds out that Hiraga is the one she was hugging. Louise returns to her room with tears in her eyes. Her sister was forced to pet her to sleep. The following day, their father arrives and makes his intentions known. He wants Louise to get married. They are to find a suitable groom for her. Louise tries to argue with the decision, but there is little she can do. Her mother suspects that she's in love with someone, but Louise cannot divulge the information because Hiraga is a commoner, and there is no chance that they will allow her to be with a commoner. Louise runs away with tears in her eyes. Hiraga is in his room when Katlia knocks on the door. She talks to him about Louise. She is aware that the two are in love with each other. She is also aware that Hiraga will lose Louise if he doesn't act fast. She tells Hiraga that Louise is in the courtyard, and he should go and meet her there. She is fond of hiding inside the boat anytime something happens to her. Katlia informs Hiraga that she has a carriage prepared for them. He should get Louise and run away before it is too late. Hiraga finds Louise crying inside the boat. She is heartbroken that Hiraga prefers siesta. He takes off the sheet covering her face to reveal her teary eyes. Hiraga tells her that they should leave, but she refuses. She is angry at Hiraga for calling siesta. The duo starts to argue, and Hiraga is forced to reveal that he loves Louise. He says he is risking his life to fight because he loves her. The reason he is stuck in that world is because he loves her. Louise's face turns red when she hears all of this. Louise is very happy to hear Hiraga confess his love for her. She gives him the permission to touch her. He draws her close and kisses her passionately. They continue to kiss as the boat sails to the other side. The boat finally hits land, and the duo is shocked when they see Louise's father, mother, and elder sister looking at them in total shock. Louise's father orders that Hiraga be decapitated, but Hiraga pulls his sword. He grabs Louise and runs out of there. Siesta and the carriage are waiting for them at the other side of the drawbridge. The bridge starts to close, but Katlia uses her magic to stop it from happening and gives the two lovebirds the chance to escape. They get into the carriage, and they ride away. As they make their escape, Siesta thinks to herself that she will not give up on Hiraga. She is confident that Hiraga will choose her in the end. In the next scene, the girls are having their usual military training when Agnes arrives to inform them that they are going to have a practical magic class. In order to do this, they sought the assistance of a teacher from the National Magic Academy. The said teacher comes out, and Louise is shocked to find out that the teacher is her sister, Elion. After the introduction, Elion drags Louise to her room. She tells her that Henrietta personally sought her help in training the students because of the ongoing war. She was also the one who stopped her and her father from coming to the school to drag Louise back home. Henrietta has informed her that she has a special assignment for Louise. Elion makes fun of Louise and says she cannot practice average magic, which means the assignment assigned to her by Henrietta is not important. Louise's mood lightens up when she realizes that Katlia also came with Elion as her assistant. Later that night, Louise catches Siesta and Hiraga together. She's about to punish him when they hear a loud bang. They run out to investigate, and they find out that the noise came from the principal's office. It turns out that someone broke into the office to steal something from the safe the principal is keeping in his office. Agnes tells everyone except Hiraga to leave. Louise is surprised that Hiraga is asked to wait while she is asked to leave. Agnes tells Louise that Hiraga's strength is needed in solving the case, and that is the reason she has asked him to wait. After everyone not assigned to the case is gone, the principal explains to those who remained how everything happened. He explains that the thief broke into the office while he was not around. His familiar brought this to his attention, and he rushed over to the office. The thief has stolen some items from the safe already. The principal managed to leave a permanent seal on the thief's chest before she escaped. The principal reveals that the items that were stolen are the water and wind ruby 
rubies that the princess gave to him for safekeeping. Fortunately, the rubies that were stolen are fakes. He had sent the originals to his friend in Romalia. It was better than keeping it in the palace or the academy. The thief is suspected to be an insider because there has been no sign of entry or escape from the school. Agnes wants Julio and Hiraga to help out in the investigation. Hiraga then asks why Louise is not allowed to participate. Agnes tells him that all the mages are currently suspects. Louise's sisters are also suspects because the thief used earth magic. There is also the rumor that Duke Valier, who is Louise's father, hates the princess, and this might be the reason he put his daughters up to the task. Agnes tells Hiraga that she and Julio will check out the students, while Hiraga and Michelle will investigate Elion and Ketlea. The thief has a seal on her chest so they should ensure to check the chest of the suspect. Hiraga and Michelle get on it right away. Michelle tells Hiraga to check the sisters while she handles the rest of the teachers. Hiraga sneaks into Elion's room and manages to open her shirt to check if the seal is there or not. He successfully confirms that the seal is not there. Unfortunately for him, Elian wakes up and catches him in the act. She ends up beating him up. After this, Hiraga makes his way to Katlia's room. Katlia is awake when he gets there. Before he could explain the purpose of his visit, Louise burst into the room. She has been looking for Hiraga. She believes that Hiraga is trying to do something naughty with her sister and drags him away. She drags him to their room and tells him to take off his clothes. She already bought a new whip and she is ready to use it on him. She is about to get down to business when they hear another explosion. They rush outside to check. It turns out that the explosion came from Katlia's room. She tells Agnes and the investigators that the thief came into her room, burned her in the chest and ran away. Her story sounds suspicious, and Julio claims that she intentionally burned her chest to remove the seal. Louise tries to defend her sister that she is not the culprit. Michelle also shows up and reveals that she just found the fake water and wind rubies in the hay. All fingers now point to Katlia as the thief. While they are busy arguing, Elion enters the room and picks up a part of the candle used to burn Katlia's chest. There is a strand of hair on it. She says the hair strand belongs to either Katlia or the thief. She has a potion that will make the hair strand go back to its owner. She pours the potion on the hair and the hair flies into Michelle's hair. Michelle starts to deny the allegations. She claims that the potion is fake and all. Agnes tells her to open her shirt and prove to them that she isn't the culprit. Agnes further adds that the rubies aren't fake. They are the original ones, but they intentionally said they are fake so the culprit will dump them. Michelle is forced to open her shirt and it turns out that she is the culprit after all. She tries to attack Agnes but Hiraga blocks her. Agnes says she has always suspected that the person in Involved is someone close to her. Michelle manages to push Hiraga aside and escape through the broken part of the wall. However, Elion creates a golem to stop her. She is not ready to give up and Agnes is forced to fire a warning shot at her. She finally surrenders and she is taken into custody. While in custody, Agnes questions Michelle about her actions. She reveals that she has always hated the royal family because of one thing. While she was little, her father was accused of a crime and he ended up eliminating himself. Her mother followed suit too. Agnes argues that what happened was no excuse for her to hate the royal family. She she reveals that her hometown was also raised when she was little, and she was the sole survivor. She didn't because of this turn to the dark side. Michelle reveals that her father's friend took him in when she had no one else. She is working with this so-called father's friend. Agnes immediately figures out who she's talking about. She heard about the case before and she knows who Michelle's father's friend is. His name is Lishman. Agnes is interested in the man because the man is her foe too. After she is done interrogating Michelle, Agnes takes the report of the investigation to Henrietta. Agnes asks if the queen plans to arrest Lishman who is the chair president of legal affairs and prosecute him but she says no. The queen states that Michelle's confession is not enough to arrest and prosecute Lishman. They need concrete proof if they are to prosecute him for treason. Agnes is thankful to the queen for picking a commoner like her and giving her rank. She has raised her past the level she expects and even given her the chance to take revenge on her foe. Shortly afterward, Hiraga and Louise make their way to Scarin's inn. The queen has told the two to wait for her at the inn. She has an important mission to give to them. Upon getting to the inn, they find out that Scarin is currently organizing a play that will premiere in the theater. He is happy to see the two, and he immediately adds them to the staff. That night, Louise works as a waitress in the inn, while Hiraga is busy in the kitchen. Julio soon arrives, and he asks for Louise. He wants Louise to serve him. Hiraga is already jealous when he sees Julio with Louise, but there is nothing he can do. Julio and Louise sit down to drink and eat together. Hiraga goes outside to dump the waste. He runs into a woman in a hood and he apologizes for the mistake. The lady takes off her hoodie and it turns out to be the queen. The queen drags him into the inn rooms and tells him not to shout. Hiraga notices the presence of soldiers in the area. The queen tells him that she needs his strength. She wants Hiraga to be her bodyguard for the next couple of hours. Henrietta is undercover and this is the reason she cannot make use of her royal guards. She takes off her clothes and changes into commoner clothes so she can easily blend in. Meanwhile, Louise just noticed that Hiraga is nowhere to be found. Hiraga and Henrietta head out but they come across a military checkpoint. The duo is forced to act like a couple to prevent the soldiers from suspecting them. Elsewhere, Agnes has made her way to Lishman's estate. She tells Lishman that the queen has been kidnapped 
and they need his authority to seal the borders and major roads. As Agnes is about to leave the house, she asks Lishman if he knows about the village that was burnt down 20 years ago. The villagers were accused of being Protestants. Lishman admits to being the mastermind behind the massacre. He claims that it was justified because the village people were trying to overturn the country. Agnes tries to get more details about the event, but Lishman is not ready to talk, and Agnes leaves. Louise is now busy searching for Hiraga. Meanwhile, Hiraga and Henrietta are holed up in a room. The guards looking for Henrietta burst into the room, but they leave when they see Henrietta kissing Hiraga. They are embarrassed to check their faces properly because they believe that they are coupled. Now at Lishman's estate, he receives a suspicious visitor. As the visitor leaves the house, Agnes, who has been lurking around, follows him. She continues following him into town. While she is at it, she runs into Louise. Agnes is forced to take Louise with her, so she won't ruin the mission. Agnes sees the visitor meeting with another man. The visitor tells the man he is meeting with that Lishman is waiting for him at the usual theater. They have been informed that the princess is missing and they need to act fast about it. Henry Henrietta informs Hiraga that everything going on is a scheme to lure out the traitor who is in the palace. This is the reason she has intentionally declared herself missing. She knows that whoever the traitor is will currently be making a move. She asked Hiraga to be her bodyguard because of this. Henrietta then tells Hiraga that it is time for them to head to the theater. Agnes is also on her way to the theater. She tells Louise to remain on standby at Scarin's Inn in case anything goes wrong. Soon afterward, Louise joins Scarin and the crew as they head to the theater. She meets Hiraga backstage and she is surprised that he is not with Henrietta. Moments later, the show begins. Meanwhile, Lishman and his accomplice are watching the play. However, they are actually having a meeting and just using the play as cover. They talk about taking their chances since Henrietta is missing. Just then, Henrietta shows up behind them and reveals that she heard everything. She orders Lishman to be arrested by the guards for treason. Unknown to them, Lishman also has his own people inside the theater. A fight breaks out between the guards and Lishman's minions. It turns out the man meeting with Lishman is from Albion. Julio apprehends the man himself. Hiraga saves Henrietta from the jaws of death when one of the bad guys charges toward her. Lishman uses the commotion to escape into the underground section of the theater. He believes he has escaped, but to his surprise, Agnes is already waiting for him. Agnes reveals that he has no intention of apprehending Lishman. She wants to end him. She tells Lishman that she is a survivor of the village he ordered to be burnt down. Lishman reveals that the records she is looking for about the town are kept underneath the Magic Academy. Lishman uses the opportunity to attack Agnes because he believes that she has let her guard down. However, Agnes Agnes's will and determination surpass Lishman's tricks. She pushes her sword into Lishman and ends his life right there. With this, Henrietta is able to take down one traitor, and Agnes avenges the death of her kinsman too. In the next scene, Cardinal Masserini and General Poitiers ask Henrietta to sign the declaration of war against Albion. Henrietta doesn't want to sign this because she wants to resolve the crisis peacefully. The Cardinal tells her that the citizens are pushing war and it will be catastrophic to deny. He further adds that Henrietta might be dethroned if she refuses to take action action against Albion. Henrietta says she is not scared of a coup d'etat, but the Cardinal informs her that the next ruler might be aggressive and this will cause massive bloodshed. With Henrietta on the throne, the bloodshed can still be managed. With all this, Henrietta finally gives in and she signs the document to declare war on Albion. Germania is also in alliance with Tristain, and the two nations will fight Albion together. One week later, the report comes in that Tristain and Germania forces have won their first battle against Albion. Tristan suffered minimal casualties and this calls for celebration among the citizens. Hiraga wonders why the queen has now declared war. She was against the war before, he says. Louise says circumstances might have changed and that is the reason she had to declare war. As the duo walks through the market, Hiraga sees a sailor uniform that he likes and ends up buying it. Now at the academy, Agnes informs Julio, Hiraga, and Louise that the principal has forbidden her to access the vault beneath the school. She has gotten permission from the queen to check the vault already, but Osmond is refusing. Chiloyo says the vault was built over a thousand years ago and there are several magic locks around it. Entering carelessly might cost someone their life. This might be the reason the principal doesn't want her to go. Agnes is not ready to give up because she needs to see a particular document that is inside the vault. They approach Elion concerning the locks. They want her to help out with the vault locks. Meanwhile, Hiraga has given Siesta the sailor uniform he bought in the market. He believes that the uniform will look better on Siesta than on Louise. Siesta is looking for Hiraga to show him the dress, and he sees the group making their way to the entrance of the vault. She decides to follow Hiraga. They get to the entrance of the vault, and Elion easily unlocks the vault with her magic. Agnes wants to proceed alone, but the rest of the group disagrees. They want to see what is inside the vault, too. While they are discussing this, Colbert shows up. He tries to stop them, but he ends up going with them, too. Agnes says she needs to sort out the case as soon as possible. The Queen will soon be joining their forces on the battlefield, and she needs to be by her side. The Queen has refused to stay at home while thousands are on the battlefield. As they walk through the hallway, Agnes 
Agnes gets the feeling that someone is following them. Just then, Siesta appears from behind and reveals that she is following Hiraga, so she can show him how the sailor's uniform looks on her. Louise gets angry when she finds out that Hiraga gave Siesta the clothes instead of her. She hits Hiraga with her explosion spell, which in turn causes the entrance to cave in. They no longer have a choice but to continue into the vault. As they continue the journey, Colbert reveals his stance against war. He believes that war is unnecessary because it ends in the loss of lives. Agnes then tells the group that he has killed Lishman, who is responsible for the massacre of her town, but she needs to find everyone who is involved in the assault on her town. She also needs the name of the troop's captain that was sent to the town. They soon get to the bridge leading to the main vault. They cross the bridge to have access to the entrance of the main vault. They see a writing on the entrance. Elion reads out the writing and it states that the use of magic is prohibited while they are inside the vault. Failure to comply will lead to a catastrophe. They enter the vault to find out that it contains lots of books. It appears to be some sort of library holding confidential books and documents. The document Agnes is looking for is dated back 20 years ago. Louise soon finds the book containing the Dungletail case that Agnes is interested in. She sits down to read the book. Just then, Siesta trips and drops some books in the process. Elion uses her magic to rearrange the books. She is done using her magic when she realizes that magic is prohibited. The building starts to shake and the team has no choice but to run out of there. Agnes remains there trying to get all the information she wants out of the book. Hiraga and Colbert wait for her even though the building is coming down. Agnes finds out that the soldiers were given an order to burn all humans near Dungletail to prevent the spread of the epidemic. She gets to the page that is supposed to contain the captain's name, but finds out that it has been torn off. The building is already coming down and there is no time to start searching the whole place. Hiraga, Agnes, and Colbert run out of there. Colbert carries Agnes on his back as they run over the falling bridge. As they return to the academy, several questions remain unanswered. The epidemic that they were trying to prevent is unknown, and the name of the troop's captain has also been stripped off of the book. They arrive at the section where the entrance is blocked by rubble, and Louise uses her explosion to clear the path just like she blocked it. Meanwhile, Catlia can hear all the explosions from her room. Up next, Sheffield invites a fire mage, Menville, to Albion. She has a mission to give him. She wants him to raise down a particular place in Tristane. She gives him the mission to attack the Magic Academy and raise it to the ground. Now in the Magic Academy, Louise gets kidnapped by Elion and Hiraga helps her out. It turns out that Louise is planning to join Henrietta on the front lines. Elion doesn't want anything to happen to her sister, and this is the reason she has decided to lock her in a cell till she receives some sense. Elion states that Louise is the daughter of an important man, and she is supposed to be kept safe. Elion will be holding on to Louise's wand, so she has no way of casting an explosion spell to break out of the cell. Louise totally agrees with Elion, and he will be staying guard at the door. After Elion has left, Colbert shows up. He tries to talk to Louise about the war. He doesn't fancy war because no matter how you put it, war means murder. Colbert doesn't want any of his students to go through something like that. He tries to convince Louise to forget about going to battle. Later that night, a battleship appears above the academy. Menville and his men are inside the ship. They are prepared to rain down hell on the school. Menville and his men soon infiltrate the school. They take out the few guards that they come across. Menville tells his men to get into position and begin their plan. Tabitha is the first to notice that something odd is going on in the school, and she goes to Kirch's room to inform her. Some of the invaders make their way to Agnes's room, but she takes them down because of her training. Agnes rendezvous with the rest of her unit and tells them to armor up in preparation to repel the attackers. Colbert also notices that something is happening. He wants to go and check it out. He tells Hiraga to stay and protect Louise in her cell. Agnes receives the report that the invaders have taken hostages and they have gathered them in the cafeteria. Inside the cafeteria, Julio is among the hostages and he is trying to rile Menville up to get him to slip up, but Menville is an expert and he is not going to fall for Julio's cheap tricks. Menville tells the hostages to keep calm and they might make it out alive. Osman offers himself up as a hostage so that Menville can release the students, but he refuses. Elion and Catalea also do the same, but Menville does not accept the deal. He wants all the aristocrats' children. Having all their children will give them an incentive to force Henrietta his hand to stop the war. Agnes and her unit now have the cafeteria surrounded. She tells Menville to give himself up and she won't kill him. Some of Agnes's unit tries to sneak into the cafeteria, but Menville sees through them and he attacks them with fire. Meanwhile, Colbert has gone to his lab to send a message. Now in the cell, Hiraga and Louise have both heard the explosions. Louise manages to convince Hiraga to give her her wand so she can leave the cell and help out. Hiraga has no choice but to comply. Louise uses her explosion spell as usual and she destroys the door. Menville tells Agnes to stop stop what she is trying to do or else he will start executing hostages. Agnes and her unit rush into the room, but Menville easily destroys their weapons with his fire magic. Agnes charges toward him with her sword.
sword. While the duo are fighting each other, Menville reveals that he once burnt down an entire village and he enjoyed it. It immediately dawns on Agnes that Menville is responsible for the destruction of her hometown. Meanwhile, Tabitha, Kirchi, Hariga, and Louise have met. They are trying to come up with a plan. Agnes gets furious and she attacks Menville ferociously. Menville manages to disarm her. Colbert runs into Hiraga and the other three. He tells them to leave the school while they can because he doesn't want them to be involved in the fighting. He has sent for reinforcements already. Kirchi is not ready to go because it will take some time for the reinforcements to arrive. She tells Colbert to leave if he wants to. Now in the cafeteria, Menville tells Agnes that he was not the captain of the unit that raised her town. He was the vice captain then. Flamesnake was the captain. He was referred to as Engia then. He is a very cruel person, and even Menville is searching for Flamesnake. Menville wants to take revenge on him for giving him a scar. Flamesnake was the one who burnt Menville's eyes. Colbert and the kids are still looking for a way to handle the situation. He tells them to leave everything to him. He leaves for his lab and tells Hiraga to follow him. Menville continues his story of how Snake Flame burnt the village. He explains that Snake Flame is so powerful, and he manages to burn down the whole village with just one strike. Menville was attracted to this power, and he wanted it. He attacked Snake Flame from behind, but he was too powerful. He sucked in his attack and replied with a counterattack, leaving him with both of his eyes gone. While Colbert and Hiraga are in the lab, Colbert tells Hiraga that he would like to visit Earth one day. He is interested in their technologies and their way of life. The two are busy making balloons inside the lab. Kirchi is getting impatient waiting for them. Menville asks the principal to send a message to Henrietta to withdraw her troops from Albion, or the students will die. Osmond argues that he doesn't have much influence on the Queen, and she will end up ignoring him. Colbert and Hiraga arrive with the balloons that are filled with unknown substances. Colbert tells the kids that the balloons are his way of rescuing the students. They release the balloons into the cafeteria, and when everything explodes, it leaves a loud bang that disrupts the enemy's hearing and vision. Hiraga, Tabitha, Kirchi, Colbert, and Louise are able to infiltrate the room to try and rescue the students. A fight breaks out, but Menville doesn't seem to be affected by the effect of the balloons. He reveals that he doesn't even use his eyes again. He has evolved to the point where he now uses temperature to see like a snake. Menville grabs Kirchi and is about to burn her to death when a blue fire appears and blocks Menville's attack. It turns out that Colbert is Captain Flame Snake, whom Menville is talking about. Colbert tells Hiraga and Louise to rescue the students and get them out of there. Louise successfully uses an undo spell to remove the captive's binds. Agnes stands in total shock when he hears that Colbert is the foe he has been looking for. Colbert and Menville are fighting, but she keeps interfering in the fight because she wants to kill Colbert. She charges toward Colbert in a blinding rage. In the process of this, Menville directs his fire toward Agnes. In a bid to save Agnes, Colbert jumps in, saves Anges from the scorching fire, and gets burnt instead. Colbert lies on the ground with his clothes ripped. Agnes sees a mark on his back, and this reminds her of the person who rescued her from the fire. Menville is ready to finish Colbert off, but Colbert is not going down without a fight. Colbert attacks Menville with his blue fire, but he manages to absorb the fire. Menville says he has been training for the day, he will face Colbert again. Colbert no longer has the strength to fight, and he falls to the ground. Menville puts his staff in the air, and cooks up a very bright, scary, and fierce fire. He is about to finish the spell when Agnes rushes over to him while he is vulnerable. She pushes her sword into him and ends Menville right there. Agnes turns to Colbert and asks him why he saved her. Hiraga and the rest of the kids rush over to hold their teacher. Agnes holds her sword in the air with the aim of ending Colbert. The kids beg her not to eliminate Colbert. Colbert tells the kids to allow Agnes to kill him. He has made a mistake in the past, and he deserves to atone for his sin. Colbert narrates that his unit of mercenaries was hired to wipe out the village because there is an epidemic rampaging it. Colbert and his men get there. Colbert shoots fire into the village without investigating. Minutes later, one of his men arrives to tell him that there is no sign of an epidemic in the village. Colbert realizes his mistake and runs into the fire to find survivors. This was when he saw Agnes in the fire. He risked his life to get her out of the fire. Since then, he has made the decision not to kill, and he doesn't want any of his students to end a life too. This is the reason he hates wars. He turns to Agnes and asks her to kill him. However, he begs her to make him the last person she will terminate. Agnes gets angrier as Colbert talks. Just then, Louise tells her to put down her weapon, because Colbert has breathed his last. The following day, Agnes finds finds Hiraga at the hangar where the jet fighter plane is parked. He gives him a letter they found in Colbert's place that was addressed to him. Louise collects the letter to read it to him. Colbert tells Hiraga through the letter to not lose himself in the war. He begs him not to take a life. He also stated in the letter that he would like to visit Hiraga's world one day. Hiraga's eyes are filled with tears as he hears the contents of the letter. Louise asks Agnes if she will be able to forgive Colbert, and she replies that she has no idea. After Agnes leaves the hangar, Louise and Hiraga hug each other and shed bitter tears. Later on, Henrietta invites Louise and Hiraga to Albert 
Albion. She has a special mission for Louise. The general informs Louise of what they want from her. There is a large army resistance located in the south city of Gotha. The resistance will block their advance to Albion's capital. They need to get rid of the troops located in this area to have a clear chance of making it to the capital of Albion. Henrietta wants Louise to go over there and destroy the enemy forces with her void magic. Henrietta doesn't want the civilians to be caught in the line of fire, and this is the more reason she wants Louise to help out and make things easy for the soldiers who are planning to make their advance. After being briefed on all the necessary information, Louise accepts the mission and states her determination to serve the princess with all of her might and strength. Hiraga is shocked by Louise's willingness to serve the nation, even if it is at her own peril. Shortly afterward, the duo makes use of the jet fighter to fly over to their intended destination. Hiraga is angry that they were summoned to Albion just to be an instrument of war. They soon arrive at the military stronghold, and Louise begins to chant. Bright light shines around her as she chants her spell. Just then, she falls back into the plane. Delfinger reveals that Louise doesn't have the strength to wield the void magic for now. She had used all of her strength the last time she used the magic. Hiraga flies the aircraft over the target, but Louise tells her to turn back. She wants to try again. Her second trial is another failure. This has given the enemy dragon riders the time to gain on them. Hiraga is reluctant to shoot down the dragon riders because Colbert told him not to get used to killing. The dragon riders start to attack and Hiraga has no choice but to return fire. He shoots down the dragon riders but the aircraft has sustained damage already. They nose five into the snowy mountains. The duo is now in enemy territory. Later on, the general informs Henrietta that Louise and Hiraga have not returned from their mission. They no longer have a choice but to face the enemy head on. Henrietta reluctantly gives him the go-ahead to march out the troops. Agnes asks Henrietta what she plans to do about Louise and Hiraga, but the princess has no reply for her. Louise and Hiraga are busy navigating the harsh cold mountain together. They stop to spend the night. Hiraga suggests that they strip and hold each other tight so that they can survive the night, but Louise replies to him with a punch to the head. Hiraga passes out from the punch, and Louise gets scared that he is dead. She takes off her clothes and lies with him to keep him warm and cozy. The following morning, Hiraga wakes up feeling awesome. He wonders why this is so, and Del informs him that Louise cuddled him through the night. Louise shuts Del up before he can spill further. Meanwhile, Sheffield has ordered his men to retreat from Gotha and allow Tristane to take the city. However, she orders them to take away all the city's food Food supplies. She is very sure that the enemy troops will not last long without food. She also doesn't care if the citizens of the city starve to death. She is ready to sacrifice anyone to be victorious. She also tells her men to track down the aircraft that crashed into their territory. She doesn't care about the pilot, but she is interested in the machine itself. Up next, Hiraga and Louise run into one of the dragon riders that he shot down. He appears to be wounded. They decide to carry him to prevent him from dying out in the cold. The dragon rider fights Hiraga and his necklace flies off. Louis picks up the necklace and finds out there is a girl's picture on the pendant. The dragon rider doesn't want Hiraga to help him because he believes in honor. Hiraga lets him know that he will die if he doesn't allow them to help. Hiraga has never been the one to understand all the ideas concerning aristocracy and their honor. Louise also believes in the same thing the dragon rider does. They believe that it is an honor to serve their rulers. The dragon rider finally introduces himself as Henry. The trio continue to share their views concerning war, and Henry is impressed that Hiraga doesn't have the intention to kill. He calls him a strange one for that. The only reason Hiraga is fighting in this war is to protect his loved one Luis. He is not ready to kill anyone for politics. Henry then reveals that the girl in the picture is his fiance. He left just to come and fight in the war. Hiraga scolds him and calls him trash. He reminds him that he was human before he was an aristocrat. Louise tells him to return home and get married to the woman he loves. Moments later, Albion soldiers searching for the crashed aircraft pass by. Hiraga and Louise hide in the woods while Henry attends to the men. He tells them that the aircraft is on the other side of the mountain. Just then, a white dragon appears in the sky. It turns out to be Julio. He lands the dragon and he gets the two lovebirds out of there. They return to the base, and Louise pledges her allegiance to Henrietta once again. She reveals her determination to do whatever the princess asks her to do. Hiraga could just stand there in total shock when he hears this. It is for the New Year's festival, everyone in the city is celebrating. Louise and Hiraga end up arguing about who is right and wrong in the war. Louise gets angry and leaves Saito in the street. She makes her way to the palace where she meets with Henrietta. Henrietta has another mission for her and Hiraga, but Louise is the only one present. The general informs Louise that the two nations have agreed to a truce because it is the new year. However, the general doesn't trust Albion. They might want to carry out a surprise attack when least expected. Hiraga's aircraft has been recovered and the general wants the two lovebirds to fly to Albion's capital and spy on them. They want to know if they are making a move or not. The reason they can't send a dragon rider is to avoid accountability. If Louise and Hiraga are to fall into enemy territories and are captured, they can easily say that they are students who are just having fun. Without hesitation, Louise accepts the mission. She finds Hiraga who is busy fixing the aircraft. She decides 
not to talk to him about the mission. She goes to Julio instead. She asks Julio for a favor. She wants him to take her to the capital of Albion. Hiraga sees her talking to Julio, and he gets jealous. He runs over to challenge her, but Louise doesn't care. Louise says she is going on a mission. Hiraga wants them to go together, but Louise refuses. He watches on as the duo flies away. As they head to their destination, Julio asks Louise why she doesn't care if she hurts Hiraga. Louise claims that Hiraga doesn't understand her. They have different views on the war. Hiraga makes his way back to town. While he is walking through the city, he runs into Siesta. He is surprised to see her in Albion. Siesta reveals that she came with her uncle. Just then, the uncle appears out of nowhere, and it is none other than Skarin. Skarin is surprised that Hiraga knows Siesta. He reveals that Siesta has been disturbing him concerning Hiraga. Meanwhile, Julio and Louise have made it to the enemy's capital. They are attacked by dragon riders, but Julio manages to evade them and head back home. Now in Goth, Hiraga is having a meal with Siesta and her relatives when Geech enters the room. He shows Hiraga his medal and boasts about it. He claims that the general gave him the medal as a reward for his accomplishments in the war. He considers this the greatest honor as an aristocrat. Louise returns to their room to find out that Hiraga is not at home. She and Del start talking about Hiraga. Del scolds her for not reciprocating the love Hiraga has been showing her. All she has been doing is whip him. Louise reveals that she appreciates Hiraga, but she finds it hard to tell him how she really feels. Del suggests that Louise tell Hiraga how much she loves him, but she is not ready to do that. Del even suggests that she propose to Hiraga, but she shuns the idea too. She is an aristocrat while Hiraga is a commoner, so it is quite impossible for her to woo Hiraga. Del then scolds her for not willing to get down to show Hiraga how much she loves him. Del suggests that Louise wear an attractive dress to get Hiraga's attention. Louise changes to an attractive dress and waits for Hiraga to come back home. Unfortunately, Hiraga returns home with Skarin and the rest of the group, leaving Louise embarrassed. They return to the tavern to continue the night. Siesta thinks of wearing an attractive dress to get Hiraga's attention too. She excuses herself and when she comes back, she looks all appealing with her big bang. Louise gets jealous and tries to strip Siesta. She ends up pulling off her top to reveal her big melons to Hiraga. Elsewhere, Sheffield has polluted the city's water supply with the Anvari ring. She wants the soldiers to turn against each other. Back in the tavern, Hiraga argues with Giche about honor. He tells the group that it is not worth dying for a ruler. Louise gets angry and berates Hiraga. She says she is ready to die for Henrietta. The duo gets angry at each other and ends up going their separate ways. Siesta runs after Hiraga. She holds him and reveals her intentions. She wants them to stay together because she is feeling cold. Hiraga accepts and they go to a room together. Meanwhile, the soldiers have started acting weird. While they are together, Siesta tells Hiraga that she loves him. She draws him close and kisses him. Suddenly, a fight breaks out in the city. The soldiers turn against each other. An explosion hits the building where the princess is staying, which ends up killing the general. Siesta and Hiraga notice that there is a commotion outside. Siesta doesn't want him to go because she is not ready to lose him in someone's war. She gives Hiraga a sleeping potion. She tells him to add the potion to Louise's drink so she can sleep. The duo will have the opportunity to run away with this. Meanwhile, Louise is busy screaming through the city looking for Hiraga. Louise gets cornered by the soldiers, and she is about to be eliminated when Hiraga shows up and saves her. They find out that the enemy troops are also making their way into the city. Dragon Riders have stormed the city, and the city is in total chaos. By the following morning, Henrietta had successfully retreated to the port with her personal guards. The Cardinal is also with her. People are been taken away from dangers with ships. Henrietta has refused to leave till everyone has been taken away to safety. She plans to follow the last ship leaving the port. Now in the port city, Louise refuses to leave because she has been given a special mission by the Cardinal. He wants her to stay back and be the rear guard. It wasn't an order, but a request. The Cardinal is thinking about the princess's safety, and Louise doesn't hesitate before accepting the task. Hiraga is shocked when he hears this. He cannot believe that Louise is willing to sacrifice herself again. She is so particular about honor that she is ready to do anything to uphold her honor. Louise tells Hiraga to leave her. She doesn't want him to die for her own cause. With tears in the eyes, she says goodbye to Hiraga. Hiraga accepts to leave, but insists that they make a toast first. While he is trying to open the bottle, Louise sums up the courage to tell him that she wants to get married to him. She wants her marriage to Hiraga to be the last thing she does before dying. Hiraga accepts her proposal. They go to a shop to buy a special flower that is meant for lovers. After this, they make their way to a church to get married. Hiraga pours the drink for them and he spikes Louise's drink with the sleeping potion that Siesta gave him earlier. They drink together. The duo face the altar to say their vows. Hiraga tells Louise that he loves her but she finds it hard to say it back. The flowers they bought bloom together at the same time to signal their love for each other. Louise opens her mouth to say, I love you, but she passes out before she can say it. Hiraga carries her and leaves the church. He gets outside to see Julio waiting for them. He reveals that he came when he heard that Louise was staying back. 
Hiraga hands over Luis to Julio and reveals his plan to face the enemy army of 70,000 all by himself. Julio is surprised to see Hiraga offering himself up. This is the same thing he has been fighting against. Hiraga claims that he is doing so to protect her loved one. Julio leaves Louise and her own wedding flower. Later that night, Henrietta learns of the Cardinal's plan to sacrifice Louise, and she gets heartbroken. She wants to jump out of the ship to find her, but the Cardinal begs her. He reminds her that the nation will be left in chaos if she dies. Henrietta stays back with tears rolling down her eyes. Shortly afterward, Louise wakes up from the effect of the sleeping potion. She looks around to find herself on a ship. She faces Julio. Julio and asks her where Hiraga is. Julio sadly tells her that Hiraga has decided to wait behind and face the enemy troops all alone. Louise hears this and screams out in pain. She wants to jump off the ship, but she is held back by Scarin. Siesta also passes out when she learns that Hiraga is staying back to hold down the enemy. On the other hand, Hiraga is busy fighting the enemy troops. He is feeling exhausted already, but he is not ready to give up. He charges toward the enemy by himself. With one strike from his sword, he takes down plenty of enemies. He is faced by dragon riders, but he manages to cut them down too. He is caught in the middle of the enemies. With the amount of enemies he has defeated, it seems he has not even taken down a quarter of them. Hiraga is finally pinned down by the enemies with a barrage of arrows fired at him. His body gets pierced and he falls to the ground. Back on the ship, Louise notices that her wedding flower is losing its glow. Julio tells her that the glow signals the current state of her partner's health. The glow dies off, and the flower dies signaling the death of her partner. Henrietta and everyone else make it to Tristane thanks to Hiraga. Henrietta blames herself for Louise's pain. Louise has also refused to leave her room. She is suffering from a severe heartbreak. Elion tries to cheer her up. She stands up to Elion for the first time. She tells Elion that Hiraga is very special to her. She chases Elion out of her room. After Elion is gone, Louise sits down on the floor and thinks about what Elion said. Elion had previously blamed Louise for Hiraga's death. She says Hiraga would still be alive if she had not joined the war. With tears flowing down her eyes, the flower she is holding starts to glow again. She runs out of her room to the entrance of the academy. She looks up and sees Hiraga standing in the distance. The duo run toward each other and jump into each other's arms. Hiraga reveals that he was saved by a fairy who took care of him and his injuries. Louise ends up using the explosion spell on Hiraga as usual. She chases him around the academy to let everyone know that Hiraga is back and alive. Hirag runs into Siesta. He stands still to look at her melons. Louise shows up behind with the intent of unaliving him. After months of war, ranging from the first season, Albion finally surrenders when Galleon troops get involved. The love between Louise and Hiraga is also growing stronger. She acknowledges the sacrifice he made during the war. The two are having fun on the bed when Siesta barges into the room to wake them. Hiraga jumps off like there is nothing going on. He stammers as he talks to Siesta. Just then, Louise notices the rune on Hiraga's hand fading off. The rune fades off completely, and this comes as a total shock to them. The students are called out by the principal to observe a minute of silence for those who died during the war. This is to honor their sacrifices. Louise is completely lost because she keeps thinking of what happened to Hiraga's rune. Does this mean he is no longer Louise's familiar? This is the type of question going through her mind. Kirchi notices that something is off with her. Hiraga is also worried about the disappearance of the rune, but Delfinger cheers him up. He teases him about no longer having to answer to Louise. Louise tells Kirchi about the the rune and Kirchi is shocked. She speaks out loudly, causing everyone to hear. While they are in the middle of this, Agnes shows up bringing news from the Queen. The Queen has called for Hiraga and Louise. On their way to the palace, Louise is completely moody. She starts to give Hiraga an attitude, like it is his fault that the rune disappeared. She is having doubts that Hiraga will leave him since he is no longer her familiar. The carriage stops so they can take a break. Louise angrily walks into the woods and she screams at Hiraga not to follow her. As she walks through the woods, she starts to wonder why she's so worked up on a familiar. She is in total denial, and she believes that she can just summon another. While she is sitting down thinking of her decisions, a doll wearing armor and holding a sword shows up in front of her. Just then, Sheffield shows up behind her. Sheffield reveals her intentions. She is there to fetch Louise for her master. She has Louise surrounded by multiple goblins. Louise then creates a big explosion, hoping that Hiraga will notice it. She made the right decision because Hiraga clearly saw it and he immediately realizes that Louise is in danger. Sheffield tells Louise that she is not the only Void Mage. Sheffield's master is also a Void Mage, and Sheffield is a familiar just like Hiraga. One of the goblins is about to hurt Louise when Hiraga shows up and blocks the attack. He tells Louise to start chanting the Void Magic while he gives her some time. He might no longer have the power of Gandalfer, but he won't stop protecting Louise. Delfinger assists him in telling him when to duck and cut down his enemies. 
Agnes also arrives to provide assistance. Sheffield hears her master's voice telling her to retreat for now. She calls her master by his name, Joseph, before she finally makes her exit. Louise completes the chant and destroys the remaining goblins with the powerful void magic. Louise thanks Hiraga for saving her. They finally arrive at the palace. Henrietta thanks Louise for all she did during the war. She also apologizes for almost losing her. The queen turns to Hiraga and gives him a letter. The letter is to ordain Hiraga as a knight. Hiraga is confused by this. Louise tells him that he will finally be an aristocrat. Hiraga returns the letter and says he is not sure if he wants it. Moreover, he has lost the power of Gandalfer. Delfinger has some idea why the rune disappeared. His heart stopped while he was fighting the army of 70,000. His death then nullified the familiar contract he had with Louise. He was brought back to life by a fairy named Tifania. She had a ring with her, and that is what she used in resurrecting Hiraga. Delfinger tells them that Tifania is living in the village of Westwood in Albion. The queen wants them to find this fairy because she needs to know if resurrection really exists. During the night, Louise wakes up and she can't see Hiraga beside her. The thought of Hiraga leaving her crossed her mind and she got scared. She runs outside to Hiraga standing on the balcony. She looks all teary and moody. Hiraga gets close to her and can see that she is crying. She tells Hiraga that she thought he had left. Hiraga assures her that he will never leave her side. He also wonders if there is a way that they can bind the contract again. Louise is scared to perform the summoning ceremony again because she might end up summoning another familiar. Hiraga tries to drag Louise to the bed to lay with her, but she uses her explosion spell to knock some sense into him. The following morning, she continues with his punishment by making him walk behind the carriage. As the journey continues, the carriage runs into Siesta, who is waiting for them. She reveals that she heard from someone that Hiraga is going away, and that is the reason she has come to meet them. She goes close to Hiraga, who is already exhausted from running behind the carriage. Louise asks why they should allow her to follow them. Siesta tells them that she is carrying cooking materials with her. Siesta is ready to cook for them on their journey. Louise has no choice but to accept. She sits down beside Hiraga inside the carriage. This is making Louise extremely jealous. She talks about this, and Siesta reminds her that Hiraga is no longer her familiar, which means he now belongs to anyone. It is up to him to decide who he wants to stay with, or even sit down with. Louise is not ready to accept this fact, and she uses her whip to beat Hiraga up as usual. Hiraga has no choice but to sit down with Louise to avoid further punishment. Siesta opts to put her head on his lap instead. Siesta wants to know where they are headed, and Loyu says it is a secret. Hiraga ends up telling her that they are going in search of a fairy. That night, they stop to camp and rest. Siesta makes food for the group and serves Hiraga especially. Delfinger reveals that Louise is scared to perform the summoning ceremony again because she is scared that it won't work. However, she is very desperate to make Hiraga her familiar again. Agnes cuts out a wooden sword and gives it to Hiraga. She wants to train him so he can be strong enough to protect Louise. Hiraga impresses Agnes during the first training session. She wants them to continue the next day because she can see that Louise is worried about him. The following day, the group makes it to the outskirts of Westwood Village. Hiraga looks around to see if the scenery looks familiar. Just then, he spots Tiffania in the nearby bush. Tiffania initially runs away, but she stops when Hiraga introduces himself to her. She jumps into Hiraga's arms when she sees him. Siesta and Louise are already worried again because Tiffania looks even more appealing than them. They enter Tiffania's hut. Louise starts to scream at Hiraga. She accuses him of engaging in adult activities with Tiffania, but the duo denies it. She's very worried that the fairy of the forest. Tiffania is more attractive than she thought. Louise stops her from harassing Tiffania, and he reminds her that she was the one who saved his life. Louise runs out of the hut and tells Hiraga to enjoy himself with the one who saved his life. Meanwhile, Sheffield is following them. Louise stops to think about what is happening. It dawns on her that Hiraga actually died to save her and it was Tiffania who brought him back. She realizes that she's supposed to be grateful to Tiffania and not angry at her. She counts herself as the worst person out there. Siesta arrives to tell her that the group is worried about her. The duo starts to return to the hut. On their way, the duo agrees for the first time on something. They plan to beat Tiffania up, so Hiraga will no longer be attracted to her. Suddenly, monsters appear from the woods and surround the duo. Louise wonders why there are monsters in the forest. Sheffield speaks out from the woods and tells them that she is responsible. She says there is another void mage in the area, and she wants to lure the mage out. Out. The monsters attack Louise, causing her to scream. Hiraga hears this from the hut, and he rushes out immediately to check out what is wrong. Sheffield starts to torture Louise and Siesta, asking them to give up the Void Mage. Louise has no idea who Sheffield is talking about. Louise cannot defend herself because her wand got knocked off of her hand when the monsters jumped her. Siesta spots the wand, and she manages to grab it. She throws it to Louise, who then creates an explosion spell to get rid of the monsters. Siesta is also affected by the explosion, and she falls to the ground. A new bunch of monsters surround the girls again. Louise is desperate and has no idea what to do. Meanwhile, 
Hiraga is running around the forest trying to find Louise. Louise makes a last-ditch attempt. She activates the summoning magic again with the hope that she will re-summon Hiraga. Sheffield is confident that she cannot be successful with the summoning. The portal opens, and Hiraga jumps out of it. Louise is very glad that Hiraga reappeared as her familiar. Sheffield is shocked to see this. She admits that Hiraga is quite special. She then decides to retreat for the second time. Louise hugs Hiraga and thanks him for saving her again. She asks Hiraga if he is ready to be his familiar again, and he says yes. Louise performs the contract ceremony and the rune appears on Hiraga's hand again. He screams out in pain as the rune reappears on his hand. As Sheffield flies away, she informs her master that Ganfalfer is back. She has been able to confirm that Hiraga is from a parallel world. The following morning, the team prepares to return to Tristane. Tifania looks gloomy because this is the first time she will be venturing far away from home. Agnes assures her that she will protect her. She gets into the carriage and the journey begins. Louise wonders if Tifania is the void mage Sheffield was talking about. Tifania reveals that she is the only one left inside the hut because her mother has passed away. The group is surprised when they hear this because the hut is located in the middle of the forest. Days later, the team arrives in Tristane. Tifania is stunned by the looks of the royal palace. The queen welcomes the team back. She is happy to see them back. She is more glad that Hiraga has regained his status as Gandalfer. She asks if Hiraga is ready to accept the status of the knight, but Hiraga doesn't give a definite answer. The queen welcomes Tifania and asks to see her face clearly. She is wearing a hat on her head. Tifania reluctantly takes off the hat to reveal that she is an elf. The whole room is shocked to see this. Tiffania says she was not trying to hide it, but she was shy. People are mostly disgusted by elves, and this is the reason she has resulted in covering her ears with a hat. The queen asks her if she is ready to share her story, and she says yes. She reveals that she is actually a half-elf. Her mother was an elf, and her father is the Archduke of Albion. The reason she has been living in hiding is because of her mother. The queen then assures Tiffania that she will never judge her for being an elf. She is ready to give Tiffania her support. Tiffania is glad to hear this and she thanks the queen. The group sits down for tea. The queen asks for the report of the journey. Agnes tells the queen everything that happened during the journey and how they were attacked by Sheffield. She tells the queen that it appears that Sheffield knows something that they don't because she was asking Louise for the whereabouts of the other void mage. After they are done talking about their experiences, the queen faces Hiraga and asks him if he is now ready to be a knight. And he says yes, with a smile on his face. Elsewhere, Sheffield is seen talking with her master. She apologizes for not being able to find the other wielder. Her master is not angry at her because he is well aware that she is doing her best. He says that he is aware that Tristane, Germania, and Gallia will try to absorb Albion. They need to make plans in preparation for this. Sheffield tells her master to summon her anytime he needs her. Back in Tristane, Tifania tells the group that she has no idea who the other void mage they are looking for is. She shows them a ring that her mother gave to her. She reveals that there was a stone inside the ring, but it dissolved when she saved Hiraga. The stone left the ring and went into Hiraga. This was how she was able to save him. They ask Hiraga if has any idea what happened after he went unconscious. Hiraga has no idea what happened and Delfinger jumps in to tell them. Delfinger reveals that he was the one who teleported Hiraga to Westwood, where Tiffania was able to find him. It dawns on the group that Tiffania has the ability to actually use magic. This triggers an old memory that Tiffania has, and she runs away. She has always run away from conflict. Delfinger tells Hiraga to leave her alone in the meantime because she needs alone time. Later that day, Hiraga finds Tifania sitting down alone and asks to sit with her. He apologizes for dragging her into his own mess. Tiffania replies that she has always wanted to explore the world, and this is a chance for her to do so. She has always wanted to meet new people too. The two get to have a heart-to-heart -heart discussion before Hiraga finally runs away when the thought of Lousy appearing behind him crosses his mind. The following day, the queen bestows upon Hiraga the title of Knight. Hiraga pledges his loyalty to the queen. Things take an ugly turn for Louise when she finds out that Siesta has been appointed as Hiraga servant. Siesta will now have to be around Hiraga all the time. Louise tries to question the queen on this decision, but the queen tells her that she did what she thought was the best. Siesta is the most appropriate person for Hiraga, she says. Since the ceremony is finished, the queen tells them that she has prepared a dragon to transport them to the academy. However, Tiffania will stay with her in the meantime. She reveals that Tiffania is her cousin after all. This comes as a shock to the rest of the group. It turns out that Tiffania's father is Henrietta's uncle. He is the Archduke of Albion and the governor of South Gotha. Hiraga still tries to convince Tifania to come with them, but he quickly readjusts when he sees Louise behind him. Louise finally sums up the courage to thank Tifania for saving Hiraga's life. Before 
Before they leave, Henrietta tells Hiraga that she has a surprise waiting for him at the academy. It is a secret, so she will not tell him about it. She greets Hiraga formally, and this makes him nervous. The queen tells Hiraga that she is greeting him formally for that day. The current day is an exception. The group soon arrives at the academy, and Hiraga is shocked to find out that the whole is waiting for him. The queen has insisted that they celebrate Hiraga for his elevation to a chevalier when he returns to the school. This is the surprise the queen was talking about. The queen has also appointed some other knights to take care of his needs. Guiche is their captain. They call themselves the Order of Undine Knights. Days later, Louise starts to complain that Hiraga no longer has time for her again. All he cares about is the training session he always has with Guiche and the rest of the knights. While he is in training, Tifa shows up. She has finally made the decision to attend the academy. However, it is still a secret that she is an elf. Louise now has someone else to compete with. The following morning, Hiraga stands up to leave, but Louise stops him. She tells Hiraga that she wants them to spend more time together like they did before. Hiraga says he has no choice but to be with the knights, and Lousy suggests that he come home early. Hiraga reluctantly accepts that he will come back home early so he can be with her. Tifa has now become popular among the boys. Some say she's popular because of her big melons, while some say she is popular because of her personality. The boys surrounded her and one even brought a hat for her. They want her to take off her usual hat and wear that one. Hiraga sees this, and he gets scared that the boys will find out that she is an elf if they take off her hat. Tifa manages to wriggle herself out of their middle to prevent them from touching her hat. Back in the room, Louise is busy practicing on ways to get Hiraga's attention. While she is doing so, Siesta opens the door on her as usual. This leaves her in total embarrassment again. Hiraga finds Tabitha in the library and asks if she is willing to join the Order of the Undine Knights, but she says no. Tabitha is also a knight, and this is the reason he was asking her. After he leaves the library, he looks to the front to see a group of girls bullying Tiffa. The daughter of the Grand Duchy of Gundenhorf, Princess Beatrice is among them. The girls want Tiffa to take off her hat. Hiraga rushes over to try and intervene and also protect Tiffa just like he has promised. Giche shows up at the right time to save Hiraga and Tiffa from the princess and her minions. Giche manages to give a dumb excuse for the princess that makes the princess leave Tiffa alone. However, she tells Tiffa that she will need to take off the hat the next time she sees her. She and her minions laugh hysterically as they leave the scene. Giche tells Hiraga that Beatrice's family is very wealthy, and they even deployed bodyguards for her while she was coming to school. Her family is known as the strongest dragon riders on the continent. Hiraga doesn't care about her status and which family she came from. She tells Tiffania to let him know if the girls try to bully her again. When Hiraga returns home that night, Louise is already waiting for him. However, the night takes a different turn when Hiraga talks about Tiffa. Louise goes to bed angry, believing that Hiraga has been with Tiffa all day long. She wants Hiraga to leave Tiffa alone to sort herself out. She came to the academy herself, after all. The following morning, Louise refuses to stand up and go to class. She is still feeling down from yesterday's anger. Tiffa decides that it is time to truly reveal who she is because she does not want to put Hiraga in trouble. She gets to class and stands in front of the whole class. She takes off her hoodie to reveal that she is an elf. The whole class runs into hiding at the sight of this. Tifa tells them that she is not their enemy and she just wants to be friends with them. Beatrice asks her which divine being she believes in, but she is not able to give an answer. Beatrice orders her knights to arrest Tiffania. The knights grab her and take her to the schoolyard. Hiraga is in the field when he sees this. Siesta also sees this from the window of the dorm room. Beatrice tells Louise that she is a bishop, and she has the right to perform an inquisition ceremony. She puts down a pot of hot water and asks Tifa to jump into it. She wants to know if she is serving the same divine being as them. Hiraga gets there and tries to intervene, but Geecha stops him. He tells him that he will be treated as a heretic and sent to prison if he intervenes in the ceremony. Hiraga says he doesn't care and still makes an effort. Giche informs him that he will not be the only one to suffer. An inquisition will also befall his loved one. Hiraga's mind immediately goes to Louise when he hears this. Hiraga gets on his knees and starts to beg Beatrice, but she still refuses. Hiraga says he has no choice and he draws his sword. Beatrice's bodyguards attack him when he does this. Geish and the rest of the knights cannot just abandon their brother who is in need of help, and this results in a standoff between the knights and Beatrice's bodyguards. Louise is inside her room having a romantic dream about Hiraga. She is awoken by the noise outside. She makes her way outside and uses an explosion spell to break the fight. Beatrice then accuses her of interfering in the inquiry. Louise shocks everyone when she reveals that Beatrice does not have the license to perform an inquiry. Her friends left her immediately when they heard this. Beatrice stands back looking all scared because of Tiffa. Tiffa goes close to her and touches her. She asks to be her friend and Beatrice accepts the offer with tears in her eyes. All the other girls too witness this and they decide to become Tiffania's friend. Later on, Geecha tells Louise all about what happened. 
He makes mention of how Hiraga got on his knees and started begging when he was informed that Louise would be subjected to an inquiry too. Louise has refused to visit Hiraga at the infirmary where he is receiving treatment before she decides to go after hearing this. She gets there to find Hiraga touching Tifa's big bangs. She ends up whipping him as usual. Upon getting to their room, Louise strips Hiraga of his clothes and keeps him on his knees. She gives him a memorandum to sign that he will stop touching big bangs. He's about to sign the deal but he throws away the sheet and says he is done. He takes his sword and leaves the room out of annoyance. He is angry that Louise won't trust him. Hiraga makes his way to Colbert's old lab. He sits down inside to think about things. Hiraga really misses Colbert because he is the only one who truly listens to him and even believes everything he says. He tried explaining to Lousy that Tifa asked him to touch her melons but she wouldn't believe him. He puts his head on the table and sleeps off. Upon waking up he finds out that the Order is receiving so many gifts from girls. Most of the girls also want to date boys that are in the Order. This is because the Knights stood up to Beatrice's bodyguards. All of the boys are with their girls while Hiraga is all alone. They make fun of him because it is quite obvious that he and Louise are currently fighting again. That night, Louise is waiting for Hiraga to come home but he is not showing up. He is in the kitchen. He is served by the chef but he doesn't have an appetite to eat and ends up giving the food to Silphid. Geech and the rest of the knights are well aware that Hiraga is currently depressed and they need to get him out of depression. One of the boys comes up with an idea. Louise leaves her room to have a bath. While she is doing so, Tifa arrives and joins her in the pool. Meanwhile, Geech and the boys have dug a tunnel that leads to the women's bath. Geech is familiar. Verdandi made this possible. They leave a tiny layer of wall and make a hole inside of it. They can use the hole to take a sneak peek at the girls. They call Hiraga over to check it out. He takes a sneak peek and he is surprised to see Louise and Tifa there. The boys start rushing to take a peek when they hear that Tifa is also in the bath. While they are looking at the girls, the thought of the boys seeing Louise's bare body crosses his mind. Meanwhile, Tifa tells Louise to touch her big bangs, and in exchange, she will touch hers. Tifa believes that her own melons are strange, and she wants to know what regular melons feel like. While they are doing this, Tifa reveals that she was the one who told Hiraga to touch her bangs. Louise realizes that she has been angry at Hiraga for nothing. She didn't believe him when he was actually telling him the truth. Just then, her towel drops to the ground. But Hiraga feels this, and he wrestles with the boys to get them from seeing Louise's bare body. In the process of this, the girls hear a man's voice causing them to look around properly. They see a hole in the wall, and they immediately figure out that someone is spying on them. The boys also realize this, and in the rush to get out of the tunnel, they knock Hiraga down. The boys rush out of the tunnel, but the girls are already waiting for them on the surface. They give the boys the appropriate way to deal with them. Even Mont is disappointed to see Geish among the culprits. After clearing out the boys, the girls believe that there is still someone inside the hole. They are about to fish out who is inside the hole when a strong wind appears and blocks their view. The wind transports Hiraga out of there, and he meets himself inside the dorm. He looks up to find out that Tabitha is his guardian angel. She saved him because he fed her familiar Silphid. This is her repaying her debt. Tabitha is bare and she passes out in her hands. He lays her somewhere close to him. He starts to think about his decisions. He realizes that he actually hurt Louise, even though he didn't mean to. He had no right to touch Tifa's big bangs. While he is there, Louise finds. She is very sure that he is part of those that were inside the tunnel. She asks him this and he gives the honest truth. He reveals that he was there, but he had no idea that they were going to the women's bathroom. They only told him that they wanted to go and see something nice, so he followed them. Surprisingly, Louise says she trusts him. She knows that Hiraga is not smart enough to lie. Hiraga thanks her for believing him and promises not to touch other women's melons again. Louise also apologizes for not believing him in the first place. He hugs her from behind and holds her tight. The following morning, Louise makes him sign the pledge not to touch other girls' melons again. Failure to abide by the pledge will result in punishment. She's going to deal with him using the explosion spell as usual. Up next, Scarin and Jessica give Siesta a love potion she can use on Hiraga. She is worried about the potion because it is illegal. However, Scarin assures her that she has nothing to fear because the effect only lasts for a day. She would have gotten all she wanted from Hiraga by then. Siesta collects the potion and returns to the academy. While she is spreading the bed sheets, she is busy thinking about the things she wants to do with Hiraga after she has given him the potion. However, she has some doubts about using the potion. She does not want to take the illegal way to win Hiraga's heart. At the same time, she wants to enjoy some time alone with Hiraga. Seconds later, Louise comes into the room dragging Hiraga on the floor. Siesta complains about how she treats Hiraga but she shuns her and tells her not to interfere in their relationship. Siesta argues with her, claiming that she can. She is Hiraga's personal maid after all. Louise decides to hand over Hiraga to Siesta for just 
an hour. Siesta wanted a day at least, but Louise could only give her an hour. She wants to see how Siesta will treat Hiraga in that time frame. Siesta takes Hiraga to a room in the inn. The duo sits down to talk, but Siesta is already shaking. She cannot wait to get going with Hiraga. Hiraga senses this too, and he is already feeling high. Siesta has the potion with him, but she is reluctant to use it. While she is still debating, Scarin comes over to check on her. She tells her uncle to leave for now and let her handle things. The duo pretends to pretend like they are newlyweds. Siesta wants them to do the things that newlyweds do. Meanwhile, Louise is pacing in her room, wondering what Hiraga and Siesta might be up to. The thought of them lying together crosses her mind and she runs outside. The Order of the Undine Knights is also busy working on the field as punishment for peeping at the girls. Siesta leaves the room to talk to her uncle and Jessica. The duo asks her if she is ready to take her chances or not, and she says yes. Jessica reminds her that her time is ticking and she needs to get going. She takes off her clothes so she can be more appealing to Hiraga. She returns to the room wearing revealing clothes. Hiraga is blown away, but he is also reluctant to touch Siesta. He keeps thinking of Louise. He excuses himself to the restroom to have a thought about it. He does not want to, but at the same time, he might not get the same opportunity again. While he is gone, Siesta thinks about using the love potion to make things easier for her. Hiraga returns to the room, causing Siesta to accidentally drop the love potion. Mont picks it up and inhales it. She runs into Louise, whom she starts to make advances toward. She pushes Louise to the floor and kisses her. Louise inhales the potion too and starts acting weird. They run into Jessica and start to make advances toward her too. Jessica realizes that the love potion is starting to cause a mess. The duo even tries to approach Tabitha, but she throws the two off with an air magic. Now in the room, Hiraga and Siesta are busy eating. Hiraga hears the commotion outside, but Siesta tells him not to worry about it. Hiraga doesn't listen to her and he rushes out of the room to check everything out. Apparently, the love effect spreads through kisses. Most of the girls are already affected by this and they are chasing Tiffania around the school. The girls even get Scarin affected in the mess. Hiraga finds Scarin and tries to ask him what is going on, but Scarin grabs him and tries to kiss him. Hiraga kicks him in the crotch to free himself. Tiffania finds Hiraga and she complains to him that the girls are after her. They all want to hug her and touch her big bangs. The girls soon have them surrounded again. Tiffania says she has no choice but to use her magic. She starts to chant a magic spell that creates a wave surrounding the girls. After she is done with the spell, the potion wears off of the girls and they start to wonder what they are doing. Siesta comes out to apologize to them. She says she is the cause of what happened. She shows them the case containing the love potion. The girls decide to forgive her because there was no harm done. Hiraga wonders what sort of magic Tifa used in taking off the magic potion. Later that night, Tifa tells the team that the only magic she can use is the magic of oblivion. This magic erases memories. She doesn't know if it is a magic of nature or not. Meanwhile, Tabitha receives a letter and she leaves the academy on her familiar. As she flies out, she is approached by Sheffield. It turns out that Tabitha knows Sheffield. Sheffield tells her that she is looking for a dragon which only four exist in the world. Sheffield tells Tabitha to succeed in her mission and she might finally regain the heart of her mother. In the next scene, Louise and Siesta resume their usual rivalry fight. Louise doesn't want Siesta to touch Hiraga, while Siesta claims that she is Hiraga's maid and she has the right to touch him. Siesta decides to challenge Louise to a battle. She wants them to have a battle on who Hiraga will choose between the two of them. Siesta then suggests that they have their battle during the slight near ball which is taking place the next day. Whoever Hiraga is able to identify between the two of them will get to be with Hiraga. Louise has no choice but to accept the challenge. Hiraga starts to wonder what the Sleipnir Ball is. The following morning, Geish informs Hiraga that the Sleipnir Ball is held at the beginning of the new semester. The event is taking place tonight, and all the students are to participate in the ceremony. While they are talking about this, two guys walk past and make mention of a giant monster bird that was spotted in the sky. Hiraga failed to hear that the Mirror of Truth is made use of during the ceremony. It allows you to take the form of who you wish to become. Hiraga approaches the students talking about the giant monster bird to ask them for more details. The two students inform him that a dragon knight spotted the bird in the sky, but before he could call for backup, the bird disappeared. It immediately dawns on Hiraga that Sheffield is the only person she knows who rides a giant bird. He wonders why Sheffield is around the academy. She must have something going on, he figures. Hiraga decides to warn Louise about this. Hiraga returns to the dorm to find Siesta lying on the floor looking all appealing. She wants to seduce Hiraga and get him to lie with her as usual. In the process of this, Louise enters the room and catches them red-handed. She gets angry, but she tells Hiraga that she would allow him to get down with her if he manages to find her during the ball. Siesta feels cheated because Louise just gave Hiraga an incentive. That night, Louise is the first to enter the mirror chambers and use the mirror. She uses the mirror, and it changes her appearance to her sister, 
Katleya's appearance. Later that night, Hiraga rushes over to the hall because he is already late. Before entering the hall, he sees the giant bird fly over the academy. Before he enters the hall, the rest of the students have made use of the mirror, and they have changed their appearance to the one they adore. Even the principal turned into a cute girl. Some groups of girls all changed into Tiffania because of her big bang. Louise runs into someone who looks like Hiraga, and it turns out to be Tiffania. She reveals that she has always wanted to be like Hiraga. Basically, Hiraga is her role model. Louise realizes that there are lots of changes in the hall, but she hopes that Hiraga is able to find her. Moments later, Hiraga enters the room and wonders why there is a costume ball, and none of them is wearing a costume. He is very confident that he will easily find Louise. He looks to the balcony and sees Louise standing there. He approaches her, and jokingly says, the challenge is easy. Unknown to him, the person he is talking to is not Louise. The person knows that Hiraga doesn't know that she is not Louise, and she takes advantage of the moment. She draws Hiraga close and kisses him. Meanwhile, Sheffield has infiltrated the hall, and she has used her magic to put the teachers to sleep. The magic she used also caused the mirror's magic to wear off. Hiraga is shocked to find out that the person he is kissing is Henrietta. Henrietta then explains to him that they all use disguise magic to change their appearance to who they wanted to be like. Henrietta reveals that she likes Louise, and she envies her courage. She likes how pure Louise's heart is. Henrietta draws Hiraga closer and kisses him again. Just then, the sound of glass breaking alerts the two. They look to their side to see Louise looking at them. Louise is completely heartbroken and tears are freely running down her eyes. She runs away, but Hiraga chases after her. Hiraga catches up to her and tries to explain himself, but Louise pushes him. She calls him a big traitor and runs off. Hiraga runs after her but sees no traces of her. He looks to his side to see Tabitha looking at him. He is about to ask Tabitha where Louise is when she attacks him. Louise is crying in the woods when she is approached by Sheffield. She tells Louise to come with her because the only person who can understand her is a void mage like herself. Sheffield uses her bell magic on Louise to make her words get to her. Tabitha continues to attack Hiraga. Seconds later, Sheffield appears with Louise. She reveals that Tabitha is their loyal watchdog. Tabitha creates a powerful attack that will surely eliminate Hiraga, but Hiraga cuts through the attack and pins her down. He could have killed her, but he managed to refrain. Tabitha is shocked that Hiraga didn't end her. Hiraga reveals that Tabitha has saved them countless times, so there is no way he can terminate her. Tabitha stands up and leaves the scene. Hiraga manages to get through to Louise and he tells her to jump off the back of the bird, but she refuses. She starts to jump around on the bird and Sheffield accidentally pushes her off. However, Hiraga is able to catch her. Hiraga holds her close and kisses her. He explains things to her and she finally believes him. Delfinger informs the duo that they are now surrounded by enemies. Suddenly, an explosion attack eliminates all the monsters, but Sheffield manages to escape. Hiraga and Louise look up to find out that their savior is none other than Colbert. The giant airship that Colbert arrived on is called the Ostlin. The ship was made by Colbert, but it was funded by Kirchi. The duo were flying around doing a test flight when they realized that there was a fight going on in the school. Kirchi then explains how Colbert is still alive. She reveals that Tabitha cast a spell on Colbert that made him appear dead. Tabitha told Kirchi about this and she was able to remove him from the coffin before he was buried. He has been staying at Kirch's house in Germania since then. She intentionally kept it a secret. Louise and Hiraga are happy to find out that Colbert is still alive. Delfinger asks Hiraga if he will not tell his friends about the fight he had with Tabitha the night before. He wants to but he needs to know what is going on first. Louise sees him looking all worried and she decides to talk to him about it. She asks him about last night and the princess. She wants to know the full details of last night's event. Hiraga quickly uses the events of the nights as an excuse to run away from Louise. After Hiraga's departure, Siesta approaches Louise to ask her if Hiraga was able to find her at the ball, but Louise gives a stunned expression, leaving Siesta to believe that Hiraga was not able to find her. This simply means that she lost the challenge. Henrietta calls the knights together and Colbert is also there. She thanks Colbert for saving the day. Colbert then tells her that Hiraga helped out too. When it is time for the queen to thank Hiraga, Siesta and Louise are able to deduce that there is a weird connection between them. The atmosphere between the two looks totally awkward. Louise drags Siesta to a room to tell her that she saw the Queen and Hiraga together the night before. The two realize that they have no chance with Hiraga once the Queen enters the frame. While they're having this discussion, Tifa enters the room too. Later on, Colbert finds Hiraga and he tells him that he named the airship after the direction of his world. There are many things he would like to show Hiraga, so he wants him to come with him. Elsewhere, Henrietta is thinking of her encounter with Hiraga. She is informed that her return carriage is ready, but she tells her maid that she doesn't want to leave yet. She wants to stay a little while longer. Louise informs Tiffania about what happened between Henrietta and Hiraga. She wants to know the full details of the events, but Hiraga is not ready to tell her. Tiffania brings out a magnifying mirror known as the Last Night Orb. This gives the user the ability to look at a person's last night events with it. Louise collects the mirror and makes plans on how to use it. Colbert 
Robert explains to Hiraga how he was able to build the airship. He explains that he used the knowledge he had of the jet fighter to build the airship. It has big propellers that allow long-range flying, it runs on coal, and Colbert calls the engine a water vapor engine. They are in the middle of this when Hiraga notices that Louise is pointing a weird glass at him. He remains confused because he has no idea what it is. Just then, Delfinger warns him and tells him to run away. Without second thoughts, Hiraga listens to Delfinger, and he starts running away. Louise, Siesta, and Tiffania run after him. He makes it to a T-junction inside the ship and enters one of the rooms. The girls arrive at the T-junction and decide to split up to find him. Hiraga realizes that the room he has entered is the engine room. He is admiring the design when Tiffania enters the room. Hiraga is trying to negotiate his way out when the other two girls burst into the room. Hiraga manages to evade them again, and he runs to the captain's cabin where he sees Kirchi and Colbert lying on each other. Colbert tries to tell him that it is not what it looks like. This little delay causes Louise to catch up to him. She pins him down and uses the mirror on him. The mirror then shows Hiraga when he is fighting with Tabitha. This comes as a shock to everyone watching. This is what Hiraga has been trying to prevent. Since the secret is now out, Hiraga has no choice but to tell them what happened. She reveals that Sheffield was the one ordering Tabitha around. She wanted her to grab Louise for Gallia. Kirchi has some idea of what Hiraga is saying. She reveals that Tabitha is a member of the royal family. The current king of Gallia is her father's elder brother, and he is responsible for Tabitha's father's death. After his death, they tried to eliminate Tabitha, but her mother drank the water meant for her. Her mother has been mentally ill since then. They have also tried to eliminate her by sending her on impossible missions which Tabitha has survived every time. Hiraga is very sure that it is Gallia who is ordering Tabitha around. Meanwhile, Tabitha has gone to her family's estate. She enters the house to find out that it is totally empty. She enters her mother's room to find out that she is not there. She is suddenly attacked by an elf who introduces himself as Vitarshal. He wants Tabitha to come with him. Tabitha tries to fight him but he easily knocks her down. Sylphid also bursts into the room, but Vitar easily takes her out too. Back at the academy, Henrietta assures Hiraga that she will gather evidence concerning the case. If she finds out that Gallia is truly involved, she is ready to use the nation's forces to bring them to the book. She tells Hiraga not to do anything rash. After this, Henrietta leaves the academy. In the next scene, Hiraga and the rest of his friends are outside trying to gather evidence on the school field when a girl without clothes appears to them. They are shocked to see the girl who introduces herself as a Lokaku. She identifies as Tabitha's younger sister. The whole group is thrown into total awe when they hear this. The group goes into a shed to hear the whole gist from her. She tells them that Tabitha has been stripped of her status as a chevalier and branded a traitor. Her mother has also been arrested. Tabitha went to save her mother, but she lost to a mage. The group is shocked by this because they know how strong Tabitha is. For her to have lost to a mage, it means the mage is a square mage, no doubt. Hiraga cannot wait to help Tabitha, but some of the group members start to doubt Iloko's credibility. They do not believe that she's actually Tabitha's sister or that she is a spy from Gallia. They need proof from her. Iloko runs outside to find proof. The team ran after her, but they couldn't find her. Just then, Sylphid appears to them and she answers all their questions. She confirms that Iloko is Tabitha's sister. It appears that Sylphid was able to escape from Vitart. Hiraga assures Sylphid that he and the knights will find a way to rescue her master. Reinhard reminds the knights that they are the private unit of the queen, and they need her permission before embarking on such a mission. There are doubts among them that Henrietta will not give them permission to leave. Now in Gallia, Vitart tells the King Joseph that he has fulfilled the mission he gave to him, and now now it is time for him to honor his own side of the deal. Vitart tells Joseph that the Gate of Shaitarn, which the elves do guard, has seemed quite busy. This gate is considered the gate to all evil. It brought about a calamity 6,000 years ago. There is a prophecy that when four devils come, the true devil will awaken. If the true devil awakens, it will bring back the calamity. The power of the devils is what they know as void magic. Vitart wants Joseph to stop anyone from approaching the gate of Shaitarn. Joseph then tells Vitart that he will continue to serve him as long as he lives. This is the only reason he can accept the deal. Vitart doesn't like the deal, but he has no choice but to accept. After after Vitart's departure, Joseph reveals his plan to use the same drug affecting Tabitha's mother on her too. Back in Tristane, Hiraga and the other knights approach the queen to ask for permission to go to Gallia and save Tabitha, but she refuses. She says Tabitha has been arrested as a traitor, and the knights interfering in that will be considered an act of aggression. This will definitely lead to war. This is the reason she cannot sanction the operation. Hiraga then takes off his knighthood. The rest of the team joins him too. They tell Henrietta that they will enter Gallia as regular citizens to rescue Tabitha, but Henrietta refuses. She immediately calls for their arrest. 
Silphid is in the distance, and she can see that Hiraga, Giche, and Malicorn have been arrested. She goes back to the group to inform them of this. Kirchi learns of this from the group. While the trio is in prison, Hiraga is very confident that Louise is currently trying to convince the queen to let them go. Henrietta tells Louise that she is not ready to let them go, because she is scared that they will be in danger. Louise then asks Henrietta what she thinks of Hiraga as a man. It is quite obvious that she likes him, but Henrietta doesn't want to accept. Louise then tells Henrietta that Hiraga is her familiar, and she will not appreciate Henrietta touching him. Henrietta appreciates this, and asks Louise to help him convince Hiraga not to go to Galia. Louise refuses and reminds the queen that Tabitha has saved them many times, and it is their time to save her. Louise also strips herself of her aristocratic title so she can become a regular citizen. The queen is not ready to accept her decision, and she has her arrested too. She is taken away and led to the cell where Hiraga and the other two are languishing. She tells the boys that she failed to convince the queen, and because of that, she has not become a regular citizen. Hiraga is impressed that Louise gave up her title just to save Tabitha. Geech is panicking that things are not going the way he expected. Tabitha wakes up on a bed with Vitart looking over her. He tells her not to try and escape because there is no chance of that. He informs her that her familiar, the nature dragon, managed to escape from his grasp. He takes Tabitha to the room where her mother is. He then explains to her that the mind-crippling drug is currently being made for her too. She is going to take the magical solution after it has been prepared. He gives her a book to pass away time before the drug is ready. The knights are still wallowing in their cells when they see Oslin fly past them in the distance. This is enough to provide distraction which allows Kirky and Culver to sneak into the cell and burst them out. They make it to the field and wonder how the team knows that they have been captured. Iloko tells them that she is the one who relayed the information. Delfinger then tells Iloko to reveal who she truly is to the group. She chants a transformation spell and transforms into Silphid. She is a nature dragon after all. They are surprised by this because they believe that all the nature dragons have died out. Nature dragons are quite intelligent knowledgeable in languages, and able to control nature magic. Malicorn is heartbroken because the first girl he has fallen in love with turns out to be a legendary nature dragon. After the group's escape from prison, Agnes apologizes to the queen for her blunder, but Henrietta is not holding it against her. She just wants Agnes to catch them, but she doesn't want them harmed. Agnes informs her that the Ostland has been seized, and it has no way of leaving without their permission. The team manages to evade all the soldiers crawling the streets, and they make it to Scarin's Inn. Jessica is surprised that the group gave up their titles just to save their friends. She is impressed by their courage, but she also sees them as idiots. Colbert informs them of his plan. He will find a way to hijack the Ostland somehow, and fly toward Germania so the military can follow him. This will give the rest of the team easy access to Gallia. The rest of the team will walk into Gallia on foot while Colbert is keeping the military distracted. Oslin tells the team that guards will be stationed around the Ostland, but he will find a way to take control of the ship. Gimli and Reinhardt offer to follow Colbert to take back Osteland. Siesta also promises to to follow Hiraga because she cannot abandon her master. Louise doesn't want her to follow them, but Siesta barks at her and reminds her that she is no longer an aristocrat, so she has no right to boss her around. Hiraga is able to stop the argument from going further. To help with the plan, Jessica and Scarin go to their wardrobe to source costumes that will be useful for them. They can easily use this as disguises to get through into Gallia. Hiraga faces Colbert and asks him why he is helping them out. He reminds Hiraga that Tabitha is his student. In addition to that, it was Tabitha who put the spell on him to make him appear dead. Colbert says he has an obligation to help out. Shortly afterward, the team is done changing into the costumes provided for them. After they are done and ready to go, Siesta takes a step back and tells Hiraga that she doesn't have the courage to follow them on the trip. She admits to being weak and scared. She is not ready to become a burden to the team. Hiraga accepts her offer and says he quite understands where she is coming from. Siesta hugs Hiraga to make sure that her melons are touching him. Louise kicks Hiraga in the crotch to knock some sense into him as usual. After this, the group separates into their respective teams. Those with Oslin follow him while those with Hiraga begin their journey. Now in Gallia, Joseph visits the lab where Sheffield is preparing the drug. He asks for the progress of the drug, and Sheffield tells him that it is still in progress. Sheffield takes Joseph to a secret room where he shows him a being Joseph calls Jormungand. Back in Tristain, Haraga and his team make it to the border to find out that there is a checkpoint there. Soldiers have been placed everywhere to prevent the team from leaving the country. However, the team manages to walk through without any problem thanks to the costumes they are putting on. As the journey continues, Louise is worried about Hiraga because she now knows 
knows how it feels to be a commoner. Now at the ship site, Siesta strips to distract the guards. Colbert and his team are about to board the ship when a new batch of soldiers arrive. Gimli and Reinhard use their magic to knock out the soldiers. Colbert tells Siesta to follow him to the bridge, while Reinhard and Gimli are to head to the engine room. Ex Colbert starts the engine, but the chains used in tying the ship prevent it from moving further. Colbert tells Reinhard and Gimli to add more coal so that the ship can get more power. They do this, and the ship manages to gain enough throttle to break the chains and fly out of there. Colbert now expects the military to chase them down so the other team can have a free pass into Gallia. Agnes realizes that the ship has been stolen, and she orders her troops to go after them. She believes that they want to cross into Germania, and then head to Gallia from there. Now in Gallia, it appears that Sheffield has been spying on the team, and she is aware that they are currently on their way to rescue Tabitha. Joseph tells her not to do anything about it because he wants to see how Vitart will handle the situation. He expects the battle to be intense and entertaining. Meanwhile, Tabitha has finally read the book and she now believes that she is being punished for betraying her friends. The Dragon Riders continue their pursuit of the ship, but Colbert doesn't want to shoot back because he doesn't want to injure the troops. On the other hand, Louise trips and sprains his ankle. Hiraga then carries her on his back. Louise wonders how Hiraga has been coping alone in their world when he has no one for him. He has been so courageous even though he is alone. Shortly afterward, Colbert and his team finally give up the ship. They are grounded by the troops. The troops are shocked to find out that they have been betrayed. Colbert appears behind his students and Agnes is stunned. This is the first time she will see him since he came back. She charges toward Colbert with her sword, but she manages to control herself from terminating him. She decides to take Colbert and the other three back to the Queen. Hiraga and his team have successfully made it to Gallia. They are now one step away from saving their friend. After they have made their way into Gallia, Kirchi uses her woman charms to interrogate one of the soldiers to find out where Tabitha is being held. The soldier Soldier reveals that Tabitha is being held at Alhambra Castle. The castle is located on the east side of the kingdom. Malicorn uses his telegnosis spell to get information about the castle. He is able to find out that there are over a hundred soldiers surrounding the castle. To safely rescue Tabitha and her mother, Kirchi comes up with a plan. She plans to make many sleeping potions to make the soldiers sleep off and give them access to the castle easily. To get the soldiers to drink the potions, Kirchi has a secret weapon in store. The weapon she is talking about is the ladies. Tiffania, Silphid, Mont, and Kirchi herself are to dress in appealing clothes to get the attention of the soldiers. This will give them the chance to spike the soldiers' drinks. Kirchi dishes out orders for the team but doesn't tell Louise and Hiraga what to do. After the rest of the team is gone, Louise challenges Kirchi for not giving her anything to do. She believes that Kirchi is ignoring her on purpose. Louise laments that she wants to be useful for the team. Kirchi then tells her that she is ignoring her. However, she is trying to make sure that Louise conserves her strength. They do not know what they're going up against and they might need to fall back to her void magic. This is the reason she wants Louise to rest very well. Hiraga is to stay with her too. After Kirch's departure, Delfinger suggests that Hiraga talks to Louise. He reminds him that the void magic has to do with Louise's mental strength. She needs to be fully okay and good for her to wield the magic. Hiraga enters the room to see Louise dressed up in an appealing costume. She reveals that she has made the decision to join Kircha and the others in seducing the soldiers. Hiraga pushes her to the bed and suggests that they get laid because they don't know what will happen to them during battle. Louise doesn't argue with him, and they are about to get going when Guiche enters the room and spoils all the fun. Back in Tristane, Agnes releases Colbert from prison. She tells him that the reason she will not be terminating him is that she wants to end the chain of violence that has been in existence. Killing Colbert will only make his students hate her, and she doesn't want that. She tells Colbert that the Queen is waiting for him. Now in Gallia, Kirky approaches the Baron in charge of the soldiers and tells him that they have a dance and drink event that they want to organize for his men. The Baron accepts the offer and has his men gather in the middle of the castle. The girls climb the stage to entertain the men. They are blown away by the beauty of the melons shaking in front of them. While this is going on, Vitart finds Tabitha and tells her that there is a circus group in town. He can give her permission to go to the show and enjoy herself for the night. This is her last night to stay sane after all. Tabitha refuses the offer and says she doesn't need Vitart's pity. Later that night, Louise finds out that the Baron is asking for her in particular. Kirchi and the rest of the girls are worried about her, but she assures them that she will be fine. She is given a sleeping potion to put in the Baron's drink in case things are about to go sideways. She makes her way to the Baron's room. The Baron is already going crazy upon seeing Louise. He reveals that he is a lover of flat chests. Flat chests are what he dies for in a woman, and Louise is the perfect fit for him. Things start to go sideways when Louise realizes that the potion given 
happened to her has fallen off when she was coming to the room. She no longer has a way to get rid of the Baron. The Baron now has the opportunity to force himself on her. Elsewhere, Silphid is carried off the stage because she is feeling tired. Delfinger reveals that she is feeling tired because nature dragons are not meant to stay in human form for too long. Hiraga sees the sleeping potion on the floor and Tefania immediately realizes that Louise is in trouble. The duo rushes over to the room to find the Baron trying to force her. The Baron holds her hostage, but Tefania uses a wind spell to keep the Baron unconscious for some seconds. This gives Louise the opportunity to free herself from his hold. The Baron regains consciousness, but Louise knocks him out completely with a kick to the face. Hiraga tells Louise to be more careful. Meanwhile, Tabitha has finished reading the novel Vitart gave to her, and she has given up hope that someone is coming to save her. After the team has finally knocked out all of the soldiers, they are now free to make their way to the castle. Just then, Vitart appears to stop them. Kirchi attacks him, but he easily cuts off the attacks and replies with a more powerful one. Silphid recognizes him as the one who kidnapped Tabitha. The whole team tries to gang up on Vitart, but he appears to be invincible. Hiraga tries to cut him, but his attack is repelled by a barrier. Delfinger tells him that the spell is known as Counter, and it repels all attacks, both magic and physical. The only way to get rid of it is for Louise to use Dispel Magic. Louise starts to chant the spell while Hiraga protects her. Once she is done with the chanting, Hiraga tells her to cast the spell on him. With this, Hiraga goes after Vitart and cuts through the barrier wall to get to him. He is about to end him, but Tiffany stops him. She tells him that her mother once told her that all elves have their reasons for conflict. She believes that Vitart has a reason for what he is doing. She tells Hiraga to leave Vitart alone because they are there to save Tabitha and not to eliminate anyone. Louise passes out from exhaustion. Vitart then tells Hiraga that Tabitha is being kept at the North Tower. He warns the group of Joseph. He says Joseph is a heartless and cold person. Tabitha is still crying beside her mother's bed when the team enters the room to tell her that she is saved. Meanwhile, Sheffield has found out about the rescue and she has informed Joseph. Joseph doesn't care about that because he has a master plan that he is about to execute. After the team has escaped, they make a pit stop in the forest to rest. Louise wakes up to find out that she has lost her ability to magic. She now feels totally empty without a shred of magic left in her. She goes deeper into the woods to try and get her magic back, but she is not getting a positive response. Meanwhile, Tabitha is teaching Haraga how to read. She is using the book of the hero to teach him. The name of the hero is Ivaldi and the person he saved is Lou. Tabitha sees herself as Lou while Hiraga is Ivaldi. She appreciates Hiraga for saving her life. Just then, Louise shows up to tell the duo that she no longer has an affinity for magic. Even the simplest of spells she cannot perform again. Hiraga tries to downplay the matter and he tells her to calm down. He is sure that Louise just needs rest and she will be fine. However, Louise is angry at him. She states again that she now feels very empty. Tabitha stands up and assures Louise that she will protect Hiraga if she no longer has her powers. Hiraga saved her before, so it is her turn to save him. Elsewhere, Sheffield informs Joseph that the kids are already approaching the border. She is monitoring their every move. Joseph is done with his masterpiece. It turns out to be a giant golem. Back on Tristane, Colbert is currently on his way with the airship to help Hiraga and the team. He has received the permission to do so from the queen herself. Before leaving, a powerful weapon known as the Great Spear has been attached to the Ostland for support. However, Colbert hopes that they won't get to use the weapon. Hiraga and the team continue their journey to Tristane. Hiraga is learning faster, and Tabitha tells him that he is able to grab onto words faster because of the Gandalfer power inside of him. Louise is also worried that Hiraga will no longer be connected to her because she is not a Void Mage anymore. She is worried that someone else will become the mage, and Hiraga will leave her alone. Moments later, the carriage approaches the bridge connecting Tristane to Gallia. They are about to cross the bridge when the giant golem, Jormungand, appears from the sky. Sheffield is the one piloting the golem. The size of the golem leaves everyone in total shock. Silphid and Tabitha are the first to leave the carriage in an attempt to destroy the golem. Tabitha creates a powerful attack, but the golem easily blocks the attack. Giche and Kirchi use their own attacks too, but it comes out with the same result. The golem remains above all. Hiraga realizes that Sheffield is after Louise, and he tells her to run away. However, Louise is stubborn, and she allows allows herself to be captured by the golem. Sheffield asks her to show her true strength, but Sheffield doesn't know that her magic is currently not active. Hiraga and Tabitha are the first to see Ostlin coming in the distance. Hiraga and Tabitha are riding Silphid, and Hiraga can see Louise trying to cast the Void spell even though she has no magic. Hiraga gets hyped and he charges toward the golem. He deals a blow that leaves the golem screaming. Silphid is able to catch Hiraga and Louise. Ostlin is now parked in the distance and the team joins up with Colbert. He tells Hiraga about the Great Spear. It turns out that the Great Spear is a giant cannon. Hiraga touches the weapon and he immediately has some idea about how to operate the weapon thanks to 
Gandalfer's power. He tells his friends what to do and how to load the weapon. They load the first charge and shoot it at the golem, but the shell simply falls off. Del then tells Hiraga that the golem has a counter spell around it, just like Vitart. They need the dispel magic to get rid of the counter. It is up to Louise to chant the dispel magic, but she currently does not have her magic. The golem has closed down on them already. The team is just trying their best to hold it back. Hiraga tells Louise to find a way to get back her magic, but Louise is not ready to fight. Just then, Tabitha draws Hiraga close to herself and kisses him. She tells Hiraga not to worry because she's there to protect him. Louise sees this and she gets extremely jealous. She doesn't want anyone to take Hiraga away from her, and this is enough spark to bring back her magic. She starts to chant the dispel magic. She directs the spell toward the golem and the cannon is fired at the same time. This is enough to destroy the golem, but Sheffield manages to escape again. Joseph watches the events unfold from a distance, and he is amazed by the voice Lloyd's mage power. He laughs hysterically at this. He is a psychopath after all. The team is victorious and they return to Tristane. On their way to Tristane assures Louise that he will always be there for her no matter what. He doesn't care if she is the void mage or not. The duo seals their promise with a kiss as usual. Upon getting to Tristane, Louise is expecting the queen to punish her, but instead, she gives her the royal mantle. The queen now considers Louise as her sister, and she is also next in line for the throne. The queen tells Louise to work hard for the kingdom. The queen also reinstates Hiraga as a chevalier. The season ends with the team scaling through their challenges as usual. After the events of the third season, Siesta, Hiraga, and Lousy now share the same bed. Louise wakes up one morning to hear Hiraga talking from his sleep. He calls her chest the Great Plains while that of Siesta is the Endowed Mountains. She angrily blasts him off the bed. She's about to continue punishing him when Tabitha arrives and stops her. She reminds Louise that she has sworn to become Hiraga's personal knight, and because of this, she cannot stand by while Louise hurts Hiraga. Moments later, Colbert arrives to tell the group that they are going on a trip courtesy of the Queen. They are traveling to Romalia via the Ostlin. On their way to Romalia, Siesta can see that Louise is looking all happy and shining. She asks her why, and she replies that Romalia is the heart of the Church of Bremir. Louise is a devout Bremirist, and simply going there means a lot for her. Siesta thinks she can use Louise's mood to ask for permission to be with Hiraga alone, but Louise refuses. Tiffania is also going on the trip, and she was invited especially by the Queen even though elves are not Bremirist. It is important to note that Bremir is a religion on the continent. Hiraga assures Tiffa that he will protect her and not let any harm befall her. Soon afterward, the ship lands in Romalia, and Louise is amazed by the beauty of the city. The group comes out of the ship, and they are welcomed by Julio. Julio then tells Hiraga, Louise, and Tiffa to follow him. They are taken to the cathedral where they meet the queen. Julio informs Hiraga that Romalia sponsored the trip, so Tristane doesn't have to pay anything. Moments later, the Pope, Vittorio Cerevare, enters the room. Louise and the rest quickly bow their heads, but Hiraga remains standing. Louise finally drags him to the floor so he can bow. The the Pope introduces himself to them and informs them that he has heard a lot about them. He shocks Tiffa when he tells her that she is also a void mage just like Louise. He is also surprised that Tiffa doesn't have a familiar yet. The Pope then blows the curtain to reveal that he is also a void mage. Julio is his familiar and he has the power to manipulate beasts at will. Henrietta then informs them that the ceremony celebrating the third anniversary elevation will be held. Tiffa and Louise are required to hold a mass with him as priestesses. The event is to draw the attention of the fourth mage. The fourth mage is Joseph, who is the king of Galia. Hiraga wants to know why they need Joseph. The Pope then tells them that there is great darkness coming to Earth, and they need the four mages to be able to repel the enemy's attacks. Without thinking twice, Louise accepts the task. After this, the group is seen in a cafeteria eating. There is a group of bad men inside the tavern, but Hiraga refuses to pull the trigger. Hiraga and Louise end up arguing again. Hiraga believes that she shouldn't have accepted the question. Elves do not serve the same divine being as them, and this might cause a catastrophe if not monitored. Hiraga angrily leaves the room when the argument is not going anywhere. In the next scene, Henrietta calls Tiffa to her room. She gives her the royal wind ruby that once belonged to Wales. Louise is on the balcony when she sees the bandits making their way to the treasury. Meanwhile, Siesta scolds Hiraga for not understanding Louise. She says Louise is trying her best to make sacrifices because she believes that it is her right. Hiraga realizes that he was wrong and runs away to find Louise. Elsewhere, Louise has run into the two thieves looting the treasury. She tried to stop them, but she was grabbed by the thieves. She screams out in pain. Hiraga, who is still looking for her, follows the sound of her voice immediately. He catches up to them and dashes toward the thieves for trying to hurt Louise. One of the thieves, Jacques tells his friend to escape with the loot, and he will catch up to him later. Hiraga manages to distract Jack while Louise hits him with a devastating blast. Meanwhile, Tiffa is performing her summoning ceremony below the tower where Hiraga is fighting. Tiffa activates the magic and the portal opens above her. The explosion from Louise's attacks pushes Hiraga off the roof, and he falls through the portal to the ground. There is now the question of whether Hiraga is Tiffa's familiar or not. The thief is led away by the guards. After the dust has settled, Hiraga scolds Louise for trying to fight the bad guys alone. He then tells 
tells her that he now understands her. He knows where she is coming from and what she is trying to do. Louise has the world on her shoulders, and she is trying to save everyone. Louise extends her mouth to Hiraga so he can kiss her. While they are doing this, Tifa walks in on them, creating a weird atmosphere. The duo starts to argue about who started the kiss. On the other hand, Tifa is just confused. She wants to know if Hiraga is her familiar, because her heart pounds rapidly anytime she is close to him. Up next, Hiraga and Louise take a stroll through the city's market. As she surfs the market, Hiraga takes a close look at her and wonders why someone so small as her would be thinking of saving the whole world. Because of this, Hiraga is also determined to protect her from all evil. In preparation for the ceremony, the Order of Undine Knights has been put in charge of ushering for the day. They are to provide orderliness on the day of the ceremony. Henrietta and Agnes have gone to see the Pope concerning the event. Henrietta is worried about the safety of her people, and the Pope assures her that her people will be kept safe. She says the events that happened with the thieves will not repeat itself. Julio assures them that a precautionary spell has been cast on the city. The authorities will know anywhere there is a use of magic. On the other hand, Agnes believes that the city is too exposed. That night, Hiraga returns home to find Louise wearing a priest's gown. She tells him that the gown is what she's going to wear for the ceremony, but she wants Hiraga to see it first. This turns Hiraga on, and he starts to play with Louise romantically. He calls her Lemon and Malicorn from the other room can hear this. Now, in Joseph's secret lab, he's having Vitarit make him flame orbs. The stones contain very powerful flames that are capable of burning down a city. Vitart had no idea that Joseph was planning to use the stones for his own personal gain. Vitartart wants to withdraw, but Joseph tells him that he is already far gone. He is already very involved in it, and there is no turning back. Joseph even invites Vitart to come and watch when he plans to use the stones. Joseph asks Sheffield if their other plan is going well, and she says yes. It is now the day of the ceremony. While the event is going on inside the cathedral, the knights have a tough time controlling the crowd. All of them want to see the Pope. After the ceremonies, Louise tells Hiraga to wait for her in the anteroom. He gets to the room to find Tifa there. Tifa starts to contemplate whether she should get close to Hiraga. She really wants to know if she summoned him as her familiar. Tifa offers to kiss Hiraga, but he is reluctant. She wants to know if the rune will appear if Hiraga kisses her. While Hiraga is trying to resist, Tifa falls on him. With all her melons lying on him, Mont and Malcorn enter the room. Tifa is embarrassed and she runs away. Hiraga tries to explain himself, but Malicorn will not listen. He believes that Hiraga has now abandoned Lemon in search of melons. He is referring to the night he heard Hiraga calling Louise Lemon. Later on, a commoner approaches Louise and tells her that she is one of the workers working for her family. She asks if Louise can grant her a favor and she says yes. She asks Louise to follow her because she has something to show her. Louise answers and follows her. She informs Louise that her mother is sick, and she believes that some words of encouragement from Louise will help her. Hiraga gets to the hall, and he is informed that Louise has left with a girl. He gets worried immediately, and runs into the street in search of Louise. Just then, Hiraga is attacked by one of the thieves from the other night. The guy says he has come to enact his revenge upon Hiraga for getting his brother arrested. The bad guy appears to be very handy with the sword because Hiraga finds it hard to hold him. Louise and the girl get to where her supposed mother is. The mother is covering her face. The moment Louise tries to touch her, the person under the hood cuts her hand with a knife. The attacker takes off her camouflage and reveals that her name is Jeanette. She is also Jacques' sister. Louise realizes that she cannot move. Jean tells her that the knife contains paralytic poison and she won't be able to move her body in the meantime. Jean licks her face and is able to figure out that Louise is endowed with immense power. She's about to continue having fun with her when Sheffield shows up. She calls Jean one of the elemental siblings and tells her to stop going beyond her boundaries. It turns out that Jean is working for Sheffield. This concludes their deal and Jean leaves Louise for Sheffield. Louise passes out from the the effect of the poison. Meanwhile, the other thief is still fighting with Hiraga. Jean shows up to tell him that their mission is over and they can now retreat. The guy joins his sister on the roof. Before leaving, Jean tells Hiraga that Louise has been kidnapped by Sheffield. Hiraga runs through the city with the hope of finding Louise, but he is unsuccessful. Agnes and Hiraga later report to the cathedral to speak with the Pope. The Pope commiserates with Hiraga and says he has no idea that the culprits can do something in broad daylight without the use of magic. Just then, Tabitha enters to tell the group that Gallia is responsible. She says the elemental siblings are working for Gallia. They are the nation's kill unit. There is the possibility that Louise is across the border already. A messenger enters to inform the Pope that Galleon's troops are approaching the border. There is a possibility that they are coming to attack Romalia. Later on, Louise wakes up aboard a warship. Both Joseph and Sheffield are present on the ship. Joseph reveals his intentions to use Louise's powers for something terrible. Louise really hopes that Hiraga will find her. Joseph and Sheffield soon find out that Romalia has dispatched a fleet to encounter them. Louise wonders why Joseph 
Joseph is doing all that he is doing. She asks him what he is planning to achieve, and he says nothing. He is not pushed by desires. All he wants to see is destruction and cruelty. Sheffield brings out the mirror that was stolen in Romalia by the elemental siblings. This mirror gives Sheffield the ability to steal other people's void magic and give it to Joseph. What Joseph needs from Louise is her destruction spell. He needs this to carry out his plan. Sheffield uses the mirror to copy the spell and give it to Joseph. The citizens of Romalia start to wonder what is happening. They can see the amount of military personnel moving out. Joseph places one of the flame stones in a gargoyle's hand and sends it toward Romalia's fleet. He then chants the explosion spell and uses it to destroy the gargoyle, which in turn destroys the flame stone. This reaction causes a massive explosion that rocks the region. Even some of Joseph's troops are affected by the explosion. Even with the massive explosion that just happened, Joseph is not pleased. He was expecting something grander than that. He picks up another stone and sends a gargoyle to take it toward Romalia again. In Romalia, Hiraga asks Tabitha to lend him her familiar, and she agrees. Before the two leave, Julio stops Hiraga, and he gives him an artifact that has been kept in Romalia since. He hopes the artifact will help Hiraga in his fight against Joseph. The Romalian troop starts to retreat when they see another gargoyle coming toward them. Joseph activates the flamestone again, and this destroys most of the troops and also affects the city. The people of the city start to run helter-skelter. Louise asks Joseph once again what he is trying to achieve. He replies that he is trying to see the amount of damage and cruelty that he has to do before he can cry. He reveals that he was once a sweet kid, but his heart turned to stone when his brother started outshining him in everything. He killed his brother, and he felt nothing. He has killed lots of citizens, but he has never been moved to tears. He is desperately trying to do something that will make him cry. He orders Sheffield to send out the last flame stone. Before Sheffield could hand over the stone to a gargoyle, Louise found a way to cut her binds. She hit Sheffield and was able to grab the stone. She jumps off the ship, but the gargoyle chases after her and retrieves the stone. Louise continues to fall down and she silently calls Hiraga for help. Just then, Hiraga and Tabitha show up. Hiraga is able to save her before she falls to her death. Hiraga jumps on Joseph's ship while Tabitha and Louise chase after the gargoyle. Hiraga's aim is to prevent Joseph from chanting. In Romalia, Geach and Malcorn have been able to direct the citizens into the cathedral for shelter. Kirchi and the rest of the team see Louise and Tabitha chasing the gargoyle. They figure out that they are trying to stop it from carrying out another bombing. Back on the ship, Sheffield has jumped between Joseph and Hiraga. She's ready to protect her master till he finishes chanting the destruction spell. She creates a bunch of gargoyles to fight Hiraga. He soon realizes that the enemies are endless. All he needs to do is get rid of Sheffield for the gargoyles to stop functioning. He then remembers the artifact that Julio gave him for use. He pulls out the artifact effect and it turns out to be a gun. He shoots Sheffield in the thigh to stop her from creating more gargoyles. Hiraga leaves Sheffield and goes after Joseph. Meanwhile, Tabitha and Louise have been able to retrieve the last stone from the gargoyle thanks to Tifa's spell of forgetfulness which she uses on the beast. Louise and Tabitha then head back to the ship. Hiraga catches Joseph casting the spell and he stops him. He's already in the last phase of the chant already. He holds Joseph at gunpoint but Joseph shocks him and moves away at a binding speed. Joseph reveals that his void magic is acceleration. Hiraga manages to anticipate his move at one point, but the duo is left in a still point. Hiraga holds his sword to Joseph's neck, while Joseph has been able to acquire the gun, and he points it at Hiraga. Joseph is about to pull the trigger when Tabitha and Louise arrive. Louise hits Joseph with the explosion spell, and Tabitha fatally injures him with her air icicles. Hiraga is caught in the attack, but he will survive. Joseph is pinned to a wall, looking all weak and helpless. Tabitha approaches him with the intention of eliminating him, but Hiraga manages to change her mind. She tells Louise that they will hand Joseph over to Romalia so he can atone for his sins. Just then, Sheffield shows up and pushes Louise out of the way. She manages to grab the stone. She's ready to activate the stone if the trio does not leave. Joseph is dying already, and she doesn't want them to humiliate her master. The trio has no choice but to leave. As they fly away, Sheffield kisses her master before activating the flame stone. Louise, Tabitha, and Hiraga can see the big explosion in the distance, and it is assumed that Sheffield and Joseph are both dead. The trio returns to Romalia and Lousy hands over the mirror that was stolen. Hiraga then accuses Julio and the Pope of being aware that Joseph will do something like that. The Pope agrees and says they intentionally baited Joseph with the Void Mages. However, they had no intention of putting Louise in danger. Julio and the Pope apologize for this. The Pope thanked the group for their help. As they leave the cathedral, Louise reveals that another void mage would have appeared since Joseph is dead. She hopes that they can now join forces with the new mage. They get outside the cathedral to find out that people are already waiting for them. The people start to celebrate the two as the heroes who saved their city. When the team returns to the academy, they are welcomed with warm hands. They are considered heroes, but Hiraga is the main hero of them all. The principal has a feast organized for them. Geechee seems to be the one enjoying the feast because he has girls flocking to him. Mont initially wants to leave him to do whatever he wants, but 
but she later changes her mind and chases him away from the girls. Louise finds Tifa and she thanks her for her help back in Romalia. Malicorn finds Hiraga and he teases him with a melon again. Louise wants to know the meaning of the melon, but Hiraga lies and says it is nothing. A fine tune starts to play and this takes Louise and Hiraga down memory lane. They remember the first time they had their dance. Louise is even dressed like the first time. They are about to lock lips when Malicorn shows up again. The duo immediately takes their romance to their room. They are about to get serious when they find out that Siesta is hiding under the sheets. She grabs Hiraga and starts to press her bosom against him. Louise ends up using the explosion spell on them both, just to separate them. Later on, Kirchi informs Louise and Mont that Tabitha has been called back to Gallia. Louise says she hopes that she was not called back just for political reasons. Now in Gallia, Tabitha's mother has been given a potion to drink. The potion is said to return her to her normal mental state. It turns out that the potion was given to her by Vitart. This is one of his ways of atoning for what he did. When Tabitha asked him why he worked for Joseph, Vitart said he had something to do then, and that was the reason he agreed to work with Joseph. After taking the potion, Tabitha's mother comes back to her senses. In the next scene, Louise watches on in admiration as Hiraga trains with the rest of the knights. She remembers what Hiraga told her about getting a house for them. She cannot wait to start living with Hiraga alone. Moments later, Siesta sees Kerche and Mont talking about the incident that happened between Hiraga and Tifa. Siesta immediately runs to the room to tell Louise about it. Louise is able to figure out why Malicorn was calling Hiraga Melon. Siesta then suggests Louise gets a house for her and Hiraga before more rivals start to emerge. This kick starts the journey of them looking for a mansion to stay in. The first mansion the trio finds, Louise rejects it because of a minor issue. She says she doesn't want the house. Siesta wants them to pick the house, and Louise has to ask her why she has a say in the matter. She reminds Louise that she is Hiraga's personal maid, and she is to follow him anywhere he wants to go. This means she will automatically follow them to the new mansion. Louise has no say in the matter because it was the queen herself who appointed Siesta as Hiraga's maid. After inspecting so many houses and mansions without getting a suitable one, the trio makes their way to Scarin's Inn to cool off. Hiraga tells Scarin that Louise has been so picky. She has faulted all the houses they have been to. While they are sitting, some girls come rushing over to Hiraga. Scarin reveals that Hiraga has been popular since he defeated Joseph. There is even a play dedicated to him. The play showcases how he defeated Joseph. Siesta and Louise realize that they need to get a house ASAP. Failure to do this will result in more rivals, and they do not want this. Now in Gallia, Tabitha is informed by her mother that she is to be crowned the queen. The decision has been made among the executives, and they see her as the right person for the job. Tabitha's mother also wants her to take the mantle because her father has always been particular about rebuilding the country. Three days later, Louise, Hiraga, and Siesta are still looking for a suitable house. They have searched and searched, but they have not been able to come to a conclusion. They are walking through the street when Agnes shows up to inform them that the queen has summoned them to the palace. Upon getting to the castle, the queen informs them that Tabitha has been chosen to be the next ruler of the nation. Louise and Hiraga are dumbfounded when they hear this. They hope that Tabitha is not being forced to take the throne. Henrietta says Tabitha knows what is best for her, and she will make a decision that will be convenient for her. After that, Henrietta informs the two that she has made the decision to reward Hiraga for his bravery. She is giving Hiraga a small portion of her domain. This will automatically make Hiraga a lord. The place Henrietta is talking about is a land called De Orniel in western Tristane. Soon afterward, Siesta, Hiraga, and Louise make their way to the land. It appears to be a wasteland with nothing on it. However, there is an old mansion on the land. Louise doesn't want to stay in the house, but she changes her mind when she realizes that Siesta doesn't mind staying alone with Hiraga in the house. That night, Tabitha shows up and tells them that she is also moving in with them. She reveals that she has postponed the crowning ceremony. Tabitha lays on the bird and sleeps off within seconds because she is exhausted already. The following day, Kirchi and Mont come to visit Hiraga. They decide to inspect the land and see how far it goes. They are surprised that it is nothing but a wasteland. There is no development on the land. An old man who is a resident informs them that the last lord of the land was responsible for how things turned out. To make things worse, he had no heir. When he died, everything died with him too. It is only a bunch of old people that are using the land for a vineyard. Kirchi asks Tabitha why she has come to visit, and Silphid exposes her. She says Tabitha is there to get pregnant. The only person capable of doing so, there is Hiraga. It turns out that Tabitha has now entered the fray of girls that love Hiraga. Up next, the mansion has been renovated to some point, and it is more presentable than how they met it. Siesta is always busy cooking, because she believes that the only way she can get to Hiraga is through food. Meanwhile, Hiraga and Louise are in the yard. The two are having a couple's moment together. Louise apologizes that her bangs are too small for Hiraga's liking 
speaking, but he doesn't mind. Hiraga wants them to play a romantic game, but Siesta shows up and ruins the moment again. Tabitha's in the distance and she can see everything going on. Later on, Elion comes visiting. She says she is taking Louise back home. She cannot have Louise stay with a commoner like Hiraga. Louise reminds her sister that Hiraga is no longer a commoner. He is now an aristocrat, she argues. Elion doesn't care about the position Hiraga has been placed in. She is convinced that Hiraga doesn't have what it takes to be an aristocrat. He was not brought up like one, so he cannot have the manners and other things related to an aristocrat. Louise then tells her sister that she is ready to train Hiraga all by herself. She will inculcate the manners of an aristocrat in him. Elion accepts the offer and says she will be back. If she doesn't see any changes in Hiraga, she's going to take Louise away from him. After her sister's departure, Louise begins her training to turn Hiraga into a proper aristocrat. While they are doing this, Kirchi and Mont are ready to go back to the academy. Tabitha says she will give them a lift with her familiar. Moments later, Hiraga and Louise start to argue. Hiraga says Louise cannot change the person he is, but Louise begs to differ. She is worried that people will mock Hiraga that he is not a true aristocrat, but Hiraga says he does not care. He tells Louise that he is getting married to her and not anyone else. Their happiness together matters most. Louise is not ready to accept this and Hiraga walks out of the room angrily. That night, Hiraga decides to sleep in the basement while Louise and Siesta sleep in the main bedroom. While he is on the rusty old bed, Hiraga falls off and he touches the wall. The section of the wall he touched activated a secret passage. Meanwhile, Louise has left the bed to find Hiraga. Hiraga follows the passage till he finds himself in a secret room. He sees a mirror and stands in front of it. A bright light shines from the mirror and Henry Henrietta emerges from the mirror. This comes as a shock to the two of them. Henrietta reveals that she was in her room staring at the mirror and she found herself in front of Hiraga. It appears that the mirror connects the mansion to the castle. There is a possibility that the last lord of the castle was using the mirror to sneak in his mistresses. Henrietta tells Hiraga how lonely she is. She has been pressured countless times to get married but she doesn't want to. She wants to marry someone she loves and not just for the sake of politics. She moves closer to Hiraga because she has always been interested in him. She locks lips with him even though she knows that Hiraga belongs to Louise. She tells Hiraga that a part of her is telling her not to care that Hiraga belongs to someone else. She just wants to be happy, and she is happy with Hiraga. Unknown to them, Louise has seen everything. Louise is heartbroken, and she just walks away silently. Before Henrietta leaves, she tells Hiraga that she would want them to see more often. After Henrietta's departure, Hiraga leaves the secret room. He makes his way back to the basement where Dell informs him that Louise saw everything. Hiraga runs outside and sees Louise on a horse. She is preparing to leave already. She tells Hiraga that she has no no chance against the queen, and that is the reason she wants to leave him. Louise rides away, but Hiraga decides not to chase her. He believes that he has no right to do so. The following morning, Louise arrives at the academy and she tells Kirchi, Mont, and Tabitha that she has dumped Hiraga. While she is moping in her, Tabitha comes visiting. She tells Louise that she will take Hiraga away if she is not ready to have him. She is about to become a queen, and she can marry whoever she wants. After this, Kirchi finds Louise and tells her why Tabitha said those things to her. Kirchi tells her that Tabitha has feelings for Hiraga, just like Henrietta does. However, the possibility of them having him is low. She advises Louise not to give up on her love for Hiraga if she doesn't want to lose him. In short, Kirchi tells her to fight for Hiraga. Louise hears this, and she rushes back to the mansion. She finds Hiraga sitting alone in the field. Hiraga is surprised to see her. Louise tells him that she's ready to forgive him. Hiraga is happy that Louise came back to him because it is only Louise that can give him happiness. The duo share an unbreakable bond, and they love each other so much even if they do not want to admit it. After this, Louise goes to the secret room, and she seals off the entrance to prevent Hiraga, or the princess, from using the mirror again. Days later, Henrietta notices that the mirror in her room is no longer working and she starts to wonder why. On the other hand, Hiraga and Louise say they should have investigated the mirror to find out what sort of magic makes it connect two places at the same time. The mirror connects the princess's room to the secret room. Suddenly, Hiraga is informed of an emergency. He rushes outside to see Tabitha and the others gathered. They tell him that hot water is sprouting from the ground and this might be a sign that the devil is coming for them. Hiraga tells them not to worry because what they are looking at is a natural phenomenon. It is called a hot spring, he says. The water can be used for soaking. Hiraga immediately suggests that they hold a party. Since the house is now settled, he can hold a party and invite Geish and the rest of their friends for a fun time. Information reaches Geish and the others at the academy that Hiraga is inviting them to a party. Tifa is excited because this will give her the opportunity to see Hiraga again after a long while. Construction of the hot spring is already underway. Hiraga has given the builders the design of how the spring should look, and they are already working on it. Hiraga tells Louise that he would want them to soak in the water together, but Louise doubts if she can. She is very shy and says she will die of embarrassment. Louise looks behind 
behind to see Tabitha staring at her and Hiraga. She approaches Tabitha and thanks her for what she said to her at the academy. What she said to her gave her the courage to fix things with Hiraga. Tabitha then tells Louise that she will be taking Hiraga if the same thing repeats itself. That night, Tabitha leaves the dining table because she has no appetite. Silphid tells her to take her chances when she still can. She has little time left before she returns to Gallia, and she needs Hiraga to lay with her before then. Tabitha sneaks into Hiraga's bed that night. She wants to forcefully have Hiraga to herself, but Louise shows up and interrupts the moment. Louise doesn't want Hiraga out of her sight, and the same thing applies to Tabitha and Siesta. Hiraga finds a way to tell the girls to sleep on the same bed while he sleeps alone. During the night, Louise tries to sneak out to meet Hiraga Tabitha and Siesta stops her. The following day, the guest starts to arrive in preparation for the party. Siesta and Louise see a hooded person sneaking into the mansion. The two immediately follow the person. They soon corner the unknown person and take off the hood. It turns out that the person is Henrietta. She snuck out of the castle to come to the party. Henrietta and Louise decide to have a bath together. While they are doing this, Louise makes mention of Hiraga. The queen accepts that she loves Hiraga and she is not ready to give up on him. The duo ends up having a water fight because of Hiraga, but they get tired and talk it out amicably. Louise finally accepts the fact that Henrietta loves Hiraga. Hiraga is an amazing person after all, and it is understandable that girls want him. Louise and Henrietta are happy that they got to share a wonderful moment together after so many years. Later on, Hiraga learns that the queen is around. He finds the queen in the woods and takes it as a good opportunity for them to talk. Hiraga informs the queen that he loves Louise, and she is the reason he is still in that world. He is staying there to protect and care for her because she is the only person his heart beats for. Henrietta hears this and tells Hiraga that he understands where he is coming from. Before leaving, Henrietta tells Hiraga that she is not ready to give up. She doesn't mind if the feeling is one-sided. Unknown to them, Tabitha is in the tree behind them, and she can hear everything they are talking about. That night, the girls all stay in the hot spring to soak together. The boys try to join them inside, but the girls chase them off. After spending so much time in the water, Tifa develops a heat stroke. She appears somewhat unconscious but manages to step out of the pool. She enters the nearest room that she sees upon entering the mansion. It is time for Kirchi and the rest to return to the academy. They leave Tifa to spend the night because she is not herself yet. As they leave the mansion, three people pass by them on horses too. After everyone is gone, Louise decides to soak with Hiraga. She takes off her clothing and makes Hiraga do the same. She wants to start doing things that will make her happy because she does not want to have regrets later on. As they soak, Hiraga promises her that he will always be there for her and that she will be the only one he will have eyes for. The duo takes their romance to the room, but the plan fails again. They are about to take it another step further when Hiraga realizes that Tifa is on their bed. She is lying there looking exhausted. Louise blames Hiraga for Tifa being on their bed, and she beats him up as usual. The following morning, Tabitha gets ready to leave for Gallia. Everybody in the mansion was still asleep when she prepared herself. She goes to Hiraga's room and pecks him in the face. It is very obvious that she is reluctant to leave, but she has duties to attend to and Hiraga is a distraction to her. She is about to fly away when Hiraga Hiraga rushes out of the house to stop her. She reveals that her heart is heavy, and she finds it hard to stay with Hiraga. Just then, the elemental siblings appear from the nearby bush. Jacques is also with them. It turns out that he managed to escape his prison cell in Romalia. The elemental siblings tell Hiraga that they are there to eliminate him. Meanwhile, three elves have also arrived at the back of the mansion. They are also preparing to infiltrate the building. Jacques charges toward Hiraga while Tabitha is left to fight the other guy. Jean uses the opportunity to sneak into the mansion. Hiraga does not have his sword with him, and he has no way to fight back against Jock. Just then, Giche, Reinhard, and Malicorn show up to help Hiraga. They have his sword with them, too. Giche creates several golems to attack Jacques, but he easily cuts them down. Jacques is more powerful than they think. On the other hand, Jean has made his way into Louise's room. Louise opens her eyes because of the commotion going on outside. She turns her face to see Jean looking directly at her. Louise tries to grab her wand, only to find out that Jean has stolen it. She grabs Louise and takes her outside for Hiraga to see. Jacques is busy giving the guys a tough time. They have no idea how to subdue him. Jean threatens to strip Louise if Hiraga gets close to her. The elves get closer to the house to see them fighting. They are not ready to intervene because they are there for someone else. They look to their side to see Siesta begging Tifa not to join the fight. It turns out that the person they are looking for is Tifa. Jacques traps form a rock around Guiche and the rest. He has them trapped already and there is no escape. Just then, a little guy appears behind Jacques. Jacques turns his back and immediately gets scared. He addresses the boy as Damien. Damien demands an explanation from him. Jacques then explains that the other guy, Dudu, wanted a rematch with Hiraga, and that is the reason they have attacked the mansion. Damien gets angry and brings out his weapon, which looks like a saxophone. He blows the instrument, and Jacques' earth magic turns into water. The whole surrounding of the building is filled with water. This creates a distraction for Jean, and Louise is able to grab her wand from her. At that same time, Hiraga hears Tifa's scream, and he rushes over. He gets there to see 
see the elves taking her. One of the elves uses the water to his advantage, and he creates a sleeping spell into the water. Everyone who has their feet inside the water immediately passes out. Silphid is in the sky, and she is able to witness this. Soon afterward, Hiraga and Tifa wake up in a strange room. Tifa realizes that she is putting on elven clothes. The two are trying to figure out where they are, when one of the elves who kidnapped them enters the room. She introduces herself as Lukshana. She tells the two that they are currently in the elves' country, Neftes. One week later, Louise is seen berating Henrietta for not doing something about the disappearance of Hiraga and Tifa. Henrietta tells her that Romalia has requested that they leave the matter to them. They have been studying the elves for years and they know how they operate. After hearing this, Louise takes her leave. She informs the Order of the Knights who are willing to send a search party that the Queen has told them not to. They will be leaving all the action to Romalia. Louise returns to the mansion, and she starts to prepare herself on a journey to find Hiraga. Back in the elves' country, Lukshana informs Hiraga and Tifa that their government decided that the Void Mages need to be kidnapped. They are coming together already, and this is their plan to make sure that they do not come to attack them. Tifa was easy to kidnap because she did not have a familiar yet. Lukshana reveals that Vitart is her uncle, and she is surprised that Hiraga defeated him. Seconds later, Vitart and one other elf, Ali, arrive at the scene. He is there to inspect the progress of the mission. He asks Hiraga how Tabitha's mother is doing, and Hiraga tells him that she is doing fine. Vitart is relieved to hear this. Ali and Lukshana are a couple judging from their interactions. Up next, Louise is about to leave the mansion when Siesta stops her. She offers to come with her too. Tabitha also arrives and reveals her intentions to follow Louise. With Silphid, they can get to the elven lands in four days. Just then, the Ostlan appears behind them. The ship is carrying all of their friends. They are all willing to find Hiraga and rescue him. Hiraga and Tifa try to escape, but they find out that there is a spell stopping them from doing so. The duo decides to take a bath together while they think about what to do next. While they are inside the water, Hiraga sees a rock in the middle of the lake. He swims down to find out that the rock is actually an aircraft from his world. Hiraga touches the aircraft to see if his Gandalfer ability will make it work, but it doesn't. Lukshana can clearly see that Tifa is in love with Hiraga. He advises her to take her chances with him to avoid losing out. Hiraga is not married yet, so they there is the chance that Tifa might still get his way with him. Moments later, Ali and Madarf arrive to take Hiraga and Tifa to the capital. They say the council is to decide what they want to do with the duo. Lukshana is surprised by this because this wasn't the deal they had before. The Ostland is also on its way to the Elven Land. Colbert tells them that they are to run if they encounter any Elven ship. They are not there to start a war, but to save their comrades. The Ostland is fast so there is no enemy ship that will be able to catch up to it. Hiraga and Tifa arrive at the council chamber and Vitart comes out to talk to Hiraga. He tells Hiraga not to act irrationally no matter what they say about them. After he is done saying this, one of the elven lords, Esmail, comes out to take the duo into the council chambers. Esmail stands on the podium and tells his fellow people that it will be best for them to terminate Hiraga and Tifa. He says the humans are gathering the void mages in order to destroy the elves. Hiraga denies this and says it is not their intention to do so. Some of the council members do not agree with Esmail. They believe that imprisoning Tifa and Hiraga is enough precautions to separate the void mages. Esmail rough handles Tifa and this infuriates Hiraga. He grabs one of the guard's swords but he is quickly disarmed by Madar. Esmail uses this to his advantage and he tells the council members that humans are savages that need to be eradicated. The council members agree with him and they tell the guards to take Hiraga and Tiffania away. While they are in their cell room, Tifa tells Hiraga to find a way to escape and leave her. Hiraga refuses and tells her that he will not leave her behind. This moves Tiffania to tears, and she finally confesses her true feelings to Hiraga. She tells him that she loves him, but she has been refraining because of Louise. Tifa draws close to Hiraga and locks lips with him. Immediately a bright light appears on Hiraga's chest, causing him pain. Hiraga passes out from the pain. Hiraga finally regains consciousness to find out that a rune has appeared on on his chest. Without a doubt, it is now confirmed that he is Tifa's familiar. Hiraga and Tifa have been doubting this because they believe that it is not possible for a familiar to serve two masters. Just then, Lukshana, Vitart, and Ali arrive to break them out of prison. Back on the Auslan, they spotted an elven scout ship heading toward them. Their plan remains the same. They are to run away and avoid conflict with the elves. The elven ship is accompanied by dragon riders. The Auslan manages to evade the enemy ship, but the captain of the ship, Ride, tells his men to turn the ship around and pursue the Auslan. He also orders his dragon riders to chase after the ship. Vitart, Ali, 
and Madarf take Hiraga and Tifa through an underground water passage. As they walk through the tunnels, Vitart informs Hiraga that he has no plan of handing them over to the authorities in the first place. He wanted them to remain at Lukshana's oasis, but Esmail somehow got his way. Vitart then tells Hiraga that he agreed to work with Joseph because of fear. During his time with Joseph, he was able to figure out that it is not the void magic that is dangerous, but the heart of the wielder. Hiraga assures Vitart that Tifa and Louise will never use their void magic for destruction, and Vitart says he knows. They make it to the entrance of the underground passage, but they find out that it has been sealed with magic. It turns out that Esmail was already expecting them to do something like that. Esmail and Vitart are old enemies, and Esmail has been looking for a way to terminate Vitart. This is the best chance for Esmail to carry out his deed. Before Vitart and the others realize what is going on, they are surrounded by elven soldiers, and Madarf is their commander. Lukshana tells Hiraga not to eliminate the soldiers, because it will only make the elves hate them more. Now on the Ostland, the ship is attacked by dragon riders. Colbert doesn't want his students to fight back to avoid casualties. He tells Siesta to take Louise away and hide her. It will be risky for the elves to find out that there is a void mage on the ship. He then stops the ship so that they can be captured by the elves. Hiraga manages to cut through the soldiers to create an avenue of escape for the group. They run as fast as they can, but they are soon cornered by the guards again. Vitart is forced to create a wall between them and the soldiers. Back on the Ostland, Ride faces Colbert, and demands to know the reason why he has crossed into elven territories with kids. Colbert then tells him that they are there to rescue their comrades. Ride is surprised to hear this because he has no knowledge of any human that was captured. Now in the tunnels, Madarf starts to hit the wall with a brick. He tells the group to give up, or else he will fill the place with poison mist. Louise is currently thinking of Hiraga where she is hiding. Hiraga is also thinking of her. Just then, Hiraga's rune starts to shine bright. This activates a connection between him and Louise. A new spell opens up in Louise's book of invocation. Louise casts this spell and it creates a portal between where she is and where Hiraga is. The duo is happy to see each other. The portal starts to close because Louise's magic is exhausted. Suddenly, a wave of energy flows out from the rune on Hiraga's chest into Louise. Louise is filled with energy and she is able to keep the portal open. With this, the whole group is able to escape before Madarf and his men breach the wall. Ride is still having a discussion with Colbert about the authenticity authenticity of his claim when Vitart shows. Fortunately, Ride is Vitart's former student. Vitart is able to use this influence to get Ride to release the students and the ship. He promises to give Ride the details later. After the group is gathered, Louise tells them that she wished to see Saito so badly, and this is able to give her the spell she needed to save him. Hiraga then tells the group about his new rune. Vitart tells Ali and Lukshana to follow the humans back to their lands. He will return to the elven capital, Adil, but he will remain in hiding for the meantime. It dawns on Louise that Hiraga would have had to kiss Tifa for the rune to appear. She chases Hiraga around the ship with the intent to murder him. After their escape from the Elven Lands, the team makes their way to Ludus, the capital of Gallia. Tabitha tells one of the officials to get everything ready for the coronation. Hiraga realizes that Tabitha has finally made her decision to be the queen of the kingdom. Tabitha's mother tells her how proud she is that Tabitha has finally decided to take the throne. As the preparation for the coronation goes on, Louise is worried that Hiraga and Tifa are now spending more time together. Hiraga and Tifa are always walking around nowadays. Hiraga sometimes unconsciously ignores Louise. Louise catches Hiraga touching Tifa's body, and she is already assuming that they are doing something romantically involved. She rushes over and grabs his hand. She starts to question him, but Hiraga is able to defend himself. He tells her that he was only trying to get a bug out of Tifa's shirt. Louise still does not believe Hiraga until the bug flies out of Tifa's shirt. Tifa and Hiraga end up leaving the scene together. Louise makes the decision that she needs to show Hiraga that she was her master before Tifa came along. Since Ali and Lukshana are staying in the royal annex, Lukshana reveals her desire to check out the royal palace. She steps out of the building to find Malakorn and Geish waiting outside. The duo tells Lukshana and Ali that they can't leave the building. They tell them that Tabitha's coronation needs to go unhindered. There might be chaos if the people find out that there are elves in their midst. A fight is about to break out between them, but Hiraga arrives just in time to stop them. After this, he makes his way to his room where he finds Louise arranging clothes that she would like to wear to the ball that is going to hold after Tabitha's coronation ceremony. Louise wants Hiraga to help her pick a cloth to wear. After picking one of the clothes, Louise tells Hiraga to wear it for her. While she is dressing her, Louise gives him permission to touch her melons. She then asks him if she is his only master. He is about to answer the question when Tifa bursts into the room, seeking Hiraga's help concerning the button on her clothes. Louise decides to help out on behalf of Hiraga.
Hiraga. She tries her best to make sure that Hiraga does not touch Tifa's melons. A day before the coronation, Henrietta arrived in Gallia for Tabitha's coronation. Ali runs out of the house to tell Geisha and Malicorn that Luxana is missing. She has found a way to escape from the building. Ali wants the two to find his fiance real quick. The duo initially refuses the task, but they change their mind when they are informed that the Pope has just arrived for Tabitha's coronation. This is enough incentive for them to find her before the Pope sees her. They find Hiraga and they tell him about Luxana's disappearance. Hiraga promises to join the search after he is done attending to the Pope. After this, Hiraga, Louise, Tifa, and Henrietta meet up with the Pope. Louise tells him and Julio how they were able to rescue Hiraga and Tifa. She also tells the Pope about how energy came out of Hiraga to help her maintain the portal. The Pope is surprised by this and Hiraga shows him the rune on his chest. Julio is surprised because it is impossible for one person to be a familiar for two mages. The Pope tells the group that Hiraga's new power belongs to another legendary familiar known as Lyftrasir. He has the power to amplify the power of void mages. This is why Louise's power grew. The Pope continues to explain further. He says Joseph's familiar was the divine being's brain known as Mayo Zunatonirun. This was Sheffield. Gandalfa is the divine being's left hand. The divine being's right hand is Windolf and that is Julio. Lastly, the divine being's heart is Lyftrasir. The Pope is glad with the new power he just gained. He says Hiraga will be able to amplify their strength even though the last Void Mage has not yet emerged. That night, Mont and Kirchi come to take Tifa Louise away from Hiraga. They tell her that they are having an all-girls night with Tabitha. Tomorrow is her coronation, so they need to stay with her for the night. This is to keep her company before she finally loses her freedom. On their way to Tabitha's room, Mont catches Guchihei touching a girl and she beats him up. He tries to tell him that he is looking for someone, but Mont does not believe him. She angrily leaves him alone. They are about to enter Tabitha's room when Mont, Kirchi, and Louise run into Lukshana. She tells the trio that she ran away from the annex to come see the palace. It dawns on Mont that Geish is actually telling the truth. Tabitha hears their voices outside and she opens the door. She is surprised and happy to see her friends. Later on, Hiraga and the others learn that Lukshana is with the girls. The following day, Tabitha is crowned by the Pope to become the new Queen of Gallia. There is celebration among the people because of this. Later that night, Louise is walking through the hallway when she hears Julio and the Pope talking. The Pope tells Julio that Hiraga will lose a piece of himself anytime he uses his new power. In short, Hiraga's life continues to reduce with each use of the power. After using the power so much, he will eventually die. Louise is shocked to hear this, and she just stands there with tears in her eyes. Elsewhere, there is a volcanic eruption, but it appears that the eruption just gave birth to something scary. During the ball dance, Louise finds it difficult to concentrate. All she can think about is Hiraga dying if he uses his amplifying power. She prays that a catastrophe that will make Hiraga use power will not come. Unknown to them, a city is already on fire, and what she's praying against is here already. After the events of the coronation, the group returns to Tristan. See Esta enters Louise's room to find her awake. She's surprised by this and she also notices that Louise is acting all gloomy. She asks Louise to tell her what the problem is. Louise is about to do this when Agnes knocks on the door. Agnes tells them that the queen is calling for Tifa, Hiraga, and Louise at the palace. Upon getting to the palace, Henrietta tells the trio that the Pope has sent for them. She tells them that a village at the base of the Flame Dragon Mountains was completely destroyed. This is not something ordinary, and this is the reason the Pope needs their help. Silphid arrives at the palace. She will be the one to take the trio to Romalia. Before leaving for Romalia, Siesta gives Louise some words of encouragement. She tells her that they will all return home safely to live happily together. Louise holds on to this word and prays that it comes to pass. The trio soon arrives at Aquilia, a city in Romalia. They are shocked to find the whole city on fire. A bunch of dragons appear and start to attack the trio. Delfinger tells Hiraga that the dragons attacking them do not look normal. Julio shows up and manages to shake the dragons off their tails. He tells the trio that they need to escape first before he gives them the details of everything happening. Julio tells them that all the dragons in the area have gone rogue. Julio's dragon is only staying sane because Julio is using his power to control it. Silphid has nothing to worry about because nature dragons are different from regular dragons. Julio reveals that all of this is happening because of the manipulative aura coming from the body of the giant dragon. They look down into the city to see a giant black dragon staring at them menacingly. Julio tells them that the dragon is the dragon of the past. It is an ancient dragon known to destroy everything in its path. Now in the holy capital, the Pope has been able to motivate the Bronze Knights in preparation for their battle against the dragon. He tells them that they are to intercept the dragon at the Valley of Ortia. After the knights have moved out, Julio arrives with Hiraga and the other two. The Pope tells them that the monster suddenly appeared from the flame of the Dragon Mountains. The Pope is worried that the dragon is the great catastrophe that they have all been talking about. However, the Pope is confident that they will be able to defeat the dragon with the help of the Void Mages. The Pope tells Louise that her explosion 
spell will be very important against the dragon. The Pope will be the one to take care of the manipulative aura coming from the dragon. Tifa will then use her spell of oblivion to return the rogue dragons back to their normal states. The Pope then tells Hiraga that his power will be needed during the battle. Louise hears this and she gets scared. She tries to convince Hiraga not to use his powers, but he refuses. On their way to the valley, Julio asks the Pope if Hiraga will die once he uses his power during the battle, but the Pope says no. Once they are able to defeat the dragon in one shot, they are good to go. Hiraga will still have his life to live. While waiting for the dragon at the valley, Louise finally opens her mouth to tell Hiraga that he will die if he uses Liftrasir's power. Hiraga hears this and he just stands there looking like a statue. Tifa also hears this, and she blames herself for making Hiraga her familiar. She runs away with tears in her eyes. Moments later, the knights give the signal that the dragon has reached where they want it to. Hiraga faces Louise and says he is ready to die. He won't be the only one to die in the battle, so why must he be treated specially? Julio arrives to take Hiraga with him. Before leaving, Hiraga tells Louise to protect Tifa. The knight uses their magic to pull down the rocks on the ancient dragon to trap it. Tifa is also able to return the regular dragons to their normal self with the help of her oblivion spell. Julio, Hiraga, and the Pope charge toward the dragon. The Pope starts to chant the spell to destroy the dragon's manipulative aura. Hiraga supports the Pope with Liftrasir's power. The spell appears to be working as it starts to peel off the reflective layer of the dragon. Just then, the dragon opens up a third eye on its forehead, and it uses this to control Julio's dragon. Julio's dragon starts to move closer to the ancient dragon. Julio tries to fight this, but his efforts are futile. The ancient dragon shoots a powerful blast from its mouth, but Hiraga is able to block the attack using Delfinger. However, the dragon's power Power is too much for the sword, and it shatters to pieces. Hiraga is knocked off the dragon, but Silphid catches him in the air. Hiraga is heartbroken because of the loss of his sword and partner. The Pope realizes that they have no chance against the ancient dragon. He pushes Julio off his dragon to save him. The ancient dragon swallows up the Pope and Julio's dragon. Julio continues to fall as he watches the gruesome end of his master. Silphid manages to grab Julio and prevent him from falling to his death. The knights also retreat when they realize that the Pope has been consumed by the ancient dragon. Hiraga falls unconscious on Silphid's back. Hiraga wakes up to find himself in Gallia. He is in the royal castle at Ludus. Tifa, Luis, and Siesta were beside him when he woke up. He demands to know what happened to the dragon. He is then informed that the dragon suddenly stopped moving when it got to the mouth of the valley. The dragon is still alive because they can still hear its heartbeat. There is the possibility that the dragon will awaken soon. Meanwhile, those in Tristane are already conducting a military meeting concerning ways to defeat the dragon. After telling Hiraga everything about the dragon, he continues to talk to his friends like nothing happened. He even asked for food. Louise walks out of the room, and Tifa follows her. Louise tells Tifa that Hiraga is currently in denial. He is trying to show that he is strong and doesn't need the sword to fight. Louise doesn't want him to hide his feelings. If he wants to cry, he should. Louise wishes that Hiraga could find a way not to use his amplifying power, because she doesn't want him to die. Now in Tristane, Osmond brings out all the records he knows about the dragon. He reveals that the dragon was initially defeated by the four void mages of then. However, the mages also received help from their people. Now that they are down to two void mages, they will have to make do and fight with everything they have. Tristan is ready to deploy all their troops to combat the dragon. Henrietta asks Tabitha if she is willing to do the same with Gallia, and she says, yes. They now need to seek the support of the other nations in order to defeat the dragon. They all need to work together to achieve their aim. Later on, Henrietta tells Louise about their plan to challenge the dragon head-on. Everyone is ready to die in order to save the continent. Louise understands everyone dying to save what is theirs, but she is concerned about Hiraga because he is not from their world. She wonders if it is right for him to die for them. Hiraga leaves his bed to talk to Ali and Lukshana about the aircraft he saw on their land. He wants to know if there is another like that kept somewhere. He is very sure that a fighter jet is capable of defeating the ancient dragon. He wishes that he could get one from his world. Just then, Lukshana reminds them of Louise's spell, the world door. They can use this to open a way to Hiraga's world and grab the fighter jet. Unknown to them, Louise is outside and she has heard everything they are talking about. She opens the door to tell them that she is ready to do it. She will open up a way to Hiraga's world so they can get the fighter jet they need. They move outside the house and Ali takes them through the plan. Louise is to open the portal, while Hiraga helps her to maintain it, and it makes it wider. Once the aircraft is procured, they will return via the portal again. With everyone on the same page, Louise casts the spell and it opens the door to Hiraga's world. Everyone is surprised to see the difference between their world and that of Hiraga's. Hiraga is the first to step through the door. Once he is in his world, Louise tells him how much she loves him and then closes the portal. Hiraga is shocked by this and so is everyone else. Louise tells their friends that it is not right for Hiraga to die in their world. Tears flow down her eyes as she utters these words. Everyone can clearly see how much Hiraga means to Louise 
Louise for her to have made such a heartbreaking decision. After this, Louise informs Henrietta and the rest of the authorities of the decision she made. Henrietta and others understand how she is feeling, and there is no one who can criticize her for it. Louise promises Henrietta that she will do everything in her power to defeat the ancient dragon. Tifa also promises the same thing. With everything settled, the principal tells them that it is time for them to head to the academy. On their way to the academy, Osmond tells Louise and Tifa that Void Mages were the ones who sealed the ancient dragon. In light of this, the ancient dragon has resulted in consuming the Void Mages to get stronger. This is the reason the dragon targeted Romalia. It was drawn to the Pope. Now that it has consumed the Pope, its next targets will be Louise and Tifa. They are headed to the academy so that they can have enough room to engage the dragon. The students at the academy have also been evacuated by Osmond, so there is nothing to worry about. The military is in total readiness to engage the ancient dragon. They soon arrive at the academy to find out that Kirti and their friends are still at the school. They have refused to leave, and they are ready to help out in the battle to come. Tabitha has also hired the elemental siblings to help out in the battle. They are mercenaries after all. Ali and Lukshana are also prepared to fight alongside the humans. Now in Japan, Hiraga is completely devastated. He is scared that Louise will die in the battle and they need his help. He runs to the place where the first portal that took him to Tristane opened. He wonders if it will open again and take him back to his love. While he is in the dark alley, he is cornered by some thugs and they beat him up. Back in the other world, the ancient dragon finally awakens from its hibernation. It lifts off the ground and starts to fly. It appears to be more powerful than it was before. The dragon takes down a whole fleet of soldiers and warships with just a blast from its mouth. Soon afterward, those at the academy receive word that the dragon is headed toward them at a great speed. They hope to hold on till Henrietta and the main military strength get to the academy to help out. Back in Japan, Hiraga visits his family home. He's about to ring the bell when he changes his mind. He cannot live without Louise, and this is an incentive for him to find a way to get to his love. The dragon soon arrives at the academy. The elemental siblings activate a magic barrier to protect the academy from the dragon's attack. They are not sure if it will hold out because the area is too big. The dragon's first attack is successfully parried by the barrier. Regular dragons accompanying the ancient dragons move closer to the academy to be able to inflict more damage. On the other hand, Hiraga picks a newspaper, and he gets a piece of vital information from the book. The ancient dragon continues to attack the academy, but the joint military force under Henrietta soon arrives. They have cannons mounted on their ships. The cannons are loaded and ready to fire. Henrietta gives the order, and the dragon is fired upon. The attack affects the dragon and it falls to the ground. The dragon stopped moving and some of the soldiers believe that it has been defeated. However, Julio knows that the dragon is still very much alive. The dragon suddenly emerges from the dust looking all angry and scary. The dragon directs its attack toward the warships, but the elves arrive just in time to create a shield that protects Henrietta and the rest of the warships. The regular dragons have started attacking the academy. The barrier is not holding out again. The ancient dragon starts to destroy the school's tower in a bid to flush Tifa and Louise out of there. Tifa and Louise decide to leave the academy so that the dragon will follow them. Sylphid gets the two out of the academy and the dragon follows them immediately. Tifa uses her oblivion spell to get rid of the regular dragons pursuing them. Tifa and Louise find out that a section of the magic shield around the dragon was destroyed when the warships fired on it. This is a good opportunity opportunity for Louise to use her explosion spell. She starts to chant the spell, and after the chanting is done, she releases the blast toward the open section of the damaged shield. The effect of the explosion leaves a bright light, and after the light fades, Louise realizes that her spell did not kill the dragon. The dragon hits Sylphid with its tail, and they fall to the ground. Back in Japan, Hiraga was able to figure out that there would be a solar eclipse. He has procured a fighter jet, and he is heading into the eclipse with the hope that it will take him back to the other world. Louise lifts herself from the ground, to see the dragon heading toward her and Tifa. The dragon opens its mouth and is about to consume Louise when Hiraga enters into the world in his fighter jet. He fires two missiles into the back of the dragon. Everyone is shocked to see that Hiraga is back. It comes as a surprise to Hiraga when Delfinger talks to him through the aircraft's communication system. It turns out that Delfinger has been asleep inside Hiraga's rune after the sword broke. Hiraga shoots another round of missiles at the dragon, and this is more than enough damage. The damage from the missiles has opened up the defense shield of the dragon. It is now very vulnerable to attacks. Louise opens a gateway into the jet's cockpit to join Hiraga. She is very happy to see Hiraga, but she hits him repeatedly for coming back. Hiraga tells Louise that he will attack the dragon one more time to expose his magic shield completely. This will give Louise the opportunity to hit the dragon with her explosion spell. Louise is scared to take energy from Hiraga, but he assures her that he will be fine. He promises her that he will not die. Hiraga kisses her to calm her down. With Hiraga's assurance, Louise picks up her wand, draws energy from Hiraga, and starts to chant the explosion spell. While she is chanting the spell, the warships continue to shoot the ancient dragon to deal more damage to its magic shield. As they approach the dragon, Hiraga ejects the parachute, 
and allows the aircraft to crash into the dragon. Just then, Louise releases her explosion spell, and it makes a direct impact on the dragon. This leaves a big explosion, and when the dust settles, the dragon is turned into stone. It cracks and shatters into pieces. With this, the dragon is defeated. Louise wakes up from the effect of the explosion to find out that Hiraga is unresponsive. She starts to cry, thinking Hiraga is dead. Just then, Hiraga speaks out silently. Delfinger informs Hiraga that he has used up his life as Liftrasir, but he was saved because of his Gandalf for life. Hiraga is happy that he is still alive to be with Louise. People soon gather around them and Hiraga uses the opportunity to ask Louise to marry him. Louise accepts Hiraga's proposal with all happiness. In the last scene of the series, we see Louise being led down the aisle by her father. Hiraga is waiting on the altar. Julio joins the two together, and they become husband and wife. The two kiss each other, and the series comes to a halt with a happy ending. At this point, we have reached the end of our video. If you like it, do not forget to put the like button and subscribe for more new videos.